Welcome to the recording of the second annual Australian Brahman Breeders Conference. Due to technical difficulties, the beginning of the conference wasn't recorded. The format of the day was simple. To begin with, we heard from six informative industry relative speakers whose bios and titles will appear before they speak on this recording. After lunch, we had a more casual open forum moderated by David Hill from Clark Creek, where we had a number of speakers representing customers of the Brahman breed. They answered the question, what can seed stock producers do to improve the perception of Brahman cattle? Following the forum, we once again opened up the floor for discussion on the Australian Brahman Breeders Association's future strategies and directions. Once again, thank you for being part of this conference recording and we hope to see you physically at the conference next year. Thank you. ...that go out there around trade, but at the end of the day, it's how much that consumer's got in their pocket that's going to have one of the biggest influences on our beef consumption. And just onto the last slide, or second last slide, I think it is, um, the, uh, the, a couple of few things that we track just to, to give us a bit of grounding on some of these big number picture things is the, um, the, the retail sales of a couple of quick service restaurants across the world. Uh, McDonald's is a great one. I mean, they're one of the biggest beef buyers, I think the biggest beef buyer in the world. Um, you track their same service sales, same store sales uh, across the world. They have an international number and a US number. They've been tracking fairly steady at the moment. They're not doing too badly around that sort of 5 to 10% year on year growth. Um, and their quarter one figures for this year just came out. So they're still in line with their general growth, which is good. We also saw some recent numbers for China come out. And while they're not specifically a big beef user from a QSR point of view, it does give you an idea of that foot traffic going through China and the, the level of consumer activity in the market. So Yum China, which is responsible for KFC and for Pizza Hut, they've seen system sales, so not same store sales, but system sales have actually increased 17% and 24% respectively in quarter one this year. So starting to see more activity in that QSR space. Starbucks in China, their same store, store sales for Q1 lifted 3%. Now that, that lift in, in uh, same store sales was driven largely by increased foot traffic the total basket or the total spend of that consumer was a little bit lower. So we're finding while the Chinese consumers are starting to go out more, they're starting to be more active in those consumer markets, they aren't spending as much as what they were before. They're becoming a little bit more value conscious. And I've heard the same thing through my Chinese analyst as well, um, Chinese colleague over there. They're saying the Chinese consumer is becoming a little bit more conscious on how much they're spending and what they're actually buying. They're looking for value now which was a bit of a change from what they were doing in the last couple of years. But still, they're relatively positive. Um, QSR is a major part in the overall market. It does shift a lot of volume. So to keep those sales going strongly, given all the other things I've told you about at the moment in terms of global markets and, and, and pressures on consumers, that's an encouraging sign um, out of those, those global markets. So last slide, um, as a bit of a summary, um, and I can't read that, unfortunately, but we're expecting geopolitical tensions to continue. Um, there is always and will always be the risk of that rearrangement of global orders and what that means for our trade implications and our partnerships and allies in those spaces is one that we have to keep an eye on. Not a lot we can really do about it, but we just have to be aware. And Australia proved to be relatively well adaptable through the COVID process. Um, and we've managed through situations like the the export license suspension of a number of our beef plants, um, but it is something that will always have an influence on the market. Costs in the system appear to be easing, um, and we're starting to see that come through with inflation, uh, inflation rates dropping and central banks starting to become a little bit more steady now in terms of their, their, their need to combat that inflation rise. And then thirdly, um, what did I actually write there, sorry. Um, the, the key is to keep an eye on that, that um, consumer, uh, consumer income levels, the household disposable income, the wage rates, whichever way we want to measure it. But at the end of the day, I think that's probably the real, um, I wouldn't call it a wild card, but that's probably the one thing over the next 12 months that's going to really influence the overall consumption of Australian beef. And we're going to need that global consumer because our 
general population and consumption levels here just don't grow or will not grow to accommodate the increase in production that we're expecting to come onto the market in the next 12 to 18 months. So um, they're the keys. Um, the last line of credits for uh, for George Lucas and Star Wars is just a, I didn't didn't find the uh, the exit credits weren't weren't that exciting, but it was just a little the end thing that came up at the end. Anyway, um, I'm around all morning and, and happy to take any questions. I don't know if we've got questions now. We'll have some questions now. Um, yeah, if anybody, and probably probably a, a little bit remiss of me, I didn't welcome. We've got 20 people in the Barron Valley Hotel in Atherton that have that have zoomed in. I just did want to make the technology, make sure that their technology was working with the pub before I acknowledge them and welcome them. I had two indicators that it was working. I went to the back of the room and saw them on the screen and I actually got sledged by one of the people that's already on that conference by text. Thanks, Sean Flanagan. Um, so yeah, I'd like to hand across now. So, so in regards to that, we, we just have to have a bit of a form uh, in as far as asking questions. If we do have a question from Atherton, um, we'll just have to be very aware that that's gonna happen and, and not overrun things in the room here. So, so yeah, if, there's, if anybody's got any questions for Angus, uh, please put your hand up and I'll bring you the microphone. Angus, it's interesting there with the IMF graph you put up that it shows Indonesia is one of the few countries that, that they're predicting strong growth for for, mm. the, for the next 12 months or however long it is. Um, and given that, you know, for Brahmins, it's that live export market's so important, I just wonder if you had any insights into how that might pan out in the next 12 months or so. Yeah, to be honest, I was I was surprised. I mean, I know Indonesia is quite a it is a country in that southeast region that um, that does have great capabilities and prospects in terms of in terms of growth. I was intrigued to see it that far ahead, um, but it is a it is a developing economy, so the opportunity to to grow is is strong. Um, like all other markets, it's obviously going to be has been influenced by the the increased costs. Um, you know the the lower oil prices as well will flow through into those markets. Um, so, um, I mean, I th I think it's still there's still positive things out of that Indonesian market, and and I think those growth rates are one of them in terms of the possibility of that consumer to continue to to grow and the wealth of the economy to grow. Um, um, but I think you know we've also got to be mindful that there are ongoing challenges around costs and and incomes etc. in those in those markets that will have a have an influence and, and food price rises in Indonesia was one of the, the large components of their inflationary increase. So um, that, that, that Indonesian consumers just, it's gonna have to, like a lot of economies across the world, it's a rebalance and a readjustment after we've worked through that process. And um, I think from an export point of view, it still represents a great opportunity and, and I'd expect our volumes to Indonesia to increase partly because we've got increased supply available this year, but um, the the market itself will slowly recover out of out of the the slower economic conditions that globally everyone feel at the moment. Thanks, thanks, Angus. Brett Campbell. Angus, just a question on the wage growth versus the consumer spend. Yeah. And I'm no economist by any means, but if you look at the increase in interest rates, inflation, you know that they're, they're talking you know, 15, 20% increase in like a grocery spend. Um, we're not seeing that sort of wage growth. So I guess um, I'm just interested in your comments on that wage growth versus the consumer spend. I would have from a, you know, very much, um, you know, non-economist point of view, it looks like they're gonna be stretched big mm. time yep. for the next couple of years. In, that's only my opinion, but. Yeah, no, agreed, totally. Um, and that's that's the pressure. So not only has that consumer got a higher cost of living that they've got to now try and afford, but um, uh, that that inflationary pressure in the system um, is is meaning that their real wages, i.e., the the growth of wages adjusted for inflation, aren't keeping up with inflation. So it's it's really putting a big squeeze on it. So the the reason I put up that labour market graph to highlight the tightness of this labour market is whether or not that that um, oh, whether we call it like a unionised labour force starts to really build a whole lot of momentum, saying the cost of living's increased, our real wages have not kept up, 
Um, it's a really tight market, which gives them a lot of bargaining power. I, you know, if you've if you've got really low unemployment, then the ability for that employer to go and find someone else um, is is limited. So they have to um, meet some of these requests. So there is the potential that you do see wage growth sort of grow quite rapidly here, given that sort of context. So that's that's the fine line, and the the central banks are all conscious of that because obviously. <laughs> You get wage growth and then it frees up that consumer again to start spending all that money um, that they've just gotten and allows them to continue to keep up with costs, which doesn't help their objective to try and keep that inflation under control. So we've got a number of things working in slightly different directions and, and opposing forces here at the moment. But yes, that consumer is challenged. So that's what I was trying to get to in terms of that real wage growth. Real wages are not keeping up with inflation. So sorry. Wages are not keeping up with inflation, so real wages are actually contracting. So that's the challenge as a beef consumer when they go to the, mar the supermarket. And you can, you can hear it in the commentary that comes through out of the Woolworths and the Coles shareholder reports. You know, they're seeing the consumer shop to a budget now. They'd still like to purchase it, but they, they're conscious of how much they're spending. So they're spending a defined amount, which doesn't allow them to go to the higher end of the higher value markets. And we see similar commentary out of China as well that Chinese consumers just a little bit more cautious on how much they're spending. They'd still like to buy it, but they're looking for a cheaper alternative these days. Thanks, Angus. Do we have any other? David Johnson. Angus, given the interest rates, what's the forecast now for land prices in the next uh, five <laughs> odd years? Oh, you really asked me to step way outside my head. Uh, land prices. Can I take that one on notice? Our land, um, our, our analyst uh, that looks at land prices wrote a report and it, it's come out just recently. Um, and I know that land prices have increased, that the numbers that they've got show that there's been another increase again through the 2022-23 period. Um, so continued strong growth. I just have to go back and double check before I actually say the wrong thing around what he's expecting to happen over the next 12 months. So I can easily find that for you um, if we want to catch up later and I'll, I'll, I can send you through that, that report. Yes, Mary Copeland. Um, thanks, Angus. Um, I saw that graph and I've seen it before about um, beef prices going up, chicken consumption going up, beef yep. consumption going down. And I've seen oh, good. Like, okay. Um, Jason Strong from the MLA is saying only. I better put my, make sure I've got my speaker on up. silent. In terms of what you said about consumption, both here, people looking for value, and in China, importantly, one of our hopefully and we get over ourselves markets that that should be very large for us mm. we do need to be mindful of price don't yeah. we oh yes yeah definitely i think um you, yes as a general statement yes we need to be conscious that in, at the end of the day the product that you're selling and obviously you want to get the best return for is a cost to someone else and you need that someone else to be willing to continue to pay that cost um and so you've got to, we've got to be conscious of that um, those numbers, though, interestingly, um, when you actually multiply the per capita consumption and the retail price um, per kilo, the, the value of consumption in Australia is increasing, even though the per capita consumption is declining. So that consumer might be buying a little bit less, but paying a little bit more for it as a general trend over time. But yes, yeah, so we've got to be aware and conscious of where, that, where the protein sits in the supermarket shelf of offers to that consumer and how they move from one to the other. Um, the cross price elasticity, so the, the price of say poultry or pork compared to beef doesn't have as strong a relationship as the actual price of beef itself in, in the studies that I've seen. So um, even if you know pork prices drop, we don't see a, it's, it's not as strong an influence to draw people away. And I think beef is very fortunate because it does have a range of price points for that consumer. Um, unlike lamb, for example, which have much, much fewer cuts, um, you know, beef can be at the top end of the scale with high price premium value product. Um, and then it can have a product that, that competes with chicken in mince. So I think 
when you look at it, beef is in a more favorable position because it can cater to that consumer that's looking for possibly cheaper cuts. And that's why I threw the QSR numbers up there because you generally see, you know, particularly in the US where they eat so much of their beef in the form of a hamburger, um, but you generally see those QSR sales and McDonald's sales in the US not change much regardless of those economic conditions, or well, sorry, not regardless of the economic conditions, but in slower economic times, those QSR sales don't change much. Whereas you do see obviously the, the white tablecloth restaurants and high premium priced products tend to, to wear it a little bit more. So um, if anything, that, that consumer says, well, I still wanna maintain a mixture of proteins in my diet and I wanna eat beef a certain number of times a week, I'll just decide not to go and pay $45, $55 for a good piece of steak, but I'll go and buy my mince or a cheaper cut. Um, so I think beef is fortunate in that it's got that range of products, but yes, we do have to be conscious um, that there is a consumer that is buying our product and they are only spending as much as they're actually able to spend. So um, keeping an eye on those income levels, give us a good idea as to, as to what their propensity is to buy. And obviously, if, they're, if those real income levels are under pressure, then asking that consumer to pay more is gonna be more of a challenge. La last question, we're about run out of time, so Tony Olson. Thanks, Angus. Just curious, um, just looking at big picture economics, the population of the world is what, seven and a half, eight billion, something like that? Um, uh, yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't roughly. actually know, but yes, it's somewhere in the um, order of that eight to nudge and nine shortly. So it's getting towards nine. Are we, are we at a point where, or when will we be at a point where the world producers can't produce enough animal protein for the population? You know, how much more beef can we produce to feed the population of the world? Yeah. And yeah, have you got any insights in that? Um, it's, it's an interesting question. Because uh, I think when you sit down and draw it on a piece of paper and you say, well, population growth is this per capita consumption in these areas is going to go up at this rate. Our production growth is this and whatever productivity gain we can get given, you know, not expecting a lot more country to go into beef production. Um, you know, you, you can start to draw some fairly dramatic pictures, but um, I have to think as an economist that it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight and therefore the market's going to adjust along the way. And so if it does get to that point where we've got a population and a consumption of beef that is at such a high level that we can't produce enough for it, the market's going to tell us through increased prices and that consumer is then either going to decide I want to continue to buy beef at these extremely high prices or I'm going to find something else. So um, the market will move according to where those demand supply pressures work and it'll be an evolution over time, which means that the market will adjust for it. So um, I suppose at the end of the day, we just want to make sure, well, as a beef industry, you want to hope that that consumer um, is willing to continue to pay for that product. And we see as the consumption rises, that willingness to pay increases and you see the prices go up um, and you don't see them move to an alternative. Um, but I think the market, the market will adjust. I, I don't believe, my, this is my own personal thought, I don't believe we'll get to a 2050 point and suddenly go, oh dear, we've got nothing to feed the world. Um, the, the market will adjust for it. And whether that be through higher prices for beef because that's what consumers are wanting, they dr try and drag it through the system, which allows greater development and greater productivity gains, et cetera, with the, the higher prices, or whether it means that they, they look for other food so sources and, and those, those products start to increase. Um, but the market will find a solution to it. Um, rather than finding a, a situation where we end up with not enough to feed the world. Um, the other thing I, I was talking about it with some colleagues the other day too, there, there's a horrible number that says something like in the order of 30% of our food is actually wasted from the time it comes, it, it's on farm or gets produced on farm and the consumer finally does or doesn't eat it at the other end, whether it's lost through transport or processing or in the kitchen at home there's a large amount of food that's not real, well, is, is wasted. So there's a fair, fair chunk there that we could actually pick up through. Thanks, Angus. Um, 
And, mate, and we do appreciate your time and we, we do love the fact that you come here in person. It makes these conferences work when, uh, when we have speakers come and speak in person. And this is just a small token Thank of you. appreciation from the AWBA. And yeah, thanks very much, Angus. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome Steve Bignall. Cheers, Matt, and cheers to ABBA for having us today. And Angus has set a pretty high precedent to come next. And there are a lot of good questions that hopefully um, can add on throughout this presentation, some of those questions around demand. And um, in regards to that uh, question around, will we be able to feed the world or, or will there be demand for beef at, in 2050 when the population sort of peaks? MLA have a graph, and I don't have it in these slides, but $75,000 for a household, US, do, US dollars for a household is the barometer that we see for people coming online globally for um, increasing demand in beef. So as the population grows or steadies, we do expect population um, incomes to increase, so the beef will, will end up on plate. So we do have that, and I can try to provide that um, after. Ooh, gone a bit fast. Sorry, been through twice. Um, so before I get into the agenda and what we're setting out today, I uh, just run through uh, the market information team and a bit about myself. So like Matthew said, uh, the market information and NLRS manager at MLA, and we have a team of eight um, analysts that look after all the supply, pricing and production insights for um, right up to the processing sector. We've got a sister team of eight analysts as well that look at what is happening in international markets and the demand there. And Tim Jackson there is our analyst who looks after um, supply in, competitive, in competing markets. So that's a bit about us. Um, personally, I'm from a merino cropping and thoroughbred farm in uh, WA and I get back there about three times a year. So um, not just a death jockey from Sydney, but know the land well. So in today's presentation, I'm gonna cover three things. I'm gonna cover what's happening in the current markets our projections that we released in January, um, give an update on where we see uh, slaughter, the herd and production going. And then there's a few future considerations or macro things sort of building on what Angus presented around what's happening in an international space. This slide just shows that there are many drivers. We often get asked, what's the one driver uh, that's driving price movements or supply? But this, this slide here just shows that there's a whole range of different things. There's often not one singular um, point that is moving prices. It can be retail demand, it can be the seasonal conditions, or it can be logistics and getting um, access to labor, which can pull prices down. So there's just a whole range of things. I'll cover off largely supply and seasonal conditions today, but like Angus and building on what Angus said, he says a whole range of things that are, are driving prices. In the current market, I'm gonna, cover off largely slaughter and then what's happening in prices across a few categories. So this just shows national slaughter and that yellow line there shows the 2023 year to date slaughter on a weekly basis. The uh, dark green is 2021 and the light green, which I apologize for, it's not, uh, not the darkest green, but um, shows what the slaughter was in 2022. So there's a few key takeaways here is that slaughter is up 2020, is up 22% week year to date on last year figures and that's been really a flush through in Queensland and our grass fed animals so we expect that in our projections and I'll get to that later we had it up 10 percent but it's actually exceeded our projections so the supply cattle has come on and uh, there's a few processes in the room but processes have been able to find labor to to, to process those kills the female slaughter number uh, there as you'll see is sitting at 41%. So we're still very much in the rebuild phase. So technically, um, if female slaughter, as females being slaughtered as a percentage of the total slaughter is under 47%, then we're considered in a rebuild phase. So in Q1 of 2023, we are still at a national level well within a, a rebuilding phase. And the only thing I wanted to specify on here is for people that do use our slaughter graphs, we capture about 80%. It's a voluntary slaughter of voluntary slaughter survey. So we capture about 80% of total slaughter. So we've been averaging in our NLRS slaughter in this report, uh, about 100,000 head a week. But when you are looking at what that means nationally of the full figures, you've got to add on about another 25,000 head. So each week, we're getting about 125,000 head a week. We look
locally, sorry about that, locally, this is um, the slaughter report broken down on just a state basis is Queensland slaughter is up by 30%. So Queensland is actually what's pulling up that uh, national slaughter increase is, is Queensland's slaughter in uplift this year has been 30% and it's, been, it's greater than what's happening at a national level. So Queensland really has upped its processing capacity this year. We've got to understand this is just year to date. The official figures that Angus and I will look over will come out in two weeks time. They'll be the official ABS quarter one slaughter data. So just working on, off on this NLRS, uh, these NLRS numbers, up 30%, but last year we did have a lot of disruptions at the start of last year. We had COVID outbreaks in plant or COVID was across the community and that was affecting plants. We had floods and the like. So, and it, they especially affected Queensland. Female slaughter in Queensland is 10% below the national average. So it's got a three in front of it. So again, just showing that Queensland, Queensland will always have obviously that skew to a lower female slaughter rate, but the Queensland rebuild is even stronger than what's happening at a national level. And that's what we've been talking about. The two step rebuilding a lot of MLA's uh, documents is the rebuild in the South is sort of easing somewhat and Queensland still within the grips of a, of a rebuild. Um, and from a Queensland perspective, it's just been bubbling around between uh, 65 and 77,000 uh, slaughtered animals a week. Looking at cattle values, and this is a very messy slide, but this just shows what the different categories are doing. And the one thing that you can see there is the red line is the heavy steer. The two yellow lines are processor and feeder cow prices. And then the green is the epi. Is that heavy steers have relative to the other ones held their price quite quite well. The big fall off has been in that green line. If we went back to the end of 2022, they were operating at similar levels to where the feeder and the heavy steer prices were, but that green line has really fallen away in the ecchi market. So what we're seeing there is we, that, that, that the demand, and I'll get to it when I talk to young cattle prices, is that demand for young cattle is drying up, but there is still strong demand for finished cattle. Uh, the one piece that I'd take away is I, Think, we know that there's going to be a big supply of cows come onto the market in the back half of this year. And it'll just be interesting as we've seen with young cattle when the supply hits the market and it puts downward pressure on, on, the, on the prices, what will happen when we do get that increase in cattle uh, cow numbers, what that does to the uh, processor cow. So I would say to watch the processor cow prices. So young cattle prices are aware that the ecchi doesn't come up that far north, but it is a good barometer to what is happening for demand for young cattle across Australia. And one of the things that has happened is the price has come off 41% since May last year, but uh, throughput's gone up 73%. So we're getting around 19,000 animals going through the ecchi. So what that has mean is that those young cattle that have been built, uh, born in the last three years are hitting the market. And that's a really, uh, putting supply through the market, that's the down, putting the downward uh, pressure on prices. The other thing is that the restocker premium. So restockers were paying a significant premium to feeders and processors. If we go back to 2021 and 2022, as we move through to this year, that the, the uh, premium has really shrunk. It's um, under 10%. So there isn't as much restocker demand coming through for young cattle in Southern Australia. And then that works itself up up the country. If there's less restocker demand in Southern Australia, there's re less restocker demand in New South Wales, there's less restocker demand in Southern Queensland and it affects the prices. It sort of works its way up the country. This, sorry about having problems with this. This just looks at how the ECI has comp compared uh, to uh, last year and the, sorry, the 10 year average. I'm having a bit of trouble with this. So we're down 13% uh, on the ten year, uh, five year average. And I know that's what a lot of people are thinking is the prices are down and where they were last year. They've come off those $12 marks that we got at the start of last year, fallen over 400 cents. We're 13% below the five year average, but that, nothing had ever operated in the, that region that we operated in since 2020. No prices ever operated in that, that, in that space. So we were always gonna expect a drop like we saw the front end of that graph after the 2016 period. And that's sort of where we're operating now. When we look at the 10 year average, we are up on that 5%, but we do have to understand that in that 10 year average includes a lot of that froth that we had in 2020 to 2022. So prices have come back and I'll get to it later, but there is a lot of talk around the ECI sitting in that six, 
650 to 700 range and it's operated there for over a month. So is that the new normal? Is what's happening in the US in their rebuild? Are, um, uh, is 90 CL prices sort of helping underpin a sort of a floor of a price, a new, a new price, which isn't at the peak that we saw in the last three years, but is the new peak around that $600. The other piece here is just the last piece before I get onto Brahmins and then the projections is what is happening and, and the sort of finish, what producers are gonna do with the different types of animals that they uh, produce. So we see in this graph, so the green line there is the feeder price and the lighter turquoise graph there is a uh, heavy steer. And there was a significant premium to feeder steers between 2020 and 2022. And that meant a lot of producers we're selling into the feeder market than finishing out grass-fed bullocks. The price coming back, it's going to be really interesting in that that, that uh, premium got to pos over 25% at one stage. So there was a real economic incentive to sell into the feeder market. As that gap closes, it's now operating at 10%. Is It's going to be interesting to see what producers do. It's just something that's sort of, we're not having a comment on it, but it's something we're monitoring is, is, is this closing of the gap between feeder and heavy steer prices going to change what producers do and will more people actually finish out on grass rather than going into the feeder market at the moment. Last thing is Brahmins. Um, it's hard to get Brahmin data, but we can get it. So in MLA, we only collect uh, breed data through the store reports that we cover. So we, can, we can't get it in any prime sales. But uh, going into the Brahmin data and doing a deep dive is we all heard that there were a lot of Brahmins going south when the drought broke in 2020. Went back and had a look at the data and there was, there was a 9%, nearly 10% increase in Brahmins that headed south in 2020, the first year after the drought. And in 2021 and 2022, that actually jumped even above 30%. So we do know that that flow of animals down south of Brahmins definitely took place and we've got now data to support to sort of support, at least in store markets, the increase in uh, percentage of, of animals. And that was just driven by the Southern supply. The interesting thing is there was also a lot last year when the Southern rebuild had sort of gained momentum and you wouldn't think that there might be as much Southern demand for <coughs> Brahmin animals. A lot of those Brahmin animals coming through in the South Southern system last year were actually some of those offspring. So they were more uh, Brahmin cross, but they were coming through the sale yards last year. The other piece is, <coughs> we saw in 2019, 48% of the Brahmins going through store and, uh, were female. We saw that drop quite significantly down to 40% 2022. So that was just what we saw. And this is just some data to back up what we expected to happen is people were buying Brahmin steers to put on some grass when they had it in 2020, 2021. They were buying steers. They had some grass in areas down south that you wouldn't normally expect to see Brahmins and they were finishing them off on grass because they had had grass after the drought. They didn't know whether in 2020 they were going to uh, invest in a long-term rebuild. So they just wanted those steers. We've seen that continue. Um, and then interesting fact on the right, there is just the five top sale yards for if you are looking through our store reports where we're getting the throughput for Brahmin cattle, uh, Gracemere, Dubbo, Tamworth, Calcourt and Misho. So I'll go on to the projections, and this is what we look at, what's happening for supply, production, and slaughter for uh, the next three years out to 2025. Like I touched on, our slaughter, we probably will revise, and our next edition of our projections will come out in July, and we're likely to update where we see slaughter um, hitting. But the top line figures, sorry, are there. That, so we've got a herd of 28.8 million head this year. We've got slaughter of 6.6 .6 million, but that could be revised up to seven. And we've got production of, again, over 2 million uh, tonnes. So the national cattle herd picture looks like this, uh, but it's better explained like this. Um, so this is a picture of where we've come from and, and, and where we're going. Uh, we've got the herd growing to... Uh, We've got the herd growing to 28.8 million head this year before it gets out to 29.4 and then 29.6. So we've got that tapering. We'll get to it in another slide, but what's driven that such strength of the rebuild. If we look there where we're sitting relative to historical averages is we're sitting well above all historical averages. We're sitting above the 20 year average, the 50 year average, the 10 year average and the five year average from now on. So this year, 
from 2022, we got to the level that we exceeded all those long-term averages. We're only gonna extend on that in the next three years. What we're gonna to get to in 2023, so this year at 28.8 million head, uh, we're gonna have the highest herd since 2014. And that's been driven by three successive La Ninas, which is an extremely rare event. It's only happened three times in the last 50 years. So we've had three consecutive La Nina events. So that's what's really um, driving it. We've had this rebound in the South that really kicked off in 2020 and 2021, 2022. 2022 and this year are, are, are where we're seeing the rebuild in the North. And that's where we've seen such strength year on year on year. We expect there won't be a liquidation in 2023 because we're nearly at the end of it. We won't see a liquidation in 2024 because there's soil moisture, there's water in, there's available water, um, there's grain stores if we need it down to, like we, in systems relying on grain, we've got grain and fodder available. So we don't see a liquidation in 2024 and then we just see it tapering off in 2025. This is the bit I'm talking was talking about, and this is the strength. When we release these projections, people thought that the uh, strength of the rebuild and questioned why we had this rebuild so strong. We've only had this event of three Laninas in uh, three consecutive Laninas three times since two, uh, since 1970, and the herd is going to get back in 2025 when it's 29.6 million head. That's going to be the biggest herd in 50 years back to 1970 that year at the last year of that first triple Lanina there. So that's what our modeling is showing us where the herd's gonna to get to. And that's the historical context of where the herd will sit over time. Slaughter. Where we've come from is a, a really critical picture around slaughter to where we're going. 2021 was the lowest slaughter in 37 years and 2022, was the lowest level slaughter level in uh, 38 years. That came off after a huge drop in 2020. So originally we thought 2020 was the first year. Sorry, I'm having a bit of... Um, first year, so that 2020 figure that drops from 29, that high of 20, in 2019, we thought was the first year of a rebuild, but we got that wrong. It went into 2021 and 2022. So we're coming off a very low base. We've got slaughter increasing 10% this year or 600,000 head, which is in historical terms has been done, but we're coming off such a low base, such a low um, herd, herd starting point in 2020 and also the process that um, shortage issue. So when we went out with our projections, we go out and we talk to all the big processes and we sort of test our numbers with them. And they said to us that processor uh, capacity and processor access to labor was gonna be the biggest thing that sort of kept uh, slaughter low this year. As I said before, in our slaughter slides, we do expect slaughter or slaughter is showing at the moment that it's actually 20% up, not 10% up on last year. So we could end up hitting slaughter of 7 million, which would put us in line with 26, uh, 2019 and uh, 2016. So that's where we could get to this year. And that's just been a big flow of uh, grass fed cattle, uh, young cattle, and then we expect it also to be females. This looks at, Sorry, production. I think there's a lag. <laughs> there. Beef production. So last year, uh, beef production was the lowest they've been in over 25 years. One of the key things that touches on what Angus talked about is we had low supply, so therefore we had low production and low exports. When we saw the Australian export share in markets fall last year or total exports fall, it wasn't demand driven. It was because we had such low supply. And that's something we've just got to be, we're very mindful when we're talking to importers um, or overseas customers is that the drop in exports wasn't demand driven and the product isn't, you know, there's no problem change to Australian or demand for Australian product. It's just been supply. As we see here, as we move out to 2025, the pro we're expected to uh, produce over 2.4 million tonnes and that's gonna be the third biggest on record. And we will be able to find a home for all of that because at the same time, the US isn't going into rebuild and they're pulling all the US product out of the global market. So 
we're working counter cyclical with the US. So we're gonna have third highest production in, in three years time. And we will be able to find a home for that because the US product will, will dry up and we're already seeing that. Here, the last two slides on the projections are just the FE forecast. So MLA doesn't forecast price. We go out to six analysts, uh, one in the room. We go out to Ravo, Abers, NAB, Auctions Plus, Mercado, and episode three. And we get them at, uh, every six months to forecast uh, where they see the price six months out. So from uh, the end of December, we asked them where they saw the Eki sitting in the middle of this year. And they gave us uh, within 90% confidence, the upper limit, the middle limit and the lower limit. And they all saw a little bit of an uplift in, in where the Eki could um, sit by 30 June relative to where it was in December. But you will see where it is sitting at the moment at 650. It is sitting within that range. It's between 626 and 811. So they generally get it pretty right, the analysts. They also did one on feeder steer and they expected a similar thing. They expected a little uptick on, on uh, December 30 prices for feeder steer. Um, but they had it sitting in that band between 460, 467 and 358. The art, last piece I'll close out um, is just a few future considerations that Matt asked us to, to look at. And they sort of build a lot of these on what uh, Angus was saying. So I'll go slowly. Um, so this is the Australian export price and the Australian export price is sitting around $11 at the moment when we look at the prices for Australian beef <coughs> globally, it has fallen. And that's shown by the green uh, arrow, uh, the green graph on the left. Um, but you'll see that trending up over time and we're still finding home for that product with that increase in price. The one on the right, right, is the 90 CL in yellow. And the 90 CL is staying rather elevated, which is providing sort of, there's a lot of people in industry that believe that the 90 CL price and the US uh, rebuild <coughs> will create a sort of floor on export markets and also uh, domestic livestock prices. So this just shows the growth that we've been able to achieve in, uh, in, since 2019 through to now, where we've been able to see uh, export prices go on a per kilo basis. So even through COVID, Australia has been able to extract an increase of nearly uh, $3 uh, a kilo for every dollar of beef export in the last three years, which is nearly a 50% increase on what it was in 2019. So there's less of it, but we are able to add price on it and consumers are buying it at that price. Going on to global, uh, yeah. Get my bag. global prices as well from a cattle prices perspective. This is the last one I want to touch on from a global prices perspective. The green price there is the Australian price. The yellow price there is the US livestock prices. And then the other two are the South American livestock prices. And you'll see really since the middle of, or oh, the end of 2022, the US livestock over prices over took us and ours, when we ours started to fall, that's as they sort of prepare for their rebuild and, and our rebuild matures. This flows through into export of environments and even the domestic US market where the US uh, beef will now be becoming more uncompetitive relative to Australian, which is a really good uh, place to be when we're looking on, on an export market, but it also from our producers, is for our producers, uh, we're more cost-effective producers than our US. Countries uh, of production. So this is just a piece around where we actually sit. Because we're a big producer, we're a relatively big producer, but the big production is really happening in Brazil, China, EU, India, Argentina, Mexico, and the US. We think of ourselves as a big country because we export a lot of it, but a lot of these other countries are just doing a lot of consumption in market. And this just gives us context and sort of grounds us around where we sit in a global context. I'm just gonna shoot ahead, I think. No, that's, 
because this is the piece that shows it is our production versus our export. So if you look at the Australia's share of production where the green, the little green slice of the pie, and we we're about 3%. So we export about 10% of export. So it shows that we're overpower in exports, we over um, index, but it also shows the importance of the export market and always to have that uh, front and center when we're uh, considering any ex uh, any negotiations or, or around how prices internationally will affect us. We're far more exposed to international prices than some of the other countries in there that have a smaller share of the export uh, pie, but might have a bigger production slice of the pie. This is an interesting one um, before I go into the US situation, it's just around Brazil. So Brazil's production hasn't really increased a whole lot if we go back over the last five, six years. It has. It's got a bit of a cyclical perspective, but the interesting thing is, I to get there. That's what I've look, been looking for the whole time. If we go back to 2016, production was in line with really where it is now, but what's happened is Brazil has become a bigger, far bigger exporter. So this is something that we do have to watch as an industry, is even if Brazil's uh, production doesn't increase, like Angus was talking about before around what happens with domestic uh, consumption in Australia and people being priced out, that's a real real problem that's happening in Brazil. So even if their production is the same, if we go back to sort of 2017, the share that is going exported is growing exponentially, is growing far faster. So they're in Brazil, they're becoming an increasingly bigger player on the export market because if their production stays the same, they're exporting more than they were just five, six years ago. And that is means that there's less beef being consumed in, in domestically and it's going, on, going export. Whereas in Australia, we sort of, whatever we produce, we, we fill our domestic consignments or our domestic pot first and then export the rest. With Brazil, it's interesting, is their export, they, they will shift and, and producers or domestic consumers, sorry, will get shoved out of the market if they can get a high price on the export market. US production, you've probably heard a lot about this, is uh, the US rebuild is, if we look at the drought monitor map from December through to now, is if we look at the drought map from the University of Nevada in uh, December last year, the whole country was red. Fast forward three, three months, four months, if we broke the US up into thirds, Western third, Eastern third, and the Central third, both the Eastern and the Western third are out of, or out of drought or not in as severe conditions. So the drought is easing in the US, given the majority of US production is in that middle third of America, but there is drought um, easing in the US. It follows a period of significant female slaughter rates. So in the US, if the seasons turn, Historically, over the last three years, they have been killing significant amount of their breeders. This is wrong, of course. They've been the highest uh, level since the 2000s of breeders. So they have been going through and killing their uh, breeding stock, which is gonna make any rebuild far slower. So the US has at the moment, when they've been going through liquidating their herd, has been putting a lot of product on the international market. When they go into a rebuild, their rebuild is gonna be far slower than ours was. And that means that there's going to be less US product on the global market for longer. This just shows that the beef uh, cow herd is in decline. Uh, the beef cow herd is the lowest since the 60s and the total herd is the lowest since 1916. So again, the US herd is small. They've got no breeding females, which is going to keep the US out of international markets longer when they go into the rebuild like we've just come out of. Rip through these last few slides, Matt. So this is just... I'm having a bit of a nightmare here. This looks at per capita consumption out to 2030. So this is an our figures. This is the world uh, FAO. So the OECD and the UN. And if you look at it, we are gonna remain one of the top 10. These are the top 10 per capita consumption countries out to 2030. So we do remain in the top 10. They, this is per capita consumption for some of the other countries provided. Um, it's interesting, some of the countries like Norway, and like we, we export a lot to Korea, but they're actually not in the top 10. Argentina will remain up there, but, but our consumption will remain around those 20 kilos. It's actually not, not expected to fall too much. The interesting thing here, this is percentage change on those uh, per capita consumption charts. And there is the, the countries down the bottom in red 
are the ones that are expected to decline in per capita consumption and the ones that are in black are expected to remain up. You'll see there, we talked a lot about Indonesia. Interestingly, uh, Pakistan is in there. South Africa are expected to grow Vietnam. So Southeast Asia is expected to grow in a per capita consumption. Those countries are also expected to grow in population. So it's a real positive for the industry being located where we are in Southeast Asia. You will notice that Australia though is expected to go reduce in per capita consumption. Seeing there's so much red there and thinking you could think, geez, there's a lot of uh, red, there's a lot of per capita consumption, beef consumption is going to decline. It's not all doom and gloom. Because this looks at global uh, consumption in a total sense as we go out to 20, 2030. And these are the top 10 countries from a global, con global perspective that will be consuming the most beef in total, in aggregate total, when we go out to 2030. And again, there's Japan, which is a key export market. There's US, there's Vietnam. So there's a lot of countries that we're already operating in. Interestingly, again, Pakistan keeps coming up as an area which will have a per capita growth and total population growth. <clears throat> if we look here, there's only two countries that which expect total consumption to drop. And that's Japan and the EU. So there's a lot of talk about EU FTAs and Japan is where we, we, we export to. This is an MLA data, but the OECD expects just the EU and Japan to expect reduced consumption, total con consumption out to 2030. So that the fact that there's so much uh, black, black country names down the bottom is a really encouraging uh, piece for everyone in the room. It means that there is only going to be growing beef consumption on a global basis. And again, interestingly, the one that is growing the most is the, is the Philippines. The total consumption in the Philippines is expected to go over, grow by over 40%. And we're really well placed to enter into that uh, growing Philippines market. We're in Southeast Asia, we're, we're in close proximity. So we're really well suited to jump into there. And the last one Matt asked me to present was just on uh, FTA. So we have got an FTA with, Europe, with England now. Um, so the FTA for England, we're gonna get 35,000 uh, tonnes. And if we could fill that full quota, that means that we England would become overnight the seventh biggest market for Australian beef. It gets even better. Over the next 10 years, every year incrementally, we'll get access to 110, thousand tons to uh, England, which would make it the fifth biggest market. That, that's a good thing as well. So we're getting more competition. We're getting access to a bigger share of a high value uh, market, which is the UK. The only thing I would caveat is it still will be fifth biggest market. So it will still not be as important to Australia as Japan, China, US and South Korea. And if Indonesia grows, so it's still going to be very important and it's a high value market but it won't be the silver bullet. It's not going to be the biggest market that we export to. And the only other thing, New Zealand has had access to uh, the UK for uh, or more preferential access to us. This is on lamb for the UK, uh, lamb from New Zealand into the UK. But what it looks at is actually, it's great to have access to the UK. They're a high value market. But what this graph shows is the differential between China import prices and the UK import prices for New Zealand sheep meat while they've had preferential treat access. And you'll see, if we go right back to the back, we had such a strong over $3 premium for UK product, UK import compared to China. So a lot of product was going there. There's a graph that shows this in an inverse. And as that differential between the UK and China's dropped, more product from, the, from New Zealand has shifted from going to the UK to China. So the mark, like it's great to have access to a market, but the market will actually determine where product goes to. So the key takeaways, supply is what's driving price. The rebuild will taper off. There's gonna be some cattle to hit the market in this year. We, we've seen 22% increase in slaughter, but that's still not going to get us to 10 year average slaughter. 10 year average slaughter is 7.8 million head. So even, at 7 million head, we're well below the 10 year average of slaughter. So there is gonna be a lot of cattle to hit the market. It's gonna be grass fed cattle and it's going to be females. And then the other piece is, is watch the US closely. 
uh, there's a lot of opportunities with the US has, when it's been liquidating, flooded a lot of product into the domestic US market, Japan and Korea. As that goes into the rebuild, they're, they're going to pull out of Korea, Japan and the domestic market. And there's a great opportunity for Australia to jump into that space. Tim. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah. Any, any questions for Steve around the room? Steve, um, just with regards to the, we've seen the US cattle market tighten up with, as they go into their rebuild phase. Um, South America has also been very dry the last couple of years as they've been in El Nino and we've been in La Nina. So we, can we expect to see those same constraints coming out of South America when, um, when they eventually get some better seasons? Yes, yes. Uh, the, uh, yeah, we expect that to happen with uh, Brazil as well and the big producers there. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Tom Copley. Um, you spoke about the uh, an oncoming wave of cows later in the year. What's going to be the driver for that? So a lot of those cows that were used uh, as the engine driver for the rebuild that we're currently in, we know that people held cows longer for an extra calving. We knew we saw just how low our female slaughter rate was in Australia in 2021 and 2022. So those females that were used in the rebuild will come onto the market. And also with people investing in genetics, as more uh, females born, people will be more selective with what they're using to breed and there'll be a sort of um, sell off of unproductive females. One of the things we looked at is with mutton. So um, sheep, obviously shorter gestational period and the rebuild being in the south of the country is ahead of where we are in the north. And if you see what has happened in the mutton market, that's exactly what happened there. Their price has been falling since the middle of, or uh, end of 2021. Um, and what happened there is those uh, ewes that were held in 2020 and 2021 for an extra um, lambing, they were sent into the market and that, that it was sort of a flood of, of um, older ewes in the mutton market and that put the downward pressure on the price that we saw with mutton. Yeah. Do, do you do the um, the age of those females? Do you, do you have data on that? We don't get that data from the ABS. We just get um, calves, female and male split. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Steve. Do we have any other questions across the room? Nothing from the north? No worries. Well, well thank, thank you once again, Steve. Um, yeah, I know it was sort of, we didn't know whether we were going to get you here in person till, uh, till later in the, in the build up to this and thank you very very much for turning up we know we know it's time i will present you too with a small gift of the awba's appreciation and uh steve you'll be available through the through the breaks to talk to people thank you very much i'd just like to introduce now from morton co um he's the general manager of livestock and logistics brett campbell i've had a, a 30 odd year association with brett we did we did have him uh coming to our first annual conference he had said yes and, and sadly, circumstances prevented him from being in that. I'm not saying he dodged a bullet um, being a feedlot operator and, and last year and it hasn't worked best for him. I mean, currently we've got a live export steer worth more than a feeder steer in the south. So the pressure's not on as far as defending Brahmins. Uh, Morton Carl, probably one of the biggest purchasers of Brahmin feeders out of central Queensland. So, so Brett's um, fully qualified to, to pass comment on that and um, an assay. And just for a general overview of the feedlot market in general at the moment, thanks, Brett Campbell. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks to uh, Matt for the invitation and Reid. Uh, it's great to be back in Rocky. And um, yeah, hopefully you, you have a great day and a, and a, and a good evening tonight. Um, I'm not going to touch that clicker. So I'll just, I'll have like a little tick that Matt had and I'll put my finger up and bid when I need a new page. So um, Matt just asked if I could give a bit of an overview on the feedlot industry. I guess um, I'll just have a, a bit of a brief history of Morton Co, what, where we've come from to, to now, 
um, some of the challenges that we're seeing in the industry at the moment, what we're trying to do to, uh, I guess, um, you know, circumvent some of those challenges and, and uh, remain uh, viable in the industry. And then I guess also, um, you know, what we see going forward in terms of expansion and, and some new businesses that we're doing. So Mort, uh, Charlie Mort, and many of you know, would, would know Charlie. He worked in Rocky here years ago. And in 90, 1997, he kicked off Mort & Co. And we were basically custom feeding uh, cattle for uh, investors and, and, uh, and producers in a varying range of feedlots across uh, Queensland and New South Wales. And in a, a short version, come to 2023, and we're currently own two and a half feedlots, uh, Grassdale feedlot south of Dolby is um, 78,000 head capacity. We've got Pine Grove feedlot near Milmarin, which is just under 10,000. And we've got a, a half ownership in Yarrambrook feedlot at Inglewood, which is uh, 16,000 head. So um, we are currently about 300 strong in terms of staff, feeding about 100,000 head at one time capacity turning over 240,000 head annually. Um, we farm a considerable amount of country around uh, both the feedlots. We're feeding over a thousand ton of feed a day. So, I mean, these are just some numbers, but I guess, um, you know, I guess the, the enormity of, of what the feedlot staff do on a daily basis is, is quite incredible. Um, we have 47 trucks in our uh, now uh, wholly owned uh, Morton Co transport fleet. Um, two and a half feedlots, and we have five dedicated beef brands that we process uh, in uh, service kill arrangements and and sell with our with our meat team. Uh, that's just a procurement through to uh, through to processing slide. Uh, we'll skip past that one. So I guess um, Morton Co livestock. Um, we're a pretty small team based in Toowoomba. Um, feeding 100,000 head, as I said, buying cattle from basically North Queensland to South Australia, um, New South Wales and Victoria, um, dealing with, you know, producers all across the eastern seaboard. We've tried to diversify our purchasing program in terms of uh, what we buy and, and the numbers we buy to try and, I guess, again, just ride out some of those lumps and bumps in terms of supply and, and, and market issues. Uh, we also do a bit of backgrounding. We've got, uh, we've had up to 10,000 head on, on backgrounding, predominantly in the south. We have done a bit in CQ, um, mainly targeting the higher value animals in the Wagyu and Angus. So we do, uh, I guess, uh, a series of programs. So we've got a uh, 100 day HGP free program we do. Uh, our short fed, which are predominantly the crossbred and Brahmins, uh, you know, from 100 to 140 days, depending on the weight into the feedlot. Uh, we do a mid-fed Angus program. So they're cattle that we pack and sell ourselves under our own brand. And we also feed a considerable number of Wagyu. Now, I guess just to put in perspective, the, the, our current inventory mix, and, and I guess for, for this room, um, We've got about 32,000 wagyus on feed at the moment, bearing in mind they're on feed from uh, averaging about 360 days. So they soak up a pen for the year. Um, about 10,000 Angus on a 150 day program, about 5,000 of the HGP free 100 day cattle. And that leaves about 53 to 5,000 of, of our short fed program, of which there's about just under half or what we classify as our Brahmin cattle. So cattle between 52 and 100% tropical breed content. So um, yeah, certainly still buying large numbers of, of uh, Bosingus and Bosingus cross cattle. Um, if we go to the next one, that's just our beef brand. So we currently have four brands, three of which are Wagyu. Um, I guess, uh, there's been, um, there's no uh, easy way to get into processing and selling beef. And it's been a pretty hard road, but I guess from, 
from over the last 10 years that I've been involved in the business with Morton Co. Um, we tried to do some short fed and trade. And I guess ultimately we were driven into the higher value uh, end of the market. We're, we're killing cattle in a, on a service kill basis. So our cost compared to the major processes are very high. So we need to get into a market where we can attract a premium and hence the Wagyu and the, and the Angus have been the programs that we've concentrated on for our own brands. So we're currently processing about uh, 500 head a week um, of, those, of those three brands. So I guess some of the major challenges and, and you'll note probably none of them are can't buy enough cattle or, or cattle are too dear. So um, often, you know, people think our biggest challenge is, is um, buying cattle and, you know, buying them at the right price or they're too dear. But really there's a lot of other things in the, in the, within the feedlot sector that concern us more than, than the, the buying of cattle, which uh, happens every week. Um, you know, we've seen, and everyone in the room here would be facing those same things and be fully aware of them. We've seen increase in cost. So, you know, our costs seem to be ballooning over the last uh, couple of years. Um, fuel, power, interest rates, um, you know, we all operate on, on uh, a fair bit of borrowed money. So that uh, interest rate going from three to six is, has had a huge impact, especially on those long fed waggy cattle. Uh, just re general repairs and maintenance, replacement costs, infrastructure, machinery. So I guess uh, everything we're buying today is more expensive than it was a couple of years ago. And if something breaks down, it's very difficult to get parts in a hurry. And if a loader blows up, it's not a case of sort of when it's, or, you know, it's how long before you can get it. So, you know, we're, we've, we've had to change our mindset in terms of repairs and maintenance and replacements in terms of doing a three and five year plan and actually ordering stuff for delivery in a couple of years. Now that may change uh, over the next year or two, but. Certainly at the moment, you try and go and buy a piece of plant or equipment in a hurry and it's really difficult. So, you know, to feed a thousand tonne of feed a day, every day, 365 days a year, um, we need that gear operating. So, so that's certainly from our maintenance uh, department, you know, they've got uh, or have had some major headaches over the last uh, 12 or 18 months. Um, feed costs. We're currently feeding a ration up around $500 fed into the bunk. So that's as dear as it was in 2019. And we we're bringing grain from Western Australia in a boat to Brisbane. So, so we're seeing very high grain prices at the moment. And that's terrific for the grain growers. Uh, you know, sorghum is still worth $400 a tonne. So, you know, the, the grain prices is, is up there in terms of historically uh, historical highs. Um, the last few winters, have been very wet. So we've actually had some pretty unfavorable feeding conditions. Um, and, and the Brahmins hate wet and cold winters, I can tell you. Uh, thin skinned cattle in, in a much colder climate in wet pens uh, do not appreciate it. And so I guess we're looking forward to hopefully a slightly drier uh, winter this year for us. Um, can rain everywhere else, but just not on the feedlots. Um, I guess we have to remain competitive. We, we're starting to become a, a 24 hour, seven day a week operation, not only at the feedlot, but in some other businesses that we've, uh, that we've bought online. So we have to remain competitive in that, in that uh, work roster. And, and I'll touch on you know, labor and, and, and increases, but so obviously labor is a major in, you know, uh, part of our business. We're up to 300, I think we've got projected sort of up to about 360 people within the next 12 months. Um, so in terms of the domestic labour supply is very tight. Uh, you can put an ad in the, you know, local media, you know, national media on all the recruitment sites um, for particular positions and you can have as many as two or three or you can have no responses. So, you know, the, the labour market is still very tight. Um, and in terms of hourly rates, we've seen probably an increase of in the vicinity of 20% over the last 12 months in terms of our hourly rates. So we had to do a, uh, a sort of pre 
um, enterprise agreement increase, a substantial increase, and then we'll see another one as that uh, as we negotiate our EA this year. Um, there's quite a lot of immigrants coming back into the country. They're saying they're running at about a thousand per day. So they're saying this year we will see somewhere between, you know, 360 and 400,000 people come back into Australia. So we're certainly seeing some pressure ease off uh, the labour market in terms of we're getting some of those international workers back in. Uh, that also comes with challenges in that you have to provide accommodation and um, hourly rates and, and some of them come via labour hire com companies which also take a clip. So again, continues to add costs, but the positive is that, uh, that we're seeing more of those people coming in. So we've actually bought a couple of unit blocks in Dalby, trying to uh, provide accommodation. And even if you've got someone coming from central New South Wales as a pen rider, um, they're happy to take the job, happy to move to Dalby, try and get a rental in Dalby or, or uh, Milmarin or Cecil Plains, it is impossible. So we actually have to start to be able to say to those people, here's a job, but here's also some accommodation um, that you that's available to you. Uh, we're looking at also some on-site facilities, which would be a, you know, a camp style setup where we can start to utilize our 24 seven uh, workers where they come in, do their shift and then, and then head home. So uh, again, all those things, you don't build anything at the moment for, you know, a million dollars is gone like that. So you start doing a 20 man camp at Grassdale and I think the, you know, it's somewhere in the vicinity of three and a half million dollars. So with kitchen facilities and um, et cetera and laundry and so forth. So, you know, the, those, the, the costs start to uh, become quite mind boggling. Uh, we're getting some trade qualified people into the country, some uh, Filipinos. So they're coming in with, um, uh, mechanical, uh, engineering, uh, fitter and tanner type uh, trade. So that's been really positive for, for the business. Um, they're here to work and they're really, you know, uh, they're assimilating into the, the workforce. They're keen to work. They are fast. Um, one of the maintenance guys says it reminds him of uh, Cars, the, the cartoon show where he said they just attack something and and within no time, they've got it pulled apart and put back together. So they're certainly keen to work um, uh, and, and have been a, a really good uh, addition to the workforce. Um, in terms of what we do as a business, we're continuing to work with schools, with school leavers on uh, school-based um, certificate courses, uh, trade fairs. Our, uh, our HR team spend a lot of time promoting um, the feedlot sector and certainly, you know, Mort as a business, as a as a an employer of choice, hopefully for some of those school leavers that are looking for work, even if it's for a short period of time. Um, we get people that go north, work uh, on a station for 12 months, come back to a year in the feedlot and then they'll head off somewhere. So I guess that uh, just trying to attract enough people to continue to, to push the work uh, flow through that we require. Uh, we've got some PALM scheme, which is a, the Pacific Islander scheme. We've got some of those guys starting within the next couple of weeks, about 15 coming in. Um, so again, some positive signs in terms of, uh, of that workforce over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, one of the other things I guess uh, we're seeing is that work on uh, methane reduction. Uh, we've done two large feed trials with feed additives. Um, the results are in, but the papers haven't been written, but they'll be publicly available once, uh, once Bovine Dynamics write those papers up. So again, it's something in that space where it's a, probably a cost to the business at this stage. No one really wants to pay extra for product because it's got less uh, methane, but it's some, something that we're, as a business, we've certainly got to keep on our radar. And uh, so I think it'll be something we do um, in terms of uh, over the next few years, it'll be something we have to do. And um, hopefully as new products come onto the market, we get, uh, get something that gives us good, good bang for our buck. Um, the other one there, biosecurity, I guess, um, another thing that, that challenges us, we've got, um, you know, there's been probably not much talk of it and I won't 
mention either of the names, but there's certainly a couple of things floating around in the archipelago to the north of us that we don't want to come to Australia. Uh, we were looking at uh, doing um, exclusion fencing around both the feedlots uh, to try and keep out pigs, et cetera. Um, again, you know, it's, it's easy to say, it's harder to do, find a contractor that wants to do it. It's, you know, half a million dollars to put a fence around uh, a large feedlot. So, you know, they're things that we, I guess, continue to grapple with on a weekly basis and, uh, um, and we'll continue to keep monitoring. Uh, that graph, I just put it up there. We've, I guess, touched on um, the, the prices and where the market's gone. But I guess the top line, the blue line, is the Wagyu price back to 2022, by the looks of it, I think. Mm, can't quite see it. Um, so, again, you know, we've said that we, we saw a perfect storm where in 2020 and 21 and 22, you know, prices uh, were reflective of the supply. Um, and I guess there's an old saying that one thing cures high prices is high prices. And that's certainly what happened with the Wagyu job. We got to a point where the uh, price of our product in international markets was uh, at a point where consumers or customers were just saying we, we cannot take any more. So, um, and the middle line is the Angus and then the bottom line is our short fed cattle. So that's a mixture of both Brahman and, and crossbred. So let's hope we start to see it stabilize and, um, and we see some positive trend as we move into the latter part of this year. Um, I guess what next for Morton Co? Um, we've got a, uh, a couple of add-on businesses that we've, um, that we've, we've kicked off at Grassdale. Um, one is a cotton seed de-oiling business, um, and we've also got a fertilizer business uh, where we're making fertilizer granules out of the uh, uh, out of our manure. Um, some of you would probably have heard we also uh, have a site uh, north of Gogango, Thirsty Creek, which uh, we're in the process of getting licensing uh, approved and. Hopefully within the next couple of months, there'll be some form of announcement for that feedlot to, uh, or have approval. Then we've got to work on getting some profitability and some money to, to build it. But with, um, uh, that's about a 30,000 head SCU feedlot just north of Goganga. So we're certainly uh, looking to continue to expand. Um, I'll just, Charlie is a, uh, quite a visionary and I guess, um, part of the reason for these add-on businesses and and you know whilst feedlotting is a margin business and and we have things we can control and a lot of things we can't control um there's not uh there's no big wins left in the feedlot industry um we're down to the you know the the half percenters the making sure troughs are cleaned regularly and feeding cattle on time every day and moisture weights in the in the the milling is correct there's no one thing that we can go, there's a 10 or 15% gain. So whilst their costs are increasing, our, our potential to increase uh, our margins is, is limited. So um, Charlie had the idea a few years ago to try and granulate our manure. We were selling it to broadacre farmers, but it's costly to move. You had to put it on at three or four tonne to the hectare. Um, so it was limited as to how far it could go and, and what, you know, uh, and, and the value you could extract out of it. So we've currently built this granulation plant at Grassdale, one line is working, and we basically take the, the composted manure and put it into a small uh, granule form that's actually able to be delivered with uh, seed in an air seeder. So you're not running uh, a machine, a, a bulk spreader across country. Uh, so it's reducing costs for for the uh, for the for the end user, so I guess these are the sort of things we or these are the businesses we've tried to bring online to to complement the feedlot the feedlot business. Um, value add that manure we get, uh, you know, tons of it every year. Um, so it's certainly something that uh, that has been a positive addition to the business. Uh, that's just a step by step um, 
process, we won't bore you with that one. Um, so then we've also, for a number of years, we've had a facility at Grasta where we've got a dehulling cottonseed process, which takes the lint from the outside of the cottonseed and gives you what we call the meat. And then we have the fluff off the outside, which is all able to be used. We've now put this uh, de-oiling factory in place, which is taking the meat and crushing that and giving us a cottonseed oil and then a meal. So um, we're currently at the stage where that is uh, uh, animal uh, consumption. The meal is uh, quite sought after by the chicken and, and pig industry. We can use it ourselves, but we'll probably sell it. And the next step in the uh, cottonseed de-oiling process will be taking it through to human consumption. So we'll actually process, it, process that oil to a uh, human consumption oil. Then they use it basically for chip cooking and it's quite widely used throughout, uh, throughout the world. So that's the stages of uh, the de-oiling. So the next one. Um, we've also got a... Uh, uh, a gentleman works with us, Cameron Best, who's got a Predict the Plus program, which is um, will be available. He's doing a couple of uh, uh, field days at Injun and Mitchell at the moment. It's an opportunity to measure feed. Um, it's also will be something that could be used for uh, measuring carbon going forward. So again, another initiative that we've had. Um, we we have bought a little stock feed business at Gyra. And the longer term uh, hope is that we'll produce a pellet also at Grasdale, which will then be able to be sold off site. So again, just trying to sort of spread that, that risk and, and increase income possibilities with, uh, within the business. Uh, transport, which I touched on earlier. So um, Charlie bought a half share in a business called Farm Hall a number of years ago. And we've recently purchased the, the last of that business. So we have our own fleet of trucks and a service center at uh, Pittsworth that does uh, all the servicing and fit outs for trucks and machinery. And that is it, Matthew. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Brett. I, I mean, you, you, you've blown me away. I thought a feedlot was just a feedlot. <laughs> but, um, but all that vertical integration, I mean, that's great. That's great for the industry and it's great for profitability. And I do understand, yeah, you can't change your other margins like, like most major industries today. But uh, do we have any questions for Brett? Uh, nothing in regards to pricing. I can't go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nina House, this is probably a loaded question given that the fact that we're all Brahmin breeders. But um, given that you're brands are focused on the way you and the Angus. What, where do you see the future for Brahmins in the feedlot industry? Uh, yeah, look, I guess to, to keep it in perspective, those brands are, are 500 head a week and we, we, we truck somewhere around about 42 or 300 head weekly out of, the, out of our feedlots to, to process. So, so whilst those brands aren't Brahmin brands, um, they're certainly the, that niche end of the market, hence why we do that. Um, I think going forward, I mean, we wouldn't be planning on building a feedlot at Gogango if we weren't thinking we'd continue to feed, you know, Brahmin and Brahmin cross infused cattle. Uh, I think, you know, how, how does that all play out? I guess we've had an economist and an MLA speak on, you know, so we've got probably the thing we have to remember is we saw those graphs earlier, you know, we had Brazil down the bottom in terms of cost. Um, so, you know, that's ultimately going to be the, the driver going forward or be how we compete internationally in, in markets. I think uh, the grain fed industry we see as still really positive. Uh, you know, if you look at the last few years, you know, really the, the, the numbers on feed have continued to increase. Most, there's, you know, reasonable amount of feedlot expansion happening in existing sites to, you know, up to either licensing or close to, to their capacity. Um, so we've seen some really positive moves over the last couple of years in, in grain feeding. And, and I think the Brahmins will be, will be part of that. Um, 
you know, you're not a Wagyu, you're not an Angus, um, but that's uh, not everyone wants Wagyu and Angus either. So, yeah. Yeah, and but you, you, mu you must see building a feedlot at Gagango that you're going to have a high content pretty much herd there. Like, you know, just geography is going to force you to have a lot of boss indicus and boss indicus infused cattle in your new feedlot. Yeah, yeah, buddy. Look, and I guess uh, the 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 theory there was, I guess you've got access to all the cattle within the ticks without having to do the unload and dip at Mower or Grossmere or wherever that we're currently doing. Um, so you alleviate that that cost um, to the vendor, but also to ourselves um, in terms of weight loss and injuries and et cetera that comes with great old dipping. Um, the Western cattle have, uh, are able to come, if they're coming from McKinlay or Longreach or Barkey, they can either turn at Barkhorn and head south or they can come straight through to here. So, um, you know, I guess what we haven't worked out is where we're gonna sell them all yet, but that'll, That'll come. Increased processing capacity in Rockhampton. There'll be no taxi drivers left. Uh, do we have Do we have any more questions? Brett, you said there's no more low hanging fruit for the feedlot. What about the cattle themselves? Is there variation there? Things like feed efficiency in terms of your feed costs. Are there angles that you can now, you know? approach in terms of making your cattle more profitable? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I guess the last few years, probably um, short supply, you know, at times, um, you know, breeds or, or creates some inefficiencies because it was, you had to buy something and you bought them rather than nothing, which as a livestock buyer uses as an, as an excuse. Um, and your CFA is continually tapping you on the shoulder saying, why'd you buy those? Why'd you buy those? You know, so yeah, certainly I think um, the animal performance and individual performance as vendors, we're working, you know, quite closely with some vendors um, that had, you know, some quite poor performance and trying to dig into why and trying to get them to improve. Um, you know, some of them are backgrounders, some are breeders, you know, we've got, breeders that were probably, you know, strong Brahmin herds a number of years ago that have, you know, done a fair bit of crossbreeding over the last 10 years, still have a huge Brahmin cow base, um, but, but join a, a fair number of, uh, uh, you know, Euro or British type bulls across a percentage of the herd to create a, I guess, a, a more suitable feeder steer. Um, so certainly that, uh, individual information and performance will become far more critical. Yeah. And, and we're looking at it all the time. Um, it's one of those, as, as, the, as our business has grown quickly, probably our IT strengths haven't grown as fast. So we do a lot of stuff manually. So we can provide information uh, on ADG and, and it's a pen consumption, but we get enough data that we can certainly provide that back to the vendors. Um, and, and we're looking at that constantly, yeah. So, so I guess it's, you know, often the question, and it might come up this afternoon, you know, questions asked about, you know, the Brahmin breed. I mean, we get some horrific performance out of some Brahmins, um, but we get some good performance out of, out of Brahmins as well. So where they've come from, you know, where they've been bred, what their backstory is, um, you know, and, and we get that same result across other breeds so it's not that's not unique to to the brahman breed that's across you know our wagyu the wagyu one is is a, a really good one to focus on because there's you know as those feed costs have continued to, to ratchet up you know it, it's been a focus on marbling and again really short supply and as the supply base grows there'll be far more scrutiny on feedlot performance along with marbling because you know the two need to go hand in hand Thanks, Brett. We've got a we've got a question from the north. Um, can we? Hello and uh, hello from sunny North Queensland. Um, Brett, just a, a quick query. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, um, I suppose the the social license or environmental license for producing feedlot beef. Um, 
you know, associated with carbon production per kilo of beef produced. Um, I assume that those long fed programs, the WAGs, would have significantly increased amount of carbon produced through methane emissions being fed for so long and, and feed, pr feed production costs. And obviously being a Brahmin conference and those short fed cattle being a lot more carbon efficient, I, I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on where you see our breed playing a role in, in becoming more environmentally sustainable um, without sounding like a crazy lefty. That, that's a, a huge question. <laughs> that I, I'm not 100% sure I can answer, but the, I guess if you look at the, the feedlot sector, we're actually quite low in, in terms of the total emissions in, within the whole, the, the whole chain. So the, from calving to feedlot is actually much higher than, than the time they spend in, spend in the feedlot. Certainly the Wagyu with the longer time on feed is... Uh, going to be a higher emitter than a than 120-day animal. Where the whole thing lands, I, I'm not sure. We've, As I say, we've done those couple of feed emission trials. Um, the numbers that were quoted or the numbers that were originally uh, quoted on the, the reduction in emissions by feeding the additive uh, on a chamber trial that we then did for ourselves, as we have to do that to, to actually... Uh, claim those uh, reductions it was considerably less than what the product had originally claimed. So, you know, I think there's a lot of work to be done in this space in a short period of time over the next couple of years, and and hopefully we see, you know, some some positive gains. We're all part of it. Um, unfortunately, just at the moment, the consumer's not really prepared to pay um, for the benefit of you know, low emission beef, I'm, I'm not 100% sure we can become, you know, you know, we're probably only ever going to be low emission. Like it, it, it's, it's difficult to, you know, you look at your scope three emissions. Um, there's a lot to, there's a lot to get rid of um, to be carbon neutral in, in, our, in this beef game. Um, and yeah, I guess as a company, we certainly didn't want to then go and buy green credits from the Philippines or Indonesia to say we had carbon ne neutral beef. For us, that was, that was Irish. I mean, you either make reductions and, and do something positive or, or, you know, to buy credits uh, offshore did not seem to be, you know, a, a responsible uh, thing to do in the, in the corporate world, I guess. So, yeah, I'm not really sure that that answers the question because there's so many questions unanswered and, I'm not smart enough to really to answer them all. Thanks, but we've just got another question uh, online from John Condon from Beef Central. Yes, morning, Brett. Can you hear me? Yeah, John. Yeah. There you go. Hey, uh, just a quick one. With the recent uh, decline in uh, in feeder cattle prices we've seen this year, uh, what does the the change in in the relationship between the cost of gain? And feeder steer prices mean for the more business? Uh, well, I guess, John, the cost of gain certainly for the last couple of years has been um, like much lower than the cost of the cattle. So we were happy to feed cattle longer um, because the purchase price was higher than the cost of gain. We're back to around about uh, pretty close to purchase price and cost of gain is pretty much the same. So I guess what that'll mean is instead of feeding a short fed 120 or 25 days, we'll probably want them out at 105 days. So the shorter, shorter feeding period, the, the better currently. Thanks, Brett. Any more questions across the room before we break for Smogo, Angus? Thanks, Brett. Uh, not a cattle rally question, but a grains one. Um, you, you had up there and, and we talked about growth in feedlot numbers, what you're doing with increased numbers of cattle on feed and um, increased length of days on feed, et cetera. Um, when you put us into the position of competing on a global market against a US grain fed system or a developing Brazil grain fed system, 
they've got a massive feed base available to them for their feeding industries. Whereas here, you're largely competing with human grade consumption grain. And how, how do you foresee the Australian grains industry? Does it change to a growing feedlot need? And, and can we develop a consistent feed base that allows us to continue to grow the feedlot industry? Mm. Yeah, uh, again, very good question. I, I'm not, I think um, one of your slides on the Ukraine Russia thing, I mean, that's certainly driving that export market at the moment. Um, you know, two years ago, you, there's commentary around the, you know, the, the size of the grain crop, oh, they'll never export it all, they'll have to sell it domestically. Mm -mm, no way. If it's, if it's $100 a tonne dearer, they'll find a way to export it. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we've seen that, you know, that Black Sea market is driving this this export market. Um, how that plays out over the next few years, I, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not a grain analyst by any means. Um, I think, you know, we've seen pretty good seasonal conditions. There's actually a lot of grain in Australia. There's heaps of it. I mean, it's stacked up everywhere, but but they can, you know, sellers of grain and, and they're in business, so they're selling it for the highest price, um, you know, which is predominantly export. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Brett. And yeah, just a personal comment on that. It is amazing the amount of on-farm grain storage across oh. across the country now that, that, that to me is a great production and profitability protocol that the grain farmers have undertaken that as grazy as we find hard to store and hold product to manipulate the market but a wonderful example has been set by grain farmers but it's made it harder for Brett. Mm. Yeah. But if there's no more questions we will move on to Smoko. Um, nothing. We are running way behind time but that's a good thing. Um, thank you very much and once again thank you Brett. A small token of the AWBA's appreciation mate. Thank you very much. Yo, th thanks everybody for moving back into the room. I hope you enjoyed that great spread put on by the Frenchville. Today, I'll try not to scratch my ear again, Pete. Uh, and our next section, I don't, know, I don't know how many people understand that we've had Brahman Brin projects going on now for, for close to 10 years and, or over 10 years, but, but for 10 years, we, we, we have had a supply of steers that have, been, um, that have been a part of that program that we've been able to do gene genomic testing with and then do slaughter results and everything. And one of the byproducts of that is, is we have had steers to make available for other projects and one of those projects has been going for a couple of years now I think um, or at least this year we've had cattle down at Gatton that have been going through a program um, where they've had tags and collars, or collars mostly fitted to them uh, to measure feed consumption and, and weight gains and therefore feed efficiency. I mean I think it's one of the, the greatest measurements looking into the future that we, that we can look forward to having in the industry is a is you know an economic viability um, measurement, so to speak. Um, so, Aaron, Dr. Aaron Ingram from the Ingham, sorry, Ingram, Ingram, sorry, I knew I'd stuff it up because uh, from the CSIRO has been involved with this sort of stuff, and he's actually the team leader in the in research and and monitoring these programs. And we are we are so privileged and lucky to have him here today. He's been working with these steers down at Gatton, and um, yeah, it would be good to hear his ideas and his progress on. Uh, on measuring feed efficiency. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, uh, Matthew, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me along. It's a great opportunity uh, for us to get out and, and talk to everyone. It's obviously very difficult for us to get out and talk to every single producer. So being able to connect through these sort of breed society events is, is very important for us because it, it's a bit of a truth test uh, for the technologies that we develop. and. Uh, you're going to get the warts and all story today. I, I thought I would start with a little bit of background because it is a pretty complicated area uh, that we're talking about here that goes into this technology. Uh, and then just give a quick uh, update of the results that have occurred through the pasture uh, intake phase of the trial today. I brought a bit of show and tell with me. So this is a collar that hasn't been on an animal. That's why it all looks clean and beautiful. 
Um, I'm happy for if people want to have a look at that and pass it around. Um, there's no batteries or anything in it, so but it just gives you an idea of what it is that, that goes on the animal. As you can see, it's a pretty durable plastic housing, solar panels, uh, so that it recharges while it's on the animal. Basically, they can stay on the animals indefinitely. We've had them on animals for sort of well in excess of six months. Um, the bottom part is just the, the strap to uh, sit it on the animal. So as you can see from the pictures, they sit on the back of the animal's head, just on the back of the neck. The bottom part is a counterweight. So that basically just ensures that this bit stays upright and facing towards the sun so that they recharge. They will work if they're underneath, but they don't charge so well when they're in the shade underneath the animal's head. So we try to pull them around back up onto the top. So yeah, I'll just pass that around if people want to have a, have a look while I'm going. Okay, so next slide, please. I tend to be a bit of a wanderer while I talk too, so it's gonna be hard for me to stand here behind the lectern. Uh, it's also hard for me to see my slides, but oh, actually I can see them up the back up there. That makes it a bit easier. All right, so that we've got a large group that are developing new technologies and tools to measure things on animals. Um, and, and the reason that we wanna do that is because of the quote up here that is attributed to Lord Kelvin, if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. And there's a lot of fundamentals in animal production systems that are not easily measured. There's things that we can measure and sometimes you can measure one animal or two animals or 10 animals, but in order to do genetic improve, improvement programs, you need to be able to measure thousands of animals. So it needs to be scalable, it needs to be cheap, it needs to be easy for people to use. Uh, so next slide, please. So, so why do we use sensors? So, so basically, as I was saying, it, it allows us to measure things that we weren't able to measure before. And when you think about the sort of things we're talking about, these are things that relate to the growth of the animal, their health and well-being, and reproductive performance. So they're the absolute fundamentals of the business, basically. And at the moment, there's limited tools available to do these. So um, our team is working pretty hard to, to bring these uh, on board, to validate them, and then pass them over to the commercial sector who get them out there and sell them to everyone. So what the digital technologies allow us to do is measure basically lots of animals, as I said, allows us to do it cheaply, objectively, which is a good thing. As you know, if, you know, if you've been standing out there in a raceway and people are writing stuff down on a, a piece of paper, what one person writes one day is not the same as what someone writes the next day. And all of that influences the accuracy of predictions in breeding programs. So getting good objective and consistent measures. We can do it remotely. So we don't have to bring an animal in and sit it in a, in a pen or something like that, we can put the collar on it and let the animal go off and do what it is that it wants to do. So that's pretty important as well because most feeding trials that have been done to date are based on animals that are sitting in a pen with cut feed being brought to them or ration being brought to them. They've also been done on animals that are typically growing animals. And so what we can also do is put it on the maternal herd and maintaining the maternal herd is more than half of the energetic cost that goes into the, the production system. So getting some sort of feel for Maternal efficiency is a, a pretty important thing, we think. We can do it continuously. Um, at, as you know, most people want to work between nine and five and knock off and go home. So we can put the sensors on and they can measure the animals 24 um, seven. What's the other one there? Without interference, yeah. So that means that it's not people wandering around the animals. Animals will respond to people or equipment, infrastructure in their environment. We, we can let them go out there and do it is what they want to do without us annoying them and in typical production environments. Uh, so next slide, please. So this slide is an attempt to break down intake. So the big thing that we wanted to measure was intake. So we looked at lots of different things at the start and people wanted to go all over the place, but we said, look, the big fundamental, the bit that people can't measure is how much grass does an animal eat when it's out grazing, doing what it is that it wants to do. So that's what we're gonna focus on. So what we then tried to do was work out what we needed to measure in order to do that. So we tried to break it down into mathematical functions. And so you can see here that we break it down into three parts basically. So the grazing time, the number of bites an, an animal takes and how much grass is in each one of those mouthfuls. If you can explain those three variables, you can get a pretty good estimate of intake. So at the moment we can do the top two really well. The third one, we've got some pretty good ideas how to do that. And we're trying to sort of validate that at the moment. But when we put that together, that allows us to measure intake. And the way that this operates is based on the inertial movement of the animals. So there's an accelerometer in, in our, um, our sensor that's 
floating around over here, which we call an e-grazer. And so it's exactly the same thing that you find in your mobile phone or your smartwatch or whatever it is that tells you how many steps you're taking, you know, whether you're swimming or riding a bike or whatever it is. So we just calibrate that to cattle movement. And so it's basically the inertial forces measured, so forwards and backwards, up and down and left to right. We get a value for each one of those and we can measure that at different rates. So we currently measure it at what we call 50 hertz. So that's 50 measurements per second. We get a value in each one of those axes that says what the animal's doing. And what we can then do is calibrate those movements to the animal's actual behavior. And so we can say, when it looks like this, the animal's grazing, when it looks like this, the animal's ruminating, when it looks like this, the animal's walking. And so once we can then look at those, develop those behavior classifications for the behaviors, what we're able to do is go, how much did the animal consume in that period of grazing? And then we can calibrate the system for intake that, that way. So I, I, know it's, I know it's complicated, but hopefully that gives you just a bit of a quick overview. It, it's an hour long lecture in itself just to explain how, how it all works, but uh, hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview. And so the beauty of that is, is once you can measure intake, you can then correlate that to production traits. So live weight gain, number of calves produced, whatever it is that you wanna measure, and you can get an efficiency value. And as we know, you know, people like the efficient car. If it goes 100 Ks on eight liters, it's better than a car that goes 100 Ks on 20 liters, unless you're looking for the V8 performance, of course, I guess. But uh, in terms of energy used, that efficiency is what we're after here. So next slide. So in order to do this, you, you need an enormous number of, of different capabilities. Um, we've got engineers, animal scientists, um, so engineers to build the devices. Um, you know, there's a, a specific computer board that sits within there that they've had to develop themselves. We have to have animal scientists to actually run the, the trials. We have to have pasture experts, people who can measure pasture. Computer scientists, so all of this stuff is controlled by a whole range of programs that sit on the device as well as the analysis that occurs off the device. And then machine learning, so that's another word for artificial intelligence basically. So we hear about it all the time. This, this is the sort of place where these things get applied. The biggest issue for us was once we sort of conceptualized this is what we wanted to do, we needed a fit for purpose uh, sensor in order to do it. And so you can see that it's really a customized sensor that we've ended up, up with here. It, there was certainly nothing to buy off the shelf to allow us to do this uh, in the beginning. And look, to be honest, we never really had any intentions of taking this out as a commercial product as such. It was really a research tool to allow us to answer things about uh, environmental impact or environmental um, uh, the interaction of cattle on the environment, I guess, and then also about things like methane, carbon accounting, all those sorts of things were what, what the original purpose was, but it can obviously be used for a lot more uh, than that. Uh, and then you have to have the infrastructure to do it. So we're very lucky that at CSIRO, we've got two properties. So one down in Armidale in New South Wales and the other one up Lansdowne in Townsville, uh, which allows us to, to undertake this work. And there's a lot of infrastructure that goes in there just in terms of basic things like fencing, uh, watering points, um, pathways to move animals around. Unless you get all of that right, it's very difficult to conduct all of these trials. And as you can see there, it's not just the sensors um, that are not fit for purpose. It's everything we use is not designed to be sitting out in a paddock with cows trying to smash it to pieces. And so even just getting a camera set up out in the field is, is problematic and takes an army of people to get that done. Uh, so next slide. So this is just a bit of a history of, of where this technology is at. So um, where are we at? About 14 years or so, the technology has been around. So you can see how it's sort of miniaturized over time. And the big difference is batteries. And it's basically exactly the same story that people are seeing with electric cars and that at the moment and performance of electric cars, batteries get smaller, but, and need to hold more power in order for the cars to be uh, more economic and efficient for people to buy. Um, but yeah, the original collar was huge. It was literally a big series of Tupperware containers holding batteries, but you know, it worked, it proved the concept that it could work. And through that, we were able to progress it, progress it, progress it uh, to the device that you see circulating around the room today. Uh, next slide. So I just threw this in just as a bit of a 
highlighting the improvement that's occurred in technology over the years. So Apollo 11, that's manned first mission to the moon. So we compared the performance of that computer to the computer that sits uh, within our device. And we worked out ours is about 140 million times more powerful than that. That original computer also weighed 32 kilos. Ours weighs 50 grams. So that, that shows you how technology improves. That's in just over 50 years, they've gone from something that, you know, is literally as big as me to something that, you know, is, is as big as your, your thumbnail. Imagine where we go in the next 50 years. So we're really at the point now where this technology is becoming suitable for purpose and at a, at a cost, I guess, where it can be used by industry. Uh, in 50 years' time, we'll be well and truly past that, that this technology will be out there. It'll be available for people. People will be able to use it. Uh, next slide. So this, this slide's just to highlight what I was talking about before in, in how we sort of view grazing. So our intuitive understanding of an animal eating grass is the picture on here. We all understand what, what that looks like. We, we look at that and go, that animal is grazing. If you look at the numbers that come off the accelerometer, so as you can see, there's, there's the, the three columns, the X, Y, Z. So again, that's movement forwards, backwards, up, down, left, right. 50 times a second, we get that information off and it tells us what the forces are in those different directions. And so what we do with our machine learning or our artificial intelligence approach is go, we have to annotate when the animals are doing the different behaviors. And then we look at what the numbers look like at each of those times. So every time we see an animal grazing, what do those numbers look like? And what are the signatures within those numbers that are specific for when an animal is grazing? And so we're able to extract that and very accurately classify those behaviors. So with greater than 95% accuracy now, we can classify all of the basic behaviors. And the ones we look at, as, as I mentioned, were grazing, ruminating, resting, walking, drinking. And then we have another category that we call other. And that's just a bit of an artifact of the way that these um, artificial intelligence approaches work. They, they don't just ignore data. We have to put it into a class. So we just call it this other class, other and everything else other than basically grazing and ruminating goes into that class. So that gives you some idea for what we're doing. So we're turning our intuitive understanding of grazing into a numbers game and something that we can measure and measure reproducibly. Uh, so next slide. So this just is a bit of a representation of the biomass measurement. So, so basically the way it works is you go, I've got an animal here that's grazing. I bring it in, how much biomass was there at the start of the event? We take the animal away. How much biomass was there at the end of the event? And then we can go work out the relationship between the grazing and the biomass disappearance. And that, that becomes the intake value. So that, that's the rough and ready way of, of how we do it. And we start with individual animals. Um, next slide, please. So yeah, I mean, literally we had to get the lawnmower out and take it around and mow to little strips. And so we'd bring an animal into each of those sort of little uh, grassed areas that you can see there and we'd let it graze away for 10 minutes and we'd work out how much biomass disappeared in that time. And then that, as I said, that becomes the intake value. And over time we were able to scale up. So you can see in the sort of aerial shot there, you know, we're into sort of quarter acre, half acre, though. Um, type of uh, scales. And, and now it's at the extent where now that it's calibrated, we can just put it on the animal and send the adult animal out anywhere. What you can see here is, and th I think this is the important information for people to understand, th th this was the environment in which this was developed and calibrated. So this is a perennial ryegrass um, culture in the New England tablelands. And we were using uh, Angus cattle when we did it. We know it works for this, and we know that we can explain around about 60% of the variation of intake um, in this environment. The further you move away from this environment, the less likely it is to be accurate. And I think it's important that people understand that. But what we want to do now is basically work with the community to say, work with us to, to, to measure this in, in different pasture environments, you know, on, on different breeds of cattle and to make it more accurate and usable for people more generally. It's obviously something bigger than what we can do ourselves. Um, and so it requires people to take it out there and, and to try it and, and to find out whether it's right, wrong or indifferent, basically. So next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so 
the information that you're probably interested in hearing is the specific uh, trial work that's been happening uh, with, with the uh, information nucleus cattle. And, and so basically what there were were two periods of intake. So there's a period of intake of cattle on pasture, which occurred before Christmas. And there's a period of intake on a feedlot diet, which has actually got about two more weeks to go. We took the collars off the cattle um, on Tuesday. So we've finished our part of, of that trial. Um, but as you can see there, um, so the dates are up there, 26 days of full measurements we've got for um, the cattle on the pasture phase, and we'll have uh, 48 days uh, for the cattle in the feedlot environment. Uh, so next slide. So basically it worked pretty well is the, the summary. Um, 52 out of the 60 collars produced data that we think is okay. Um, one, one of the issues we had was the collars coming over the, over the top of the head. Uh, we were actually a bit conservative in how tight we put the collars on. The, the, the dual app is quite variable in size and extent, and we didn't want to pull it too tight. And we, to, to be perfectly honest, I was actually quite concerned that it might cause rubbing and irritation on the dual app with our collar, but we actually haven't seen any to my amazement. There, there's a couple, there's two animals that have a little bit of scuffing on the back of the head where they've taken a bit of hair off, but that's sort of neither here nor there. Um, we, we were really pleased with how the, the trial went. Um, we've analyzed the data for, for half the collars. I was sort of madly trying to get it done to, to get it done uh, for this uh, presentation. So I'll, I'll go through those results in the next uh, couple of slides. So next one. So uh, it's a bit hard to see, but this is the sort of report that you can get. So basically you've got time along the bottom. Uh, so that's dates and the 24 hours of a day up, up the vertical axis there. And you've got each of the uh, behaviors uh, in the box up there. So you can see basically the top line is grazing. Uh, the next one down is ruminating and the next one down resting. And then this other category, as I mentioned, and then uh, drinking and walking at, at quite low levels uh, down the bottom there. So this is the sort of report that you get for each animal each day. Uh, next slide. And this one looked, sorry, the, the previous one looked perfect. So, so that was for, for collar number one. So when that one came out and I looked at that result, I was like, oh, fantastic. This has worked really well. And then, then we look at the, the one for collar two onwards and yeah, the results are variable. But you can see here, again, how sort of accurate the system is. So. It, it's working along beautifully. You've got your nice sort of grazing there happening. And then all of a sudden it goes weird. It says that the animal's resting basically for 24 hours a day. Well, that was because the collar fell off the animal and it was lying on the ground. So once we work, well, not so much we work it out, but once we went out there and found the collar in the paddock, which is easy enough to do because we can GPS to where it is, put it back on the animal and it, it starts working again. So although that kind of looks a little bit weird, it, it, it is representative of what actually happened out there. Uh, in the paddock. Uh, so the next slide. This is this is the not so great story. So you can see here, grazing is not the top activity on a daily basis. You can see in this one here, um, I think it's drinking and other category come come right up. So there's a misclassification of the behaviour occurring on this animal. We're not exactly sure why this is, but it is happening on a subset of the animals. We think it's possibly related to where the collar is sitting on the Brahmin cattle, particularly the, these guys were quite young at this stage. They're only just over a couple of hundred kilos, I think. And they got the pointy, pointy ridge and the collar wasn't sitting nicely on the ridge. It kept popping over to the side. And we think it's that orientation issue that might be affecting the accuracy of the classification. As you can imagine, if all of your measures are based on something sitting here and moving backwards and forwards this way, and we drop it here, the, the way the forces get measured shows up differently in that, in that set of numbers. So we have to work out a way to recalibrate it to, to handle that sort of issue. But because it's a consistent issue, we're, we're reasonably confident we can sort it out. We just need the, the time to go through and, and, um, and work that out. Uh, so next slide. So as I mentioned, there's GPS uh, capability in the collar. So we, this is just a map to show what, what these look like. So this is actually just for two days. So a, the day either side of when we brought the animals in and weighed them and, and looked at them because we looked, watched the animals uh, each week. And you can see how they've moved into a different paddock um, on, on the second day. If you look at it over the full time course, those paddocks go completely blue. 
and it, even with one day they're almost completely blue so you know i hear lots of stories about pasture utilization all the rest of it and, but based on the behavior of these animals there's not too much of the pasture that they don't go and have a look at um it, it is it is amazing and i guess it's it, it might be breed related but i think it's also a reflection of the pasture environment the pasture wasn't great here at this stage and i'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in a second the, the other thing we've got is one of the collars got picked up and uh, was put in the UTV there because when I got the map back, it's gone to everywhere except in the paddock. And we're like, oh, we know what your staff are up to for a week there. Do you want to know what your staff are up to out at, at, at COSP? So, uh, yeah, you've got to be careful. It's uh, with technology. It can be monitoring you even uh, when you're not so sure it's there. So next slide. So th this is the feed efficiency broken down over the, the four weeks of the trial where the, when they're in pasture. Um, so week one, week two, week three, week four, and this is the average across those 30 animals. Um, so I'm not showing individual results here. So that, as you can see, like in week one, the average light wave change was those animals put on 14 kilos. They consumed on average 145 kilos of dry matter. The minimum intake for those animals was 70. The highest was 250. That, that value I don't think is right. And I, I think we're gonna have a look at that one to make sure that that, that one is right. There, there's some that seem to be a little bit too high, but in terms of the mean, that efficiency ratio is basically 10 kilograms of dry matter taken in for a one kilo live weight gain. So that's what we measured in the first week. And this has been really useful for us as well because, so John Croker, who's probably known to many people here, who's helped us set this trial up, said to me at the start, how long do you need to measure it for, Aaron? And I'm like, John, I don't know. We've never really done it in this sort of um, scale before. And you can see the week to week variation that occurs in that efficiency metric. And it, so in the second week, we're not, I'll, I'll show another slide in a second. We think it might be weather related. It was also uh, the, a bit pasture related, but the animals started scouring in that second week. So they actually lost weight in that second week. So the, the mean was a loss of four kilos. Of course, they're still eating over that time period. So there was 141 kilos per animal on average consumed. The range is there again, but you look at the efficiency value there and, and that just blows out massively. So that second week it goes to 35 kilos of dry matter was consumed to lose a kilo. So that's a pretty big change. And that shows you that week to week variation that occurs. And then going out week three, week four, the animals start to settle down and the value starts to return to normal 27, 18.5. So, I can't hand on heart stand here and say that those values are absolutely correct. I think they're, they're pretty good. But what it shows you is the trend that's occurring. And it also show, shows you the level of variation that occurs week to week. So when we do this assessment, I think doing it over a period of time is going to be really quite important to get an accurate value. Uh, next slide. So this is just the weather for that week. And you can see that the top couple of days here are the ones that week where the animals lost weight. And it was really cold that week. It was one, a really weird week. It went from like a maximum of 18, I think early in the piece to about 37 later in the week. And there was a rain event in there. The cattle clearly didn't like it. We think the rain actually, or John tells me the rain uh, caused a bit of new growth in there, which is quite different from what the animals have been eating, which triggered the scouring event that occurred. But it just sort of shows, I guess, that you can bring data from different bits of information to get from different sources together to inform and help understand what's going on out there. Next slide. So this is something that the geneticists will be interested in, I'm sure. So, so there's like the age old thing is, is efficiency consistent? Is efficiency on pasture the same as efficiency on grain? Is efficiency of a growing animal the same as efficiency of a maternal animal? Can we just measure efficiency by measuring live weights? And to an extent, this is how it happens at the moment. So if you look at just weight gain on those animals and the top five animals, so I've just put the collar numbers in here, not animal IDs. So amazingly, all the ones came up, 31, 41, 51, 71, 38. They're the top animals, and that showed the live weight gain for those animals. If we rank them for the efficiency, so with the intake metric being included, they don't rank the same and there's different animals that appear. And so I guess hopefully the take home message is live weight isn't the, the best 
predictor of efficiency. And, and it, it's understandable, you know, uh, the, the biggest animal is potentially the greediest animal. And, and certainly in the uh, grow safe trial, th there's quite aggressive behavior that occurs. You know, there's a limited number of bunks for the animals to feed in. So you've got 60 animals coming into, I think there's six bunks there. And so, yeah, they, they bully each other out of the way. And the ones that get in there and have the, the lion's share of the feed, they're certainly the most aggressive animals, I think. So anyway, you can see the efficiency values on the side there and the ranking of the animals. And there's some animals that are the same, but not all animals. So next slide. So I just wanted to quickly acknowledge the team. As I said, there's a lot of people who sit behind the scenes that have worked on this project for a long time. And it occurs across both CSIRO and New South Wales DPI for the, for the intake measures. We've worked together for a long time in this area. Uh, next slide. And that's it. That's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Now, just for my and the crowd's benefit, your data has helped with the algorithm that they're, they're now going to use with the tag, the ear tags that are probably maybe the future of the technology because they're easy to maintain and easy to leave. You can use more of them, leave them in there. And we are using those Ceres tags in the next run of bin steers. They are going on cohorts through time. Um, we, we're putting them in some, taking them out of them, putting them back in as they go through different grazing schedules. So, so the data we're going to collect from that is highly related to what Aaron's been doing. And, and, as, I say, and as we get numbers, and remembering all these cattle are genomically tested as well. So we, we do, you know, the ultimate aim is to, is to have more information and more grazing information and and this thing is only evolving and getting bigger and better and as i say it has come become a big part of our future bin projects so so are there any other questions for for aaron as in less efficient more efficient no that, that they were the they were the best ones that we've measured so far but we've only done half the animals yeah, but, but I think the thing to keep in mind there is there was that, that week there where animals lost weight. And I think if we did it over a longer time, I think those numbers would actually come down over time. I think that the numbers are, are thrown out by the events that occurred within that month period that we, we measured. Yeah. Aaron, you're with us for the rest of the day and coming to the dinner tonight? I am. So, so yeah, so Aaron's there available for you to talk to with, in regards to any of this. And, and as I say, we do, uh, we do thank him very much. And thanks, Aaron. And we do have a small token of our appreciation for the Australian Brown, Brown reason. Thanks for traveling up here. Thank you very much. So thanks, Angus, for pinching my uh, Star Wars humor. Um, we had two choices. We had two choices today. Either I was going to wear a Stormtrooper helmet for the day, being at May the 4th, a special Star Wars day, or we were going to go and ha have a subject that involved technology and there appears to me to be nothing more like Star Wars than the machine that we've got up the back of the room here. Um, that's the evolution of drones. They've gone come a long way in the last 10 years. I know very little about them, but I'd like to. Um, so I'll just ask Rowan Shea to come up and make a presentation on behalf of... Uh, Drone Tech Solutions. Thanks, Rowan. Uh, yeah, firstly, thank you very much to Matt and the other group for having us here today. Um, yeah, so a bit of background on me. My name's Rowan. Um, yeah, I founded Drone Tech Solutions about two years ago. We started off basically trying to find a different way that we can manage the weed control on our farm. So we're up in the hills of Yalbury, they're just north of Mackay. Now, one of our biggest problems is that we did, 90% of our spraying was either in tractors or buggies. And I didn't like doing it, Dad didn't like doing it. So we had to come up with another way. We would either get covered in chemical or yeah, our rates wouldn't be right, we'd miss patches. And um, yeah, we'd go from there. So we got into drones. So where we started, we had a 16 kilo machine now today we've got 40 kilos at the back. So the technology is evolving over the two years has just changed dramatically. So next slide. Yep, so RPA sizes. So RPA is what people don't know is a remote 
piloted aircraft. So we've got our micros, that's 250 grand or less, very small, up to two kilos, small for 25 kilos. And then our medium ones that you see up the back, they go up to 150 kilos. You do go over to a larger size, but to get into that sort of category, you need to start looking at being a aircraft engineer and all that type to do the maintenance on it. Next slide. The benefits of drones in agriculture are hard to reach areas in the hilly country. So there will be a couple of videos later on to show you what, what we've done in some hilly country and, and to see how easy it is to get there. The ability to gain access to fields. So one of the things that we were lucky enough to be part of up at air with Jurgens Farming was their, cane, uh, their corn crop, their sweet corn crop. Now, how they used to irrigate their crop and get on it. Um, so they would irrigate on Monday to hope that it would dry enough on Thursday for them to get on. When we come in with the drones, we were able to, if the agronomists went on, on a Wednesday and there was um, army worm in there, we could get in there straight away. So that was one of the be benefits as well. Spotting vine and cane, so up around where we are in Mackay, there's a lot of that issue. And then, um, yeah, ability to find pests and livestock, mushrooming, weed seeking. So some of the weed seeking stuff that we are lucky enough to be involved in down in South Australia, is you know green on green green on brown so what they are actually doing is they are for the big grain grain um, tractors is they are going out and we are pre-flying these maps and then we are putting in the ai data to find where these weeds are then we put them into either the john deere or hardy tractor and as they are going across those crops those sprays will just turn on where they are so that technology is a big cost saving on chemical um so yeah and then yeah crop health so what we did with Aero Robotics and Bundaberg, we were lucky enough to be a part of them. So we'd go out and scan the macadamia and orchards, same thing, green on brown. And what we were actually being able to find in those areas were that the trees that weren't getting enough moisture, they would the, the color would change on those those trees. Our seeding and fertilizer, uh, seeding and fertilizer application, and then saving on chemical use. Next slide. So this is a bit of a map. Uh, video that we were able to do up at Matt's place. So as you can see all the lantana and that up in the background. So one of the keys here when it does finish is that we actually managed to do a bit of a thermal imaging with this machine as well. And you'll be able to actually see the sprays coming out of the machine when it catches up. So as you see just below, you can actually see where the drone is actually flying. And just below, you can see where all our droplets and everything is going on those trees. So one of the advantages that we found, and that'll just keep playing for the second, but one of the advantages we found is that, yeah, being able to get into those tight spots that usually A, people would try and do with a knapsack, the helicopter, it might not be worthwhile for the helicopter because you're just trying to do a small area. So when we were able to bring the drone in and target those areas, we could come in and we can just do a small map to highly yeah, focus on those areas. That would then make it easier and more accessible to clean up later or stick a fire through and that. So back home, if you want to get helicopters and that type of stuff in, you know, you need at least 10 to, 10 to 20 hectares, whereas these machines, you know, we can come in and do small or large little areas that make it a little bit more viable. Uh, next slide. So this is up at Kamala here where we're doing a cane paddock. You want to press play. So spotting the vine and cane. As it is going a little bit quick because I'm trying to catch up to this other drone, um, you'll be able to see there's a different spot. So it gives the farmer an actual another understanding of what we can do. We can either A, go in and spray the whole place, or B, we can go in and just target those prob problem areas. So therefore saving on less time in the air and then less time with the chemical. Next slide. I'll press play. So pest management is a big one, especially as we were talking before with pigs around feedlots and all that type of stuff. One of the things that we can do is all our thermal imaging. Now, what's going on there is when we were coming around a creek at home after we were mustering, we ended up managed to spot just a little mob of pigs that are sitting there in the trees. So in even with mustering, if you've got high high tree areas and that type of thing, you can eventually, you know, use these machines so you don't miss stock or you can find pigs 
or other other sort of uh, um, pests. Next slide. And as you can see, when you use a thermal imaging on what you can see, how much easier it is to pick pick these animals up. So as you can see, there's a good number outside Rocky. Next slide. So this is when we're talking about the corn crop. So one of the biggest things that people at the start of what we found didn't take the drones seriously is basically the coverage that you can get across all your plants. So this basically just using um, the night night vision, basically on your camera, we put some dye in. So this is this is around, around the corn that we're trying to protect from the army worm. Next slide. So how do you get your operator's accreditation? Biggest thing, one, you've got to apply for an ARN, sit your RPA course, then you can do your type endorsement. So how the process works is that if people want to say fly a 25 kilo and under, you can just go and do a normal license. If people want to get into the same category as those bigger drones, it's all type endorsed. So it'll be machine specific. Okay, And then if you want to get to the stage that you want to um, get into doing it for other people and all the rest of it, then you have to start running a re-op. So then you have your own ops library, ops manual, and then you can actually run it as a commercial business. Then you can go on the stage of getting your chemical compliance and that type of stuff. Next slide. So the services that we offer, we offer aerial spraying, seeding fertilizer. Uh, we do have some drone hire for people that already do have their license. We sell, sell the Agris T series drones. So Christmas is coming up to the grandkids. So come and talk to us. And training. Training is a big one. Now, with these machines, they aren't just get out of the box and press play. Some cases you can, but you know, you've, you've got to watch what they do. Um, one of the disadvantages is battery life. So we're all running on battery. So we'll get about 12 and a half minutes out of a battery. But in that time, if we're doing an application of 50 litres a hectare, we can get close to 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 of a hectare. We're filling every five minutes. So they're the sort of things that people just have to take into account. You just can't press start let it go out and then hope that it comes back because that's what they are. They're governed by batteries. So we're charging all the time as we're going. Um, so when we're up and running, especially that big machine at the back, we can sit between five to seven hectares an hour, depending on how far we've got to fly. Any more questions? Oh, sorry, next one. So yeah, as I said, training. If you do want to go down the road of purchasing one of these to help with your farm and all the rest of it, ask, ask for a training pack because a lot of what we find is people are very, very good at selling them, but when it comes to actually operational experience and um, how to use them is one of the biggest downfalls. They're very, very happy to sell it, but then the after sale service, and that's not very good. So to get the best out of the efficiency of the machine, please, please ask for training. All right, next question. And yeah, accidents do happen. They do fall out of the score. Any questions? Matt. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. yeah, you can. Harry from Farmer Wants a Wife. Farmer Wants a Wife. Yeah, g'day. Um, I was just interested in like how many hours do you think you get out of these machines before you get to throw them out? Uh, the biggest thing with these machines is you can change them out. So everything on that machine is you can replace. So your, your motors and um, your blades, everything. So your batteries, even your battery cycles are, are rated for, a th are they warranted, sorry, for a thousand charge cycles. So we haven't had, to, had the chance to change out motors yet. We haven't had any alarms come up. So that's the biggest thing. Everything is controlled by the computer. So yeah, you'll know when you start to get a bit of a motor fail. You know when your props are starting to get to change because you'll get a, a motor will come up with an alert because it's, it's needing more force to keep up. So that's the biggest thing. They are very, very, yeah, capable machines. Rowan, with the, the one you got out the back, um, probably important to know that it's let people know about the automation, but also the manual sides of that. Yes, yes. So the machine we've got out the back, um, now there's two, well, there's actually three different scenarios you can do it. You can fly that machine completely manual where you can turn your sprays on and off. There's another setting on there that's called M plus. So it, what we call the semi-auto. 
So what it actually does is that you will put the machine up. If you want to fly in the straight line, as soon as you press start, it will not let you, it'll let you go up and down, but it will not let you change your functions left or right. And what will actually happen as soon as you put forward power on that machine, that is when the sprays will turn on. Now your other alternative is that you can put it into a full, fully fledged plan. So how to do that is you'll set, it, set your paddocks in a waypoint, you will set your swap switch, you will set your speed, your height and your water. And then basically what you do is you press start. What you can also do is then you can put it in your obstacles if there's trees or there's areas that you want to, want to do. So they're the different things. Now with that one up the back, one of the other advantages of what you can do is you can actually get it to do an AI map. So it'll map a small section around five hectares. Then you can bring it in, it'll process that data. So if you want to say find lantana, um, suckers, rubber vine, it will actually pick them up. And then if you've, if you've missed a couple, you can actually go in and you can change it. And what'll, what'll happen is it'll generate a path and it'll only turn the sprays on when it's on that area. So if you want to spot spray those certain things at a higher rate, you, you can. So there, there's some of the advantages. Any more questions? So Rowan, with your batteries, you said you had about uh, 12 minutes life. What, yep. what, what, how long does it take to recharge them? Uh, so basically we use a, what they call it, the DGI fast charge. So it's, it's around 12 to 13 minutes to charge. But to run it efficiently, you know, I'd say five batteries and two charges. Because what actually happens over the course of the day is it gets hot and things take longer to charge. A bit like, a bit like us, when, when we get a bit hot, we slow down. Well, I definitely do anyway. So they're the sort of things that, you know, you've got to take into account. There's that, you know, people will sell a package and they'll sell it with three batteries. And then within the first hour, they're sitting there waiting on batteries. So then they're not efficient. So they're the sort of things that people have to keep in mind. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Glenn Kelly. Yes, so to change out, yeah, you can have a 70 litre um, spreader that comes in. So to basically change it, it's, yeah, it takes you about two, two minutes to change it. So then, yeah, you can go in and then you, you can set, same thing. Everything is pretty much the exact same from the, the um, seeding to the, the fertilising side. So, you know, it'll carry 50 kilos of fertiliser. No worries at all. Yep. Um, so once there, yeah, some of the stuff that we've got, even like coming up, we've got to do a heap of rehab work out at Guignol. And yeah, we're going we're gonna to use the drone for that. So it's actually 69 hectares that we're going to do. We are seeding it at 22 kilos a hectare and then we'll fertilise it at 200 kilos a hectare. So it's going to be interesting to see how they perform. From what our know, people down south that we use, you know, it should handle it, no worries at all. But it just gives everyone another option. Because yeah, everyone's always seen or thought there's got to be an easier way to do some of these things. So what what would that set you back? Uh, so just a general sort of setup. You're looking at about thirty eight. So that'll be the drone, battery, uh, three batteries, and a charger. Thank you very much. A any more questions for Alan? Good. Uh, so one of the things like we were, we were showing uh, with the thermal imaging, so I'd probably say a, a T, I say M30T it's called, right? It's a, it's a small drone, actually, one here, I'll bring it in later so if people want to have a look. So it is, best thing about it, you've got 45 minutes fly time. You've got 45 minutes up in the air. And then you can switch from your thermal imaging to a wide view to a zoom. So you can, you can just switch between different images or whatever you want to do. So if you are mustering and, you know, you get to an area that, you, you know, you may think there's some cattle in, in there, you can then put it up. If the, if the weather's right, so if it's a 40-degree day, you probably won't pick up too much. But if it's, if it's a bit cooler, um, yeah, you can fly above there and you can actually see whether it's worthwhile going into that area or not. Any more questions? No. Well, yeah, you can do it two ways. If you only got a small area, you can use that drone. If if you want to do a large a large area, so there's two types of machines that we we can use. So yeah, one is a Mavic Mavic Three multi spec, or you can go to an even bigger machine, which is an M three hundred with a with a P one camera. You still get the same flight time, but it's just the quality of cameras of what you can get. 
So then you come back, you can process that in DGI Terra, then upload that into the machine and away you go. It all depends on what, what you're actually looking for. If you want to just go out, okay, yep, I'm just going to hit all my regrowth areas. You know, if it's not a large area, use that, but if you want to map out a big area, you can do it, but the thing is you're governed by your batteries. That is the biggest thing. So you'll be moving, having to move all the time. You'll have to reset on that plan or reference plan. So basically what you can do is that you can split your plans up into smaller areas, smaller but then areas. You, know, you still have one big large plan, but you can go in right, I've hit this section, we'll move. Because that the biggest thing with these is your batteries. Any more questions? Yep. Yep. Yes. Uh, we usually try to sit two and a half to three meters above. Yep. So yeah, most things close you are to the ground, or the closer you are to the, the, the canopy, that what you what you're trying to um, exterminate, I suppose is the word, right word, or kill. Yeah, that that is better. You can do it higher. But yeah, the lower you are, the better. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. So. Yeah, thanks, Rowan. I can see a whole generation of teenagers never having to strap a knapsack to their back and spray lantana like I had to as a kid. And I'm mildly disappointed by that. But anyway, I, on behalf of ABBA, I'd really like to thank you for presenting today and yeah, food for thought. And I think you'll, you'll get plenty of discussion later on today. Yeah, on behalf of their husbands, don't talk to the ladies at this table. They can't afford a drone at the moment. Uh, and our next segment is something that I that I personally put on here because I basically know nothing about carbon. Um, so yeah, so I'm not going to flare it up. I'm just going to leave that all to uh, Rebecca and I'll just ask Rebecca Ash from AgriProof um, to come and talk to us uh, in general about carbon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Stuart, um, for having me here today and um, looking forward to giving everyone just a bit of an overview about carbon credits in general and AgriProof and, and what we do in um, soil carbon. Uh, before I get started, though, I just wanted to get a bit of a feel of the room um, to see what kind of audience we have. So can I just get a show of hands if you're a producer? Love it. <laughs> and then research. And then industry. Perfect. Okay. Good. Good to know. Um, just next slide, please. So carbon, we've all heard a lot about it recently. There's a lot of questions about it and it is a changing market. There's a lot going on. Uh, so as Angus was talking about, for example, those, those bigger companies that we're seeing, like the QSR companies, they're having, or government, um, they're having a lot of influence now of people coming along and saying, well, what are you doing about your sustainability strategy? So I guess you've got to think about, well, what impact is that going to have in my business and how am I going to meet those future needs of what I'm being asked? Next slide. So carbon credits, there's a number of ways that you can obtain carbon credits. And there's also different types of carbon credits. So in Australia, we have Australian Carbon Credit Units, ACTUs, and they're under the Emissions Reduction Fund. Um, so that's a regulated market. It's got quite stringent rules and methods that we have to follow for integrity reasons. There is also a voluntary market. So that's the kind of carbon credits that uh, private companies will, um, I guess, generate and typically coming from overseas. Um, but AgriProof, we focus on the Emissions Reduction Fund and we specifically focus on soil carbon. Uh, but there are other methodologies for getting carbon credits like vegetation methods um, and beef cattle herd management, savannah burning. Uh, we do work with Green Collar and they are um, specialists in all of the different vegetation methods. So soil carbon. Um, look, the major reason that producers are participating in these programs is for a bit of cream on top. Carbon credits aren't the reason that they're actually going to be changing practices or making ma major changes in their business. Um, the practices that they're implementing are more so for private benefits in return on investment for implementing practices such as rotational grazing or improved pastures. So, and that comes along with soil health. 
and that's what we're focused on um, when we're thinking about soil carbon with AgriProof and all of those benefits that I'm sure all of you are very well aware of in, in improving your soil, flowing onto your pasture and then flowing onto your live weight gain. So soil organic carbon potential. Um, here is a map about uh, different areas um, in Australia in that potential gain that you may get from carbon credits and it's variable. It's going to change with your management, but also with climate. And so that's something something to think about is what kind of um, rainfall band are you in? What's what kind of intensive practice are you are you doing? And what kind of practices are you doing in, in terms of intensity to gain carbon credits? So soil carbon project with AgriProof, five major steps. So number one is to register, once we speak through what's all involved and you're comfortable, we register with the Emissions Reduction Fund. Number two is we come out and baseline the property. So that involves taking one metre soil core samples, measuring zero to 30 centimetres and 30 centimetres to one metre. Now that gets your baseline, your initial soil carbon percent. After that, step three, you're looking at implementing those practices such as rotational grazing, improved pastures. So once you've been implementing those practices, we come back at least every five years, but we can come back as regularly as every year and we come back and remeasure. So that is coming back and taking those soil cores again to see where your soil carbon is sitting. Now, based on that, we move to step five in crediting. So say your baseline was 0.5% soil carbon and we've come back and measured an increase it's 0.55 percent you can gain credits for that increase so that 0.05 so it's only the increase that you're getting credited for not what you already have in the soil um, so then you can get those carbon credits and there's a number of things that you can then do with those that we have in a future slide um, so the basics of, of a project uh, within those steps is that it's 25 years. Now we can't change that. That's a requirement by the government that we have a 25 or 100 year permanence period. We work off 25 years. Uh, it's under the Emissions Reduction Fund. Um, and we're sampling that every one to five years. It's down to one metre depth. Um, and one of the, the main things that people ask is, well, what happens if my soil carbon goes backwards, which can, can happen whether it's due to drought or a change in practice um, or just, just unforeseen circumstances. Now you won't be penalized for that. You don't have to go pay back any money or anything like that. It's more based on a ratchet where you will only get credits once you go back above that previous highest level. Um, so in terms of that 25 years, the main obligation is that the land stays in agriculture. So it can't be converted in say subdivision or, or mining. Um, so additionality, there's a lot of words on this, but basically to be eligible, you have to be doing something new or materially new. So something new, it, it's a new practice or materially new could be, well, I'm trying to improve my ground cover. That's a materially new thing. By what means you're achieving that? flexible. So baseline sampling, how do we create the maps? So we essentially split your property up into different areas. Now that may, depending on the size of your property, be different project areas, then it goes down into different carbon estimation areas. Then within those carbon estimation areas, you have different strata. Now within each strata, you have three soil cores that are taken. Um, so the strata, we try and match to your paddocks and your land type size as well. So we, we create that map with input from you and also using satellite imagery to try to see where your um, different land types are. We generally try to work off about nine soil cores per 100 hectares. So subsequent sampling, so within the emissions reduction fund, it does have to be at least every five years, but we can come back as regularly as annually. So we will do an assessment 
after one year and see with you how you think the property is going and as well based on satellite imagery how it, the, the pasture production looks like it's going as an indicator and decide okay do we come back and remeasure to see if, if um, we can get a carbon credit gain. Okay. So what can you do with those carbon credits once you have them? So you can sell them using a fixed price with the emissions reduction fund option. You can sell on the spot market. So who are the people in the spot market buying? It's those different companies, um, the government and a number of, number of players. Or you can decide to hold them. You don't have to sell them. So when you hold them, you may be holding them because you think the price is going to go up and, or maybe you want to hold them until you have a low year in terms of income because it is an on-farm income. So you try balance that with the tax. Um, and then as well, you may be holding them to think, well, maybe in the future, I'm going to need them to offset emissions on my farm. Um, so that's another reason people may hold them. So what does AgriProof do? We really try and make sure we handle all of that back end for you. So there's a lot of um, flexibility in what you do on farm. That's your role. We don't come and say you need to do X, Y, Z. It's, it's, there is a commitment to changing a practice, but it is very broad. Um, and we handle then all of the back end. So there's a lot of reporting, auditing, monitoring, all the sampling. Um, that we do. And then the other big component of that with us registering with you for 25 years is that we take on that risk and we're in it together. Um, so it's a lot about that risk removal. And in terms of pricing and costs, we work off a success fee. So it's more of like a win-win lose-lose. So we gain 25% of the carbon credits, you gain 75%. And that's, I made it pretty brief, so open to questions. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Angus, could you please speak into the microphone because they can't, they can't hear the questions from, from Athen and our live, live stream. So yeah, questions please from here on, on over the microphone. Thanks, Angus. Well, you just meant my mother and her hearing aids. Um, <laughs> did you get that, Atherton? Um, what is the general cost for baseline sampling? Yeah, so it's, it's very dependent on size. Um, so under 500 hectares, it's looking at about $40 per hectare, but that can come down to um, about $15, $20 per hectare once you're getting, getting above the 500 hectares. And so sorry, that, that's a great question because baseline sampling, that's on you to cover but then all subsequent sampling costs we cover regardless of the outcome of whether you get carbon credits or not. So when speaking to landholders, that's a big question I ask. So that, that's a risk that you're laying down is that upfront cost of sampling. So worst case scenario, you never get any carbon credits over the 25 years. That, that's a risk that you're putting down. Any more questions? Brett Campbell. Uh, Rebecca, is there a there's a is there a sweet spot in terms of rainfall? Like if you're in a sub three hundred, is it sort of not worth doing? Sorry. Yeah, so sweet spot basically what the research is showing right now is you know, the more rainfall, the better. Um, sub three hundred it would be quite marginal for us to look at. And that, that's about where we would kind of cut off um, looking at a car soil carbon project anyway. Yeah. Um, at the moment, what, um, what's the pricing like for um, carbon credits? Where, where are we at? Yeah, so when I last checked, it was around the $38 mark. Um, there has, you can look up the price on a, a great website. It's just accus.com.au. Um, and there has been some fluctuations that you will see. So uh, when the government, you know, released net zero 2050 plan and everything, there was this great big spike. Everyone was trying to, I guess, get in and thinking, well, we, we need to buy carbon credits. Um, and then the government originally, when they set up the emissions reduction fund, had locked in a lot of contracts with carbon projects saying, 
we'll buy X amount of credits for you at $12. And all of a sudden the price was at 60. And um, so the government had said, well, you can exit out of these contracts with no exit fee. So then um, I guess buyers thought that, well, there's going to be a lot more carbon credits available on the market then that aren't tied up with um, the government. So then it dropped and now it's been stabilising ever since and has started to see, I guess, a bit higher rate of change with the new government coming in as well. Uh, Bevan Glasgow. Thank you. I'm, after listening to your presentation, I'm beginning to think I've been born 50 years too early. By that, I mean if you've got a property where you've been doing the right thing all the time and got your, what you imagine everything's okay, you're not going to get much of an improvement in your carbon percentage, are you? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's one of the, I guess, the way that the policy is set up, that that would be the ideal scenario, right? You just... Have, you have flo bought flogged out country and starting this project on because there's more potential and and a lot of people have been doing you know such amazing practices for you know 50 years that they won't you won't be credited for that gain you've already seen I guess the thing that we're seeing in research is that in the top zero to 30 centimeters it can plateau your soil carbon increase but that 30 centimeter to one meter layer seems to be more slowly but steadily still increasing over a longer time frame but yeah the the room i would say if you've been doing it for 50 years the room for um carbon credits will be less than somewhere that hasn't been doing it for 50 years yeah thank you getting in trouble for being a good manager once again bevan <laughs> yeah, well, I'm very particularly interested in that topic. I've, asked, I've been working with that group over the past few years, but I recently started my PhD. Um, so I'm more interested in, in how we can um, co-design and implement policy with landholders instead of uh, to hear these perspectives before rolling out a policy. Uh, do we have any more questions? You can hear me, Leanne? I'm just wondering if you've done any research on, on the changes in soil carbon on areas that have been affected by dieback. Really interesting question. So we do have a couple properties that have been baselined that have dieback areas, but haven't yet reached the subsequent sampling round. So, so no data to, to see. I did see um, another project um, that had sampling on dieback. And um, I think that they had still seen an increase, but not as much as other areas. Don't quote me on that. Um, we're still waiting for data on that property to come out. Any more questions for Rebecca? We, we do have a bit of time up our sleeve. Um, so, so yeah, feel there free. Are, mm, Sorry. Okay. There are info packs at the, um, flyers at the back if you'd like to grab one of them and there's a QR code on there that will link you to an information pack which has got a lot of really useful information just about carbon in general and agri-food. Angus. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, minimum property size that you want to start a pro project on and secondly if let's say you were 12 years halfway through a program you sold your property uh, are the new owners inclined to take that project up? Great question. So minimum size, 40 hectares. Um, I imagine if you're running Brahman, most of you will have more than 40 hectares. Um, and then in terms of selling property, so uh, you can sell the property and that's the advantage you have in working with someone like AgriProof. That's what we call the project proponent when you register a project and you're the landholder. So the project proponent has to stay on the project. So that's fine because we can manage it. New owners, two main obligations. One stays in agriculture. Type of agricultural use and management can change. Stays, but it has to stay in ag. Two is that um, the new owners, while they don't have to actively participate in the project, 
they do have to agree for us to come on at least every five years to conduct sampling at no cost um, to keep the project alive, essentially. Uh, are the, sorry, are the, are the new owners viable for, uh, liable for any cost that they may incur if that, if that carbon number changes to mm. the negative? Yeah, so under the, under the program where there's that ratchet system, even if it does go um, negative, they won't be, be liable for that. The main thing in that is that they haven't been negligent. So they haven't set the whole property alight or, or something that the government could deem as ne negligent. I imagine if it got to that stage, there would probably be a legal process in the contract of outlining things in fine detail if they were to take on the prop property and the project, but not actually want to actively continue in the project. So, um, Rebecca, thank you. Um, and, uh, I'm going to give up now some of the stuff that I was going to talk about when I'm on my panel ses situ session later on, but I couldn't leave the, the Bevan thing alone. So, um, I noticed in there the, you know, the whole uh, point about human-induced regeneration. So, um, I'm going to show a video later on. So we, we've done a carbon accounting under the MLA baseline one and um, unfortunately my wife's not real happy with me about it because we've got 57% remnant, we've got uh, regrowing Brigalow and um, we got zero for the, for the, um, for the um, timber and that's, that's on our property. So the only way currently that you can um, get credits for that is for planting trees because they can actually, when they satellite map them, if you plant trees, you generally um, plant them in straight lines. So that's the only way they can do it. And I did say you were interested in looking at things going forward. So my question is, where do you think the uh, unintended consequences of that is going to go? Because I talked to a fellow recently that's dealing with a fella that's got 35,000 acres of country that's not real productive country, but it's got a lot of timber on it. And the only way that fellow can see in the future making money out of that is to knock the lot down. So here we are as an industry facing all the other challenges that we have, and you've got uh, you know someone that's faced like that. So that's my, my question is, is what do you see of all of this stuff with the unintended, unintended consequences that will go on? Because everyone knows what happened when they brought the vegetation laws in. Everyone ran around and cleared a lot of country that they ne wouldn't necessarily have done, which just showed up on all our mapping. Thank you. Thank you, and great question. Wish I had a, a little magic ball to have all the answers. Um, so I can't, I can't give you, you know, a future outlook of what it will look like based on what's happening now. What I can say is that there's things in place that they're trying, that they have thought about that. For example, you can't participate in a project in a soil carbon project anyway, I, I'm not um, completely across the vegetation side of things. Um, if you've cleared that area uh, in the past seven years, because they're trying to think, well, what if everyone then goes, well, I can make a lot of money off improved pasture. So um, I'm gonna clear the lot and um, sow it with the multi-species pastures. And then it has that unintended cons consequence of, of clearing everything. Um, so that there are, so I guess, measurements in place to think about those unintended con consequences. What, what the unintended consequences will be, I guess we'll have to, to touch base in 10 years. <laughs> Sorry, just out of curiosity, how many um, soil carbon projects are actually registered like in Queensland at the moment? Yeah, um, I'd have to get the numbers up uh, on Queensland exactly. Um, but we have at least 400 registered and we have a, in Australia and we have about 80% of projects, soil carbon projects in Australia. Um, Queensland, yeah, I would have to really pull up the numbers, but to take a stab in the dark from our perspective, I would say about 40. Yeah. Yeah, there are two horticulture properties in there from, from my knowledge, yeah.
just a little bit from left field, but I come from an area where uh, people and big companies are planting macadamia trees by the absolute millions. And I just wonder, there, there must be some carbon credit benefit in that, although it's, it's a lot of it is farmland they're taking over, if they're planting tr uh, trees in that number, there's obvious benefits, benefits there if I'm thinking right, is that correct? Mm, so from my understanding, if they're planting say macadamias, avocados, they're not actually eligible for one of the emissions reduction fund vegetation projects because um, if you're doing that, it has to sort of try and uh, exemplify a more native vegetation um, set up. The only way that, you know, I'd see them participating is through soil carbon. So that above ground carbon that they'd be generating through the trees, which they would be, um, wouldn't really be recognised as it stands under those methodologies. Yeah, thank you. And I say, and with no criticism to Rebecca, we did have a bit of time up her sleeve because we did have Liam McFarlane that was speaking as well and he wasn't able to make it. He's loading a plane full of cows to go to Indonesia or something in Brisbane and it didn't counteract with his flights to come up here. So, so yeah, by all means, uh, and thank you, Rebecca, for, for your presentation. Thank you for fielding those questions. We always, uh, sometimes we worry when we give Hilly a microphone. Uh, well, always we worry when we give Hilly a microphone. But, um, but anyway, on behalf of the AWBA, I'd really like to thank you for coming today. Uh, that's a token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming back after dinner and sitting down. Um, we, we'll just have a short interlude. Um, we started it last year and they, they tell me you've only got to do things try twice for them to become a tradition. We like to do a focus on a on a commercial producer um, at our conferences now, just to bring it to light, as well as gathering information for ourselves. We're probably not doing this as any kind of wank factor. Um, this is just exhibiting that there are good producers out there doing a great job with Brahmin cattle. So if we could play the video now. And thanks to John Borg for your contribution. Harry Brand Grazing is a central Queensland grazing operation run by John and Julie Borg, sons Steve and Tim, and managers Murray and Raylene Williamson. The Borg family have had a strong association with Brahmin cattle. Dad bought his first Brahmin bull in the mid 60s. He was a, uh, a three quarter black Brahmin bull with horns. And to say his uh, temperament wasn't very good was uh, Yes, that was to say the least. The Brahman breed has certainly improved a lot since then. And now their temperament's as good as any other cattle you could find. We, uh, we moved home in 1975, where I live now at Nebo, which is 50,000 acres of breeder country. Consists of scrub, uh, black soil downs, box bridges, uh, and some slightly higher country where we breed you know, approximately 1,500, 1,800 calves a year. They are, uh, all the steers are brought down here from Wieners, steers and McCull heifers, and are finished at Rolston, which is uh, uh, 35,000 acres of good pull scrub where we finish our cattle off and send to the works. With a turnoff of two and four tooth steers, weighing 320 to 340 kilograms dressed, and two and four tooth fat heifers, weighing 260 to 300 kilograms dressed, a chance meeting at the races with one of the organic industry's pioneers had the Borg family considering the increased profitability of an organic operation. Our start into organics come about uh, on a trip to the Strabroker in Brisbane, having a drink with a fellow called Richard Raines, who was involved in the uh, organic, uh, was an organic meat company at the time. And talking about how we operate and what we do with Brahm and cattle, uh, with not dipping uh, and so forth, minimal uh, pesticides, uh, whatever. He said, we should have a go at organics because uh, we we're probably three quarters of the way there. So that was in 2011 and it took us 12 months to make up our mind. Uh, we didn't make the decision lightly. 
since 2012, uh, we started our pre-cert. So uh, that's when we started. And the Brahmin breed, you know, they're you're three quarters of the way there because of uh, they're such easy cattle to look after. They're, you know, you need less, less inputs to produce a bullock. They will forage in dry times. They'll finish easily. They're easy cattle to handle. Even with the enhanced profitability of the organic market, prices received are still predominantly driven by industry supply and demand. The only true way to manage your own viability on a year-to-year -year basis is to control and minimise your own input costs. Labour costs are a huge problem in the central Queensland coal basin. Staff are expensive and hard to find. Harry Brandt Grazing's well-bred Brahmin cattle help with the solution. There's 35,000 acres here in two blocks, which is uh, Starley and Maydowns. And uh, Murray and Raylene Williamson have been with us now for eight years. And Murray and Raylene can manage us by themselves uh, just incredibly well. They're very good cattle people. You can see by the cattle around me, what the cattle are like, their temperament is spotless. They can go out and muster any paddock here two or three hundred cattle by themselves and work those cattle easily. So, you know, the Brahman breed again, work properly, a very easy cattle to get along with. Historically, it was thought that only far western supplies would be viable for the organic market, coastal tick and fly burden being too hard to manage for organic production. Correctly bred and managed Brahman genetics, however, have opened far more areas to the possibility of an organic turnoff, and it's better for the environment. Organics do come at a cost. All your, you know, your, your licks, your dry licks, your blocks, uh, your wiener hay, uh, and there is a, uh, a fly uh, bag we can use. But everything with organics costs twice as much as your conventional. But there still is a premium uh, with the organics. And with your Brahmin cattle, you know, you use less of those inputs to get there. I find that with organics, we have a, a very healthy dung beetle population because uh, we're not using chemicals. I think since we've been organic, our uh, dung beetle population has increased. And I think we've got uh, less flies than what we've ever had just because of that reason. So for us, uh, the organics has been profitable and uh, we'll continue to doing so. With definite cost benefits in regards to most input costs, the one area that cannot be skimped on is the need to consistently invest in good genetics. The team from Harry Brand can be seen in the bull selling season, attending and buying quality bulls from numerous Central Queensland society and single vendor bull sales. Uh, we go to uh, uh, most of the Brahman sales around Rocky and some uh, on property sales. Uh, that's where we get our replacement size. Uh, we keep some of our own bulls so we're always looking for those better bulls to improve our uh, female side of things and breed bulls for our own use when we are looking for bulls we look for meaty bulls that we think that are gonna finish earlier and but also meet the weight that we want to get to our 320 340 kilos dressed at two or four teeth They've got to have uh, good sheets. They've got to be structurally very sound in their legs. They've got to be able to walk. So good legs are very, very important. Uh, confirmation, that all adds to being a good confirmation bull. I like a bull with a hooded eye because uh, most hooded eye bulls have got a very good natural temperament about them. And also they've got a good sorry head, which I think rose to their fertility. We looked at uh, the fertility side of it on the percentage of, of the mythology and, and uh, that sort of thing. But we also uh, semen test all our bulls before they go out to the herd, which is normally six to eight weeks after we purchase the bull. With constantly increasing production costs and soaring grazing land values, it's hard to make the return on investment look good in modern times. Harry Brandt Grazing's diligence in keeping input costs down and the ability to still command an industry-leading premium for their product 
is a great example for us all. Brahman genetics play a large role in the success and viability of their operation. Brahmins helped make the transition to organics seamless. So to sign off on a quote from John Ball, Brahmin cattle have been very good to our family for nearly 60 years. I can't see myself changing anytime soon. Thanks John Borg and the Harry Brand team for an example of beef industry leading success utilising quality Brahmin genetics. There you go, Borgie. <laughs> uh, very, John was very nervous about that whole thing and I, I personally think he came across hugely well and, and we didn't script that bullock in the in the first bit to walk up behind him and sniff him. Yeah, that's that's John's cattle and he should it's something he should be proud of. Um yeah, we bring on it. This is probably the section that I uh of the conference that I thought was going to be of the most uh value to everybody. Um I fear sometimes that in this industry we we struggle to find a delineation between um, bull sellers and bull producers being those that are just interested in selling bulls and those that sell bulls that improve people's cattle. So we formed today for you a, a, a panel of, of industry leaders uh, representing customers and, and they're going to present their opinion on what they think you as a seed stock producer should be doing to improve the perception of Brahmin cattle um, and, and give you their views. Um, yeah, we bring on it, this is probably the section that I, uh, of the conference that I thought was going to be of the most uh, value to everybody. Um, I fear sometimes that in this industry we, we struggle to find a delineation between um, bull sellers and bull producers being those that are just interested in selling bulls and those that sell bulls that improve people's cattle. So we formed today for you a, a, a panel of, of industry leaders uh, representing customers and, and they're going to present their opinion on what they think you as a seed stock producer should be doing to improve the perception of Brahmin cattle um, and, and give you their views. And as I say, this is, this is coming from the customer. There's not a lot, a lot of other breeds that probably are game to do this. We've stepped forward with it and trying to do it. So, so yeah, I just forgot my clipboard. So we've got Central Queensland industry icon, David Hill, leading the charge, and he's going to facilitate this because I thought by the time we got to this stage, everyone would be sick of listening to me. Um, David needs no introduction to this group. Um, he's part of our carcass comp dinner that we have here every, uh, every year, and he and I have both been on that committee since it started. We're probably the only two left that were there when it started, David. And we've had a few blues. We've got Dr Alex Ball hooking up by Zoom. We've got Brett Campbell, who you've already heard from today. Peter, Peter Quinn, a well-known Central Queensland grazier um, with operations both in Central Queensland and the North, if you can move up as I um, call out your name. Troy Setter, uh, thank you very much for coming. Troy, CEO and Director of Consolidated Pastoral Company, one of the biggest pastoral companies in the North and a lot of experience in Brahman cattle. And Nick Mira from from uh, Thomas Bothwicks and Sons, or NH Foods, as they call themselves now, but they've always been Bothwicks to me. Um, but they do kill a grass-fed product and they do kill a lot of Brahmin cattle. So I'm going to hand across to, uh, to Hilly now, and he's going to take the microphone and these people will introduce themselves. And, and, and as I say, uh, this will open up into open discussion uh, between you people, the suppliers, and, and those that are behind me that are the customers. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew, and um, thanks to Reed and the council for um, allowing us to have the opportunity for the, to do this today. And I've obviously got to thank Brett McCamley. He's the one that um, got me into this and a lot of other people that are, are Brahmin breeders that I talk to regularly. And I'm a bit older now, but I used to turn, I loved Brahmin Week. Um, I can remember Stretch and I um, had a few late nights. We were 
I should say, early mornings. But, um, you know, and I've always had an appreciation and as someone, so Matthew described, I don't think, but I'm an icon. My uh, son asked me one day whether he thought, well, whether I thought I was famous. So I said I thought I was more infamous than um, famous, but um, I have some good um, company in that regard. So I uh, just, it was interesting for um, Borgie when he um, mentioned uh, you know, the conversation with Richard Rain. So I've been, um, you know, with my thing is the a beef representative person. So I've been doing this for 10 years now. And um, one of the most impressive people I've met in the times is actually Richard Rains. And his is a fabulous story. And um, for somewhere that, you know, he's got to in our industry and, you know, he's still such a humble individual and he's a very, very great person to get to know. So, um, and um, when we talk, first talked about this, Brett mentioned the Barron River crew and, I actually put my hand up to go and facilitate this from up there. I don't know how coherent I would have been by now, but I would have been a, a lot less nervous than what I am now. But um, so for me, um, the, we're talking about the perception piece and a lot of you probably know Peter Hall. So I've had a lot of, lot of time for, with Peter and um, he gets the first say and the last say and I want to, have the opportunity to finish off. So I'm not gonna to say too much at this point in time, but um, you know, people have the perception that this will be about um, MSA. So um, before I got involved in industry, I um, went to an MSA um, um, forum type thing at Beef 2006 and asked the question of why if 75% um, of Brahman cattle met, met MSA specs that you were um, throwing 100% of them out. So um, I've had a frustration for a fair amount of time, not as um, long as what you people obviously would have had, but um, you know, if we're talking about science and I think well, science should be the science and um, this is where the perception piece comes in. I'm not a fan of uh, perception or assumption. So for me, that's we've always got to be um, you know, for us to invest in what, what people are trying to lead us to, it's got to have some credibility around it. So that's been, um, you know, a long-term one for me. We've listened to the opportunities for about um, the UK market. So um, Steve mentioned that. So, so for some numbers, um, in um, 1972, Australia sent 270,000 tonnes of beef to the UK. It was our largest market at that time. He's mentioned now that, um, you know, it'll be start off at 35,000, but um, last year, 800 tonnes of beef went out of Australia into that, uh, what, what is currently called the Hilton quota. So, you know, it was 7,500 tonnes. They've split it. So, you know, we utilised one time we used to overutilize that, now it's at 800 tonnes. And it's because there's, the producers have walked away from UCAS basically, and a lot of Southern producers have gone into those um, brands and that. So I think there's a massive opportunity for Northern Australia and especially, you know, Brahman breeders in that market. So, if, you know, Steve mentioned it'll be 110,000. Well, you know, the UK is less self-sufficient in beef production now than what they were in 1972. So I think the, the opportunities are massive. So, and um, Brett shied away from the biosecurity piece. Well, I won't, I'm now the um, chair of the Cattle Australia LSD FMD working group. And I didn't know what LSD was until I seen it on, the, on Beef Central. So I don't know if I had a pretty steep learning curve, but um, I do know the risks to our industry and especially in the in the processing space. If we shut down this industry for any point of time, like Matthew said, those workers, well, they won't be just driving cabs and Ubers, they'll be driving trucks on wind, renewable energy projects or in the mines. So we've always got to be mindful. And the other one I'll touch on is with the carbon space and everything is the natural capital piece. So I was inv involved in the environmental credentials project was about telling our story. And I got on the tree grass balance one, which I didn't really want to, but um, 
what came out of that was originally proposed to be a um, biosecurity stewardship program. So that was under the uh, previous government. That's now come as what we see now as the um, nature repair bill. So, um, you know, something that we thought for Bevan, by, you know, what we wanted under the um, biodiversity stewardship was recognition of prior good stewardship and a positive story around what people have been doing for generations. So I don't know, but it's going to be a pretty hard sell to get us to sign up to something that starts off with calling itself nature repair because, you know, ruminants have been doing that for, for a very long time. Mother Nature put them on this earth for some, some a reason. So, and um, I'll mention this. I, was, I said I was going to finish, but the other thing I'd encourage uh, anyone that's in the room it's a CQ carcass comp, but uh, the AWBA has actually put $1,000 up for the Mackay show for the pen of, um, in the in the Borthwick's pass for the highest scoring um, pen of Brahmin cattle. So, um, which I, I thank Reed for, for prosecuting that. It's, um, and, and Nick will talk more about uh, how important um, Brahmins are to us, obviously that, um, premium grass-fed brand, so probably enough for me, but um, yeah, once again, thank you everyone, and hopefully I'm trying to articulate the opportunities in all of this, and um, there are challenges, as, as we all know, but um, I will finish off on what I think about perception later on, so thank you, and I'll hand over to who's going next. Alex, do you want Alex to go? Yep, cheers. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I think you can. Hilly, is there a presentation that I can throw up quickly? Or can someone allow me to share a screen? So the, um... How are you going with that, Adam? Can we, can we share? Beautiful. There you go, mate. And um, you just ask Adam and he'll um, click it for you when you want to change. All right. So um, thank you, everybody. Apologies that I'm not up there. Um, I did originally say to David that I would be able to make it and then had a clash with managing the National Biocontrol of Weeds Program, of which I facilitate, and that's tomorrow. So I couldn't get back. So my background is I know a little bit about the beef industry, a little bit about genetics, a little bit about eating quality and not much about everything else. So what I wanted to do today is give you a very quick introduction to some key components around the competitiveness of the Brahmin industry. And I've titled it, Shoot the Messenger, Not the Message. And um, as I live in Armidale, and as, I, as it is currently eight degrees here in Armidale, I'm fairly certain that no Queensland is gonna come down here for at least six months. So I'm going to be pretty brave and be able to give some fairly solid messages. I can go to the next slide. Thanks, Adam. So I just wanted to, to really focus on some of the work that uh, Dave has just mentioned and just really reinforce the fact that the beef industry that we're in at the moment is changing quite dramatically. And, and that change is being driven by the beat of the consumer's drum. And particularly with regards to how we market our beef and how we sell our beef, both domestically and internationally, and I know Troy and other people have more commentary on this later on, but definitely the consumer and the community is starting to ask real questions about the brand of beef and particularly around quality, sustainability and welfare. So beef production is being really driven by these branded products and more and more production of beef has to be locked into brand position. So in that sense, we're going to see a lot of beef producers and, and in this case, the Northern beef producers you're going to have to just simply make much more informed decisions. You're going to have to become land managers rather than just producers. If you're not already a technology addict, you need to be because there's emerging technologies that's going to allow you to look at this sustainability and welfare challenge much more succinctly than what we've done in the past. There's going to be a whole focus on compliance across the supply chain, particularly around the credentials for welfare and sustainability. And all of that is going to challenge the traditions of breeding and production. So next slide, Adam. 
So what's lying ahead for, for breed groups such as the Brahmin group, so ABA or others, we're seeing consumer preferences starting to change the balance of traits. So eating quality, welfare, sustainability are coming into those traits that we select. There's this evolving disruptive technologies, and that's going to be interesting, particularly for the northern beef industry, as more and more information starts to come in about how we manage our land and how we manage our beef production systems and how that technology is actually going to become more automated, we're going to have to produce beef that is actually going to be under more scrutiny, both from the consumer and the, and the community than ever before. So how Brahmins adapt to that scrutiny is going to be vitally important for the competitive of the industry. The other thing that's emerging is that there is no place that you can hide in the value chain. So traditionally, there used to be a, a position across the value chain where there was information that had blockages or there was information that stalled. Nowadays, with blockchain and bioinformatics and a whole range of new technologies, power of information transfers through the value chain very quickly. So if you've got Brahmin animals that don't meet the aspirations of the modern market or the future market, the information system will soon find you out. And that's going to be quite important for all breeders in the audience. And the value chain starting to get uh, a lot more sophisticated in that area. And the area that's coming back now is what, what is the contribution of the bull breeder? What does the bull breeder actually do when they sell bulls to Brahmin breeders and commercial breeders? They're selling genetics that enables those breeders to produce a product that's marketable in a modern market with all of the attributes the consumer requires. So if you're not meeting the aspirations of quality, sustainability and welfare as a bull breeder, then you need to have a really good look at your bull breeding program. Next slide, Adam. So a little bit about cattle of the future. So, you know, there's a lot, been a lot of focus on, on bulls and, and you heard that recently. I think the focus kind of shift more towards genes and particularly the genes that cattle carry. So breed is going to become less a description of potential and more about the brand position. So you see in the beef markets at the moment, a lot of your competitors, say Wagyu or Angus or Shorthorn or whatever it may well be, all have brand positions in the marketplace. So they all have a branded product that sits in the marketplace. The Brahmin is really under threat from that because at the moment, there's no real Brahmin position in that brand marketplace. And you'll have to start to think about as an industry, how do we get that brand position? And what is our brand position when we put that forward? Much more focus on, on genomics. And at the moment, with genomics coming in, you can actually pick up the potential of any individual along the supply chain. So companies like Neogen and Zoetis and others are starting to produce genomics products marketable for the Boss Indicus industry that allows you to benchmark both heifers and steers going either into feedlots or into the breeding herd. Much more focus on non-compliance. So simply put, if you're producing animals and your market point is say a two-tooth animal at 320 kilos, and that two-tooth animal has got to be delivering X percentage of yield. It's got to be sitting between five and 15 uh, mils of rib fat. It's got to be sitting between five and 20 mils of PA fat. If you're not delivering that product through the marketplace, expect the marketplace to start to punish you heav heavily. That's what's happening. So it's not so much about the premium that you can attract. It's about minimizing that non-compliance. Much more focus on cattle for brands rather than cattle for markets. I've already touched on that. And as a Brahmin breeder, and I know people will have their views on the MSA index, and I'm not here to defend the process or anything like that. But if you don't uh, meet the MSA index at 57 and above, then ask why not. Next slide. Thanks, Adam. So the challenge for the Brahmin breeder is literally you have to do everything right. So other breeds have the luxury that they can, you know, they can just focus on marbling or they can focus on growth or they can focus on fertility. Brahman breeders, because of the position in the marketplace, you have to get everything right. You have to get maternal capacity right. You have to get growth rate and efficiency right. And hopefully you heard a little bit about efficiency this morning. Your carcass value has to be right because you're producing a lot of, of uh, purebred Brahmins into the marketplace. And then all of that genetics has to be wrapped up into structurally successful animals that go into a hostile environment to serve cows. And they have to have good feet, good scrotal circumference and good sheep. So all of that's in place. So 
if you're not thinking about the Brahmin as literally a multi-purpose animal with a multifaceted genetic potential and opportunity, then you're getting it wrong. So just simply focusing on growth rate or simply focusing on other traits without that real spectrum of activity is going to be the, to the detriment of the future Brahmin industry. Next slide, thanks, Adam. So I just wanted to, to point out the fact that despite um, where people sit and people can sit anywhere from not using uh, breed plan to using breed plan very heavily, there's a full spectrum of people that sit in that area. But if you don't understand the variation that you have, then you'll never use it. So things like birth weight, and I, I just pulled out the top 10% versus the bottom 10% uh, or the worst 10%. Uh, and looked at that difference because that's the effective range you've got. So there's over five kilos of birth weight. There's over 19 kilos of 200 day weight. More importantly, there's over 53 kilos in mature cow weight. So that's important for the Brahmin breeder to look at. Days to calving, nearly, nearly 22 days. Carcass weight, over 20 kilos. So on, on modern markets, that's equivalent to about $100 difference between the best and the worst. And then you've got your differences in eye muscle area and rib fat and marbling. So all of those traits, you can make change. So the Brahmin, it's not as though the Brahmin doesn't have the opportunity to change the focus of its breeding program very quickly. It can because you've got that variation there. So next slide, thanks Adam. I just wanted to reinforce what may have uh, David may have said or other people may have said. So why is growth going to be still king? And growth is king for one reason. So this is for a northern breeding system um, where you're turning off steers and you're going from 300 days or 300 kilos through to 400 kilos uh, live weight prior to going into a feedlot. So if you're growing those animals at 0.8 kilograms a day, then on average, that's taking you 125 days. You're using around 44,000 kilograms of feed for maintenance. Now, that's a big number of kilos of feed just going into those animals just to maintain themselves. Then if you want to look at it compared to 1.2 kilos a day, they're at 84 days between 300 and 400 kilos, 29,784 kilos. So nearly a difference of 48% or 14,000 kilograms difference in feed intake simply in the sustainability of that, of that animal between three and 400 kilos. Why is that important? Because the world beef industry is looking at sustainability and efficiency as the metrics of performance of the future. So if you've got an animal that's 34% growth to maintenance versus an animal at 23% growth to maintenance, you've got a very, very successful animal in the, in the marketplace. So. That's why growth will remain king. Next slide, Adam. But that comes at a cost. And this is the big fallacy that's emerging in the industry at the moment, that we are just simply moving mature cow weight up as we select for growth. So the key thing is you can select for growth, but you don't have to change mature cow weight. And I just wanted to point out a, a, quite a detailed slide I've estimated the, the feed intake for a 400 kilo cow right the way through to an 800 kilo cow and the megajoules of energy. And then quickly uh, looked at a, a northern pasture at eight megajoules of energy uh, per kilogram of dry matter. So the average for a 400 kilo cow is consuming seven kilos an 800 kilo cow is, is consuming 11 kilos just for maintenance. So if you look at a year, it's around 25,000 uh, versus, sorry, 2,500 versus 4,200. If you look at a lifetime, so that is eight working uh, years of a cow's lifetime, you're looking at 20,000 versus 34,000. And if you want to multiply that by the average cost of feed is about 2,600 versus 4,400. What people say to me when I talk to them about mature cow size, I said, yes, but we always get the salvage value back. But in this case, 400, the 400 kilo difference is $1,000 versus 1,336 minimum in feed just to feed that cow. Throw in the cost associated with the calf and, and pregnancy on top of that, and you're paying a lot more. So this belief that you get mature cow size value back in in the uh if you like in the salvage value after 10 years is just wrong you've already paid far too much for that cow so 
optimally, you sit, should be sitting around that five to 600 kilos. So that's a challenge for the Brahmin industry to start to work out. The next one, thanks, Adam. The other area that Hilly wanted me to touch on is this big debate, and I've seen it um, in Beef Central and others, this trade-off between yield and eating quality. So the key thing that everybody needs to understand is there is a negative correlation between retail beef yield or saleable beef yield and any eating quality measurement. Primarily, that's due to lower fat driving down IMF, but you can find curve benders. So in most production systems, we're starting to really challenge that, that nexus of how much value do we get out of eating quality versus how much value do we get out of maintaining or improving yield. So for most brands, eating quality is important, cows excluded. And the exception is the live export, which is all about reproduction weight. And I just wanted to show you some data that I did last week. Next slide, thanks, Adam. So I pulled out from a supply chain, a northern beef supply chain that is a grass-fed beef supply chain. And we looked at 180 odd thousand animals over the last three years. And we looked at predictions of yield, just using a simple yield equation versus predictions of quality using the MSA index. So 300 kilo carcass, an extra two and a half percent yield. So that's the difference between uh, the top 25% and the average. Works out about seven and a half kilos. At $6.50, which is a, a pretty close to the current wholesale rate for that type of article, you're looking at about $48.50 for a yield-driven brand. So every steer that hits that uh, extra or hits that top 25% in yield is worth $48. We contrasted that with the top 25% quality. So in this case, the supply chain said that quality was worth about 40 cents a kilogram. So if you looked at that top 25% versus uh, average, that quality difference was $120. So there's nearly three times as much variation in value from quality as there is for yield, even in a northern production system. The important part is you put those two together and you're talking about 168 to, uh, well, uh, close to $170 increased value in a 300 kilo animal. You're all big producers, so you can do the maths on how, how much that is worth to each of your own breeding programs. Next one, thanks, Adam. Didn't really want to uh, pinpoint much on the impacts of the MSA index. I think, Adam, you'll just flick through that. There'll be little red circles that come up, hopefully. So just next slide. Yeah, they'll, they'll just flick through. So just wanted to point out there are large impacts on a whole range of traits. Uh, from HGP status through the sale yard, through the MSA marbling, and they all have huge impacts on, on the trace, and they're all worth about five to six points when you look at them. The critical thing is each of those are very similar to the value of the boss indicates. Now, again, I'm not going to debate with anybody about whether that they've got it right or they've got it wrong. This is a system that Australia has adopted. This is the system that's in place with most of the major brand owners across Australia. And this is a system that you get your cattle graded on. So that system said there's a difference between boss indicus at 0% and boss indicus 100% at about six points. So that's important for Brahmin breeders to recognize. You've got to work on the other levers of ossification, marbling and, and other traits to pick up that six points. So if you're not working harder than anybody else, you're going to be at, at the detriment of, of the industry. And that's just a, a, a given position at the moment. Next one, thanks, Adam. We'll just flip through. So the other thing I, I wanted to do is just start to have a look at the benchmarks. And one of the, the really good benchmarks that sits in the world uh, at the moment is the USDA mark data. And they've got a very impressive scheme where they compare all of the breeds or most of the breeds across the US industry. And they look at sire means and also the predictability of the breeding values. So you can compare and look at crossbred breeding values. The mark data, which just has been released in 2023, highlights some interesting challenges for the Brahmin industry. The first one is your birth weight. So everybody at the moment is starting to ask questions about the Brahmin and what can you do about birth weight? So as growth's been selected for, the Brahmin now sits at, at the top end of birth weights for most of the major breeds across the world. 
So that's a challenge for you because breeders producing heifers starting to try and join heifers at two, to carve down at two-year-olds, birth weight and calving ease becomes real, a real issue. You've got some advantages because of that high birth weight in the weaning weight, but by the time you get out to 400 to 600 day weights, that advantage is gone. The challenge is that you've also got this marble score. So Brahmins have the lowest marble score of all of those particular breeds. So, and in this case, a four is equivalent uh, to their select program in the US and a, um, a five is at the top end of, the, of their select and the six is into their early choice. So you're starting to see breeds separating on marbling. There's not so much of a difference in ribeye, not so much as a difference in fat, but you're giving away nearly 30 kilos in carcass weight compared to some of the other breeds. And that is a real problem. So the challenge for the Brahmin industry is You've got to increase your growth. You've got to maintain mature cow size. You've got to change the birth weight and you've got to increase your marbling. And they're the, the critical levers that you can drive. So next slide, thanks, Adam. So my Northern wish list, um, and I did this for a group of Brahmin breeders in the recent thing is, you've just got to simply look at these traits. So calving ease and moderate birth weight. Dead calves and heifers make no money. So if you've got clients, if your bull breeders and your clients are moving towards joining as two-year-olds or your clients are, are definitely focused on heifer fertility and those type of things, making sure that they get a live calf on the ground is your primary responsibility. Because if you lose a heifer, you're not just losing the heifer in the one year, you're losing that heifer's potential for the next eight to 10 years as well. So putting that value in, that's around about $3,000 per heifer lost potential if that heifer dies at calving. Days to calving, they've got to fit into a, a program so you can work on that. I've got this big concern about focusing on 600 day weight because it just uh, drives your profitability or drives mature cow weight. So start focusing on those early growth wins, start focusing on the 400 day weight because that has a bigger impact on ossification and it doesn't put as much pressure on mature cow size. Big levers around positive fat and muscle and marbling. And you know, I hope I don't offend anybody in the audience, but I hope I do as well. If you don't have marbling, then accept that you produce manufacturing beef. Right? So the Brahmin industry has to start to think about the fact that there are consumers who are demanding more and more taste and, and eating quality aspirations from the product that they eat. And you can see the challenges coming in from, from other areas. If you don't have a beef product that is higher in eating quality, then at some point in time, we're going to be right smack bang in that commodity position. Next slide. So all of that is, is useless unless your bull breeder is measuring them or uh, either directly or through genomics. And this is my other plea for the Brahmin industry in terms of its, of its competitiveness. You can ask and question all you like about genetics. You can ask and question all you like about genomics. But if you don't use either of them, and if you don't uh, take on the challenge of understanding how genomics is changing the world beef industry, but not only the world beef industry, it is changing every livestock and uh, plant producing industry across the world is now using genomics. So it is a technology that you have to get your head around. Next slide, thanks Adam. And if you're not using genetics and genomics, that slide's pretty self-explanatory, right? It is a technology that is there for the Brahmin industry to make the best out of. It's a technology that enables you to start to become extremely competitive in, in a very competitive market of the future. Final slide, thanks, Adam. So what are the benchmarks? So if you're sitting here and saying, well, what can I really do? So the first thing is, have you got enough growth? Are you doing enough with the feed on offer that you've got in your paddocks to maximize that potential? So if you're growing animals at 600 grams a day, you've got a challenge. If you're growing animals at 800 uh, grams a day, you've got some opportunity. If you're up at one to one and a half kilos a day, it's great. And if you're above one and a half kilos a day, you're right smack bang in, in where optimum production occurs. Is birth weight an issue? Are your clients starting to ask questions about uh, calving ease? Are they joining their heifers to other breeds to get their heifers alive at, at, at their first calving? If that is the case, then you've got to do something about that. 
DNA where you rank with eating quality. So everybody's got the opportunity to do MSA, but they've also got the opportunity to look at Osmeat traits as well and just understand where you rank with that. Do you know where you rank with yield? So yield's an important one. Don't chase yield if that reduces your fat and makes you too lean, because that is to the detriment of the whole industry. So balance that up. And the final one is, do you know about your sustainability and welfare goals? So one of the challenges emerging there is beef production has to be sustainable. It has to be about kilograms of beef produced per kilogram of beef maintained. And all of the traits around methane and everything else, we've driven off that simple equation. Are you optimizing the amount of beef that you're producing out of the number of the, uh, if you like, the weight of beef that you're maintaining in your cows? If you're not doing that, then you'll be in trouble. So the other one is about welfare. Again, there's some challenges emerging there. Look at the challenge of, of uh, pole genetics and other things. Again, I'm not here to have a debate about horn versus pole, but just simply saying the global community is starting to ask, can we produce a beef animal that is going to be optimally produced and have optimal welfare right the way through its lifetime? And there are going to be some important challenges in that. Thanks, Hilly. Um. Thanks again. Um, I don't have any more slides. So no, 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 that's fine. I'm, I'm just your just... opinion, Brett. That's all we need yep. we've, and value. So um, for us, it's probably pretty easy. We buy predominantly steers. I'm not a geneticist. I'm not a breeder. We buy cattle and we feed them to produce beef. Um, so really for us as feedlotters, we'd like more growth. Um, I'd like some of the 57 index cattle that, Alex talking about, um, give me more of them. Um, so I guess really we're looking for ADG, a conversion, um, you know, yields part of the, the equation, but certainly um, I think Alex probably hit the nail on the head in that um, we'll ever, and probably the, the bulk of the Brahmin and Brahmin infused cattle that we kill and grade MSA sit below 50 so there's certainly a challenge there for the breeder and probably us as feeders to also look as to how we can increase that msa index to 57 which is a pretty high target um i'd be interested in alex's views as to how he thinks we get there um but yeah we're probably sitting at you know somewhere between 48 and 50 that's with a hgp treated brahmin or brahmin cross animal so a um, lot of work to do there. And it does put us really fairly and squarely in the commodity section of the 100-day short track. Now, I'm not exactly sure that that's necessarily um, always a bad place to be because um, um, not everyone can be at the top end of the market. So, um, you know, I think probably, um, you know, you've really got to probably focus on the what the positives are and what the breed does you know well across northern australia and yeah um as i say we're probably just targeting the steer so we're not needing a, a fertile female or a cow that milks well you know that that that's the challenge for the breeder to try and combine all those things and and increase uh carcass traits and 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 growth so that's it for me Thanks, Brett. And, and interesting what, what to hear you say that you, you're averaging 49.50. Like we saw in Alex's presentation that, that HGP is worth about six of that and, and also affects marbling and ossification. So, so simply by not HGPing, if we can maintain growth in our cattle so that you can avoid that, you could potentially lift that MSA index quite significantly. Thanks, Brett. Grass Troy just Step up the podium now. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity to come and uh, come and be part of your uh, your conference today. So I'm uh, with the team at, at CPC, um, and we've um, so we've got a, a couple of interactions with the Brahmin breed and and then cattle. But our business overall is about eighty thousand breeder cows and about twenty to thirty thousand heifers, just depending on the season, and um, and then two uh, two feedlots in Indonesia. So we've been the biggest importer of cattle into Indonesia now for about the last four or five years. Um, 
and uh, and buy you know, maybe 30-ish thousand cattle a year for, for two feed lots in Indonesia. A lot come out of Darwin and uh, and Wyndham, um, but also some out of uh, some out of Townsville. Um, and then we, at the last couple of years, we've been about 70% live export and about 30% domestic. But that changes from time to time. This year will probably be about 50-50 because of the out of season rain in the territory last year that knocked the the grass around. So we um, we need about a thousand bulls a year with our system at the moment um, on trying to get greater genetic turnover and gain, and we breed most of those ourselves. Um, and uh, for those that don't know, we've got a, a sort of what we call our elite end, which is individual performance recording and genomics and things at uh, at Alloa at Biloela, and then we've got two multiplier herds at Newcastle Waters in the middle of the Territory and Bunda down on the, the Western Australian border. And both of those herds are, uh, are individual animal recorded, but we, we're not doing genomics at the moment, but we'll probably will in uh, into the future. We, um, you know, I started CPC in 2014 and we had about a 52% weaning rate. So it's pretty shit to say the least. Um, and that was for, for a couple of reasons. Um, some of it was management, some was genetics and, uh, and some was, uh, was out, out of the quality of our properties. And, uh, or the location of where those properties were. So it's all, it's all very multifactorial. What we've done uh, in the last uh, few years since then is we're now into about 82% uh, weaning rate and we've sold off some of our better quality properties with our restructure, which you've got to do when you've got to restructure a business. Um, so we're in the low 80s. Um, you know, we wake up every morning thinking, how do we get to 100% carving? Um, we've reduced our age of turnoff by 50% um, to where we were in 2017 to now. We've doubled our kilos of beef per hectare and we've reduced our cost of, uh, cost of production. So for us, we look at uh, uh, the cost of, cost of producing a kilo um, as our key, key metric of wrapping everything up when we look at our costs and, and the difference between that. Speed of kilo turnoff is, is also really important for us. So we look at age of turnoff. So what has that meant for our branding program? We, um, we really needed to increase our fast young growth um, after fertility. So, for, so it was all about fertility. So we did a lot of culling. Um, we've, um, we, you know, we, we tried really hard to get fertile Brahmin bulls and that was really hard to get the ones that we wanted that were really fertile, had fast young growth and were polled um, was, was, you know, was a real challenge. And, um, and you now we've bought bulls off, off some of you in here. And I, um, so what we've, we've done is over the time, I think if you look at why we got into trouble at CPC, part of the reason was we put, um, we bred and we spayed the short on out of our cattle too much in Northern Australia. And we went to late maturing, really big growing, late maturing Brahmins and we lost that hybrid vigor as well. And that was not good for, for our, our company and our performance. So a really strong focus on fertility, um, huge focus on fertility. It's all about fertility. So every heifer that we have gets a bull run with it, let the bull do the, the first draft for us. Um, and then to stay in the studs at CPC, effectively got to be wet and pregnant at the start of each year. Um, and then in the commercial herd, once you get over 350 kilos, you're either got to be pregnant or or uh, or wet, um, um, unless you and if you're over two years of age. So some some tough rules there, but fast young growth has been really really important. So we put um, some Baran genetics into our uh, our herd to to speed up that fast young growth. That helped bring down some of the mature cow weight. Um, we've put Wagyu in for fertility. Those of you that have mucked around with Wagyu before, they are exceptionally fertile. Um, doesn't mean that we're trying to breed a, a, a effectively a Wagyu animal. What we've done is put Wagyu in to, to increase the fertility, increase the intramuscular fat. The intramuscular fat in the breeding cows is, is really valuable in, in Northern Australia, particularly when it gets dry from a fertility point of view, um, and some Angus cattle in as well to for that growth pattern. One of the th reasons that we put Angus in was just the predictability of the curve vendors that had really, really fast young growth and moderate mature cow weight. And then putting all that together, we've you know, got genomics and, and, uh, and gen um, uh, physical EBVs. We'd certainly, you know, I've copped a fair bit of criticism, which I don't, don't really care, but around, do I like Brahmins or not? I actually love Brahmin cattle, I think they're bloody great. But we had to do some stuff to our herd. And, um, and so we'll, you know, 
we've got to manage that bosinicus level um, in our cows. We're probably going to run it depending on the property, somewhere between zero and 75% bosinicus content in our cow herd. But it's you know, most of our cattle in a ticks are going to be about 50% bosinicus content for, for the foreseeable future. Um, one of the challenges that we have with, um, with Brahmin cattle versus composite cattle with our two feedlots in Indonesia is, and particular own composite cattle is, is the, the fast young growth on some of the, the cattle. We, we do get more weight gain and more ADG out of our composite cattle. Most of our cattle are shedded. So we absolutely make sure the Brahmin cattle have priority in the rain um, and the wet season because they don't handle the wet and the rain as well as some of, some of the other breeds. I don't think you're ever going to change that, but for us, we manage around that so that we, uh, we can fix up that, that, uh, that challenge there. Um, we also produce about 800 to 900,000 hamburgers a day in our group. Um, so in our group, we've got um, the rights of the Nordic McDonald's chains um, and there's CPC. There's also about 50 hotels in Europe and the UK that have all got a couple of restaurants and things with them. Um, eating quality, and then we've got 98 avatars that we supply in Indonesia. Eating quality is really market dependent and it's really um, customer dependent. And for us, our highest margin customer that we supply is a butcher in the wet market in Indonesia. So it's lean meat, um, doesn't meet any M MSA specifications, don't care if they're HGP, it's all about cost of production and it's our highest margin part of, uh, part of our business. Um, there's also housing and all sorts of other investments in our, in our group, but on the, the food ones, it's, it's really interesting to see where that, that margin is. So, you know, we, again, we buy quite a few cattle and, and like the, the Brahmin cattle, but uh, you know, that really fast young growth is important to us. We've converted that into a carbon claim and we're getting about a million bucks a year, $900,000 a year of cash income selling that um, efficiency reduction through the beef cattle herd methodology on a fairly old carbon price. If it was on today's price, it would be about three, about $3 million a year worth of efficiency. So those efficient cattle that have lower mortality, fast young growth, more longevity and turnover faster, um, have a lower carbon footprint and the Australian government will buy that off you. And that's uh, it's been really a nice little learner for us. So I'm happy to take questions at any time, Hilly. And, uh, very good. Thanks. Thanks, Troy. Um, Quinny, would you like to go next, mate? Thank you. Thanks for the double BA and Hilly and Noki and whoever else <coughs> invited me here to share our story. Um, I'd first off like to start by th uh, congratulating the Borg family on that presentation there before. I thought that was a really good presentation of, of cattle of our beef industry. Um, it so happened to be Brahmins, and that's, um, that's a great thing. Um, we're a family-based operation based in our home country, fattening country is at Middlemount. Our northern country is what I call our northern country, north of the Valley Ando, south of Charter Towers. We run, um, yeah, about 8,000 head, sort of make 2,500 cares. So we bre we're breeding with about 80 bulls a year. Um, depending on our, we're crossbreeders. Um, so what I'm saying here is from the prospection of a crossbreeder, Alex Ball and Ben, I mean, maybe I'm not smart enough to get the Brahmin genetics right. So I went to crossbreeding um, to use, to get our eating quality and our yield. Well, we had the yield, but our eating quality. But anyhow, we've been using Brahmin bulls for about 30 years. Um, and in that breeding program, we've crossbred with Charolais bulls in a two-way crisscross until eight years ago. And we decided then that it was um, time that we had to bring more eating quality in our herd because we're chasing the you know, our ECAS, PCAS, MSA. So we're chasing the top end of the, or the higher end of the grass-fed market. Um, our average, just to go a little bit back on the MSA index and don't think your Brahmin breeders probably should have your heads hung down too low because there's plenty of Brahmin cattle that can grade and will grade in the MSA indexing system. I mean, our average for our crossbreds were in our half-bred, basically Brahmin, Charolais were about, we were averaging between 56 and 57 index. Um, we, to where we wanted to be, that wasn't going to be high enough. So we've moved on to, and our cross, shorty cross bullocks now are bringing us 
they've brought us up two and a half to three index points for the two lots we've killed. So we're sort of sitting pretty close to that 60 now, um, which is we wanted to get above that, but anyhow, hadn't quite there. Coming back to the issues that I see in um, Brahman cattle always, seed stock produces what you've got to produce. A seed stock producer is actually producing an athlete in the bovine species that's got to come out to our herds and live for another seven years, walk 10 or 12,000 kilometres, root 24, uh, 250, 300 cows, have umpteen fights, swim a couple of gullies, hopefully not get struck by lightning. That's the sort of beast we want, so he's got to be pretty sound. We're spoilt because we just produce something that's got a, when we're finished producing him, he's got a, about a kilometre to walk and about 48 hours to live, and then he's put in a square box. So those who can't be that athlete probably should be put in the square box, not put in a ring to sell. Um, but anyhow, that's the side point there. The issues we saw going forward, but I mean, was the livability that I've seen, they, these particular changes I've seen in the last probably 10 or 15 years of the 30 years that we've been in it, was the livability of your Brahmin bulls. Um, the second one was birth weights. And the third one was, I call it dumb calf, but I mean, you can call it what you like, but a calf that doesn't actually suckle onto his mother naturally without assistance. I mean, we make four, four to 600 heifers a year, so on average 500 heifers a year. They're not seen in calving. I mean, if the lucky one has to have birthing problems beside a road on a water run or a lick run, it'll get assistance and end up in a box anyhow. Um, but the rest of them die. It's that simple. So when we were using the higher end of... When we were using the higher end of um, Brahman for the higher compound of Brahman genetics in our heifers, our losses, our biggest smash was probably about 15 years ago and we lost 10 to 11 percent. We mucked around with crossbred bulls. I've tried a lot of things. We've gone back and our best runs used to be at four or five percent. But here is the value of true correct data that I believe in another breed that it was used. And that's where we come into the shorties. They had a birth weight and EBVs on birth weights. So we didn't set out to use shorties. We brought shorties into our herd for IMF, basically to lift our eating quality. Another great thing found by accident, I suppose you could say. But I mean, when we first saw the first drop of calves that come on the ground, we had a pretty fair inkling where these shorty bulls had to be. So out of the at that stage, 20 or 30 bulls we had at that stage. So we went through and picked out, we only buy about not very far above breed average in birth weight EBVs. We went and picked the lowest ones we had, which were well below or below and to well below birth weight EBVs. Put them over, our, I think we made them on that particular year with 600 heifers. Um, the heifer loss, this is not seen, was less than 1%. In fact, it was a whisper under half a percent. So gone, gone from, now that's putting 40 or 50 live heifers in my pocket every year. Um, so that's the power of, of true data can bring in if you believe in it and use it. That's, that's the sort of power it gives. So as a, as a seed stock producer, just getting back to the question, what we've, we've got to address here, I mean, the livability, you are the stud masters, you run the studs. I got to select the bulls, what I think and use. I mean, we've done several things trying to get around it. We've tried to buy non, non-fed bulls over the last few years. Does seem to have, does seem to have made a little bit of difference in the longevity of the bull, and particularly in his second year. But I mean, talking about that on those bulls that didn't go out. I mean, we've had certain years where several of our Brahmin bulls, and this is unheard of for a Brahmin beast, in my opinion that we didn't put them out to mate. We control mate on a four month mate and they didn't go out to mate the second season simply because they weren't good enough body school. I mean, that's the sort of stuff we expect with a, there's no shorty breed, is he a stinking shorty or something, but not a Brahmin beast. I mean, that, in my mind, the Brahmin beast is one of the world's toughest, toughest animals. And that's the part of the Brahmin beast that I believe we've got to maintain. 
He mightn't be the biggest, toughest animal or he mightn't be the littlest one in either. But, I mean, that toughness and the survivability of to this beef industry above the tropic of Capricorn is crucial. Whether I'm talking from a crossbreeding background, but, I mean, I need some of that genetics of that Brahmin beast. Whether it's 20%, 40%, or 60%, or 80%, doesn't really matter. So I see that as one of your challenges, and I think Alex Ball crossed on it there or tipped on it there about the balance between that live calf, birth weight, eating quality, yield. Um, but, I mean, that's my job to balance that up in the commercial world, balance how much I use on the eating quality, how much I use on the yield. But, I mean, it's, it's our responsibility, as in seed stock producers and a commercial producer, in that chain of productivity that we get the livability right, the low birth weight right, the not, not too many too dumb calves because they've got it. So they've got to be able to do it naturally, unassisted. So in summary, I suppose I could say um, there is a, we've drawn a line in the sand a little while back that we won't buy an IVF bull and haven't done since. That seems to, seems to, and I haven't got enough data on this yet, but it seems to be make our calves a little bit better. I don't know. I'm the, not the stud master. You're the stud masters. You, knows what you, got, you know what you've got to do and do to those calves to make them live. I do nothing to mine. That heifer's got to go out there or that cow, she's got to spit that calf, stand up. That calf's got to stand up, get a lick, find a tit, go and lay down in the grass. Mother goes and gets a drink, comes back, and life goes on. And in nine months' time, or seven to eight months' time, I wean it off a cow. So, I mean, I think the real take-home message here is we've actually got to be returned to nature a bit more. The more we play, as I say we, because we're in this game together, the producer and the seed stock producer, the more you play as a seed stock producer, but we play around with these cattle, we're actually mongrelizing the breed and not not breeding from our true performance. And the IVF, when you're taking an egg from a heifer, in my opinion, this is my opinion, when you're taking an egg from an unproven female to exploit it and do as quick as you can for genetic gain or whatever, is insanity. Because you, it's just like buying a motor car with, and somebody walking up you and say, oh, mate, it wouldn't go, but there's a can air start in the glove box, and it might bail you up at any other time. You know, why not, why not prove get something that's proven you've got plenty of good proven cows in your in your herd in your herds go and get one of them that's got the runs on the board that's had three calves naturally by herself without assistance put it on the deck and wean to wean it grab all of them and put them out there and go with that i don't think you need to do the young stuff so hard so fast that's got no runs on the board um where else we got to go here The balance between growth, growth and um, what do I say? Growth and eating quality. I think Alex, it was said, growth king. I think it's only queen. We've got to get that balance right. I think we've had, particularly in the Brahmin game, I think the growth thing. And I know I'm coming from a perfection here that I can cheat because I'm using crossbred. I use a purebred bulls in our herd. So I mean, I'm cheating on growth. That's the fact. But I mean, the growth thing, I think a lot of our problems in the Brahmin game have come because we've probably had too much focus on it for too long as a single factor without doing the balance thing. And that'll just about do me, Hilly, I think. Thanks. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Quinny, and thanks for bringing the word root back into the vernacular. <laughs> so, so yeah, Nick, Nick Mira from NH Foods, based at Bothwick and Mackay. Uh, thanks, Matthew, and um, yeah, thanks to um, the, the Brahman breeders for the invitation to come down and speak to you today. Um, I think um, most of you in the room know what we do as far as NH Foods and Thomas Borthwick's and Sons, but 
in Mackay. Um, I've been with the business up there for just over two years. Um, I've come back in uh, into a commercial processing environment after a break from it in probably one of the toughest environments for a processor since the 70s. Um, I wouldn't lie when I said it's been easy. It hasn't. It's been pretty hard. Last two years uh, under the circumstances of uh, limited cattle supply and a bigger impact of limited humans. Uh, we've been very fortunate that we've had a pretty good run of seasons. If we had a season crash in the last two years, then we, we wouldn't have been in the situation that we're all in at the moment, um, having had such a, a good run. Um, our biggest um, impact has been our throughputs uh, at Borthwick's, and there's a lot of processes in Australia that will share that same story with you. Um, we are seeing light though, and we are getting um, runs on the board and we're starting to rebuild the business. Um, it's only been the last few weeks that we're starting to see uh, labour come back in, a little bit of local labour, plus we're all, uh, also seeing the overseas backpacker labour starting to come back into the country. Um, over the last 12 months, we've entered into the PALM scheme with the federal government through labour hire uh, contractors. Uh, we've now got 97 Pacific Islanders in our business. Uh, without them, uh, we'd, we'd be in a worse situation. We wouldn't have got through most of the last 12 months, even at the levels we were. So over the last two years, we've been running at about 60% capacity of what we want to be at. Uh, we're now back to about 80%. Uh, we've still got another um, 100 head or 150 head a day to the kill that we need to add in the next 12 months. Uh, so with that, um, and in an in a, in a environment of increasing overheads, which uh, you've heard from everyone here talking today about the increase of costs on business, when we haven't got the throughput, uh, that can be a killer. Um, but there is um, plenty of light at the end of the tunnel for us uh, as, we, um, as we grow again. Um, there's a great upside at the moment. And the beauty of what we are doing at the moment is the, the cattle that we're seeing come in, the weights are, uh, are, are pretty good. Um, so numbers down, but our actual tonnage has been pretty sound when you're adding an extra 30 kilos a body at the moment that we're seeing and what we're normally seeing. Um, Hilly's asked me to come down today and, and talk about um, how important the Brahmin breed is to a business like ours. Um, and that's pretty obvious. Our location means that the majority of our kill is a Brahmin based or a Brahmin infused uh, animal. Um, and the location of where we are at the, the bottom end of most of the breeding country of Australia is 50% of our kill is a, is a cull cow kill of which a high percentage of those are a Brahmin cow. Um, so we're there as part of the business with you guys and as a breed that we're there to process those animals. It's something that we need to then work out how we make money out of those. Um, the Borthwick's business over the years, of course, we've got the cull cow kill, uh, but traditionally we've been a heavy bullock, grass-fed type bullock processor. And, you know, a lot of that was processors, uh, Japanese, Japox full sets um, with anywhere usually six to eight tooth. If you get some of them, if they had more than eight, they'd have them. Um, and some of those animals were probably fattened twice. Um, you know, the six-year-old animal that we were doing 10 years ago, we don't do them anymore. Uh, those markets have changed. And I guess when we trying to talk about what the consumer wants, uh, there's a lot of markets that don't really want that animal out of Australia. A lot of that type of product can come out of other competing countries for us. So what we have in Australia now is trying to produce a premium. No matter what we do, it has to be a premium because our costs of production are higher than any other country in the world. So we need to find the markets that want to pay for our product. We need to find those niches where we can put product in where we're going to get a premium. And that's where we've been developing, you know, premium grass-fed type brands and how we do that and how we do that with the animals that are presented uh, in a location like Mackay where we know we're going to have a lot of Brahmin content. Um, the Nature's Fresh brand that we've developed over the last four years um, has been challenging when you look at the environment and the numbers to build a, a brand. With a brand, you need consistency, but you also need customers and you need numbers coming through to be able to deliver that customer every week. Uh, but we've been managed to build our numbers um, to the point where, you know, last year, 16% uh, of our kill at Borthwick's was, um, was branded as Nature's Fresh, um, which is a growth market in a diminishing cattle supply. It's been a good achievement. We're pretty proud of that. The product is performing. Uh, we're starting, uh, you know, we've been going into 
markets that have been challenged as well. A main market for that product is the US. And we all know the US story at the moment, where they've been um, killing down their numbers, killing down their herd, killing down the cows, um, a lot of lean meat where they normally don't have that meat. Um, and that also affects you know, our other three major markets, Japan, Korea, and China. Um, but that natural type pro program of um, no grain, oh, sorry, no grain, no HGPs, no antibiotics, a uh, free roaming animal, that's a niche market in the US. That's a product that they have very little of. So for us as Australia that can produce that naturally, and we hear about the Borgs with their organic story, the Nature's Fresh is just one rung off that. We also produce organics for those same customers in the US. But it's a story that you can go into those markets because they don't have it. They're prepared to pay a premium. It's been a pretty hard in the US market for a premium for the last 12 months, but that premium will come back. The retailers are looking for that product because they can put it on their shelf and it has a story about it. And that coming out of the, you know, the center of Queensland and still having a pretty good eating quality compared to their grain fed type product, there's a consumer that's looking for it. Um, so that's what our, our brand development in a plant like Borthwick's has been over the last four years. Um, and going forward, that's gonna be a big part of what we do because we're still not out of the, uh, the challenges that we face. Um, it's gonna be a long time before we get back to the big numbers that that plant's done in the past. It's a, a long time building the skill base that we need to build now. So we need to look at what we can do to extract the best margin for, for us and our producers uh, to keep us going forward. We'll always be there uh, for everyone as a, as a cull cow uh, facility. Uh, and that does underpin a lot of what we do. Um, but we need to look at uh, programs that can add value to what we do, because it's gonna cost us much the same to process each animal, particularly our male type animals. So if there's a premium um, being achieved for something like our Nature's Fresh product, then that uh, then helps us across the board to be able to process everything. Um, what we look for though, in those animals, um, we're not like Alex, where we're saying the 57 index. We work off a 52 index on those cattle. Um, we, do, we do split them a little bit uh, after the grade. We do select some of the higher index to go into the domestic market. Uh, that's not necessarily because of the better quality. That's because of the uh, less aging in the bag. So for us in Australia, what we do well is process uh, fresh chilled beef into a box uh, better than anyone else. Where we can achieve uh, premiums in markets over our competing countries is with chilled beef. So we've spent a lot of time, Alex spent a lot of time with other people in our industry to develop how we do that. Um, our cryvac methods, our cleanliness, our hygiene of our plants is superior to our competitors. It allows us to achieve extended shelf life on our chilled products. We can pack a 52 index um, natural product into a bag and put it on the waters of the US for 70 days. We achieve a, a pretty good eating quality by doing that as well. So that's what helps us. Um, our processing techniques help us do that and help us to, to achieve um, some pretty good eating quality with a, with a good, uh, good product. It's a lean product, um, but it does eat well. Even even in the domestic market in a 14 day aging period, it still eats exceptionally well. The big positive that we're looking for as far as you know, in, in the cattle, the cattle that are going into that program, uh, there's a fair range of, of content, of Brahmin content within them. A lot of them are crossbred cattle, uh, but we do process into that brand 100% Brahmin content cattle that grade. Um, some of those will even see some marmon. The big positive to us and I guess is what uh, sets the brand aside than our other MSA. Borthwick's has been a, a pretty early adopter of MSA grading. We do grade uh, whatever we can up there as long as we've got um, a producer that signed up the MSA program. Um, we do notice that the, um, the compliance rates compared to our Nature's Fresh, which we stipulate no HGPs, compared to a normal PR type animal coming into the field, is considerably high. The impact of the HGP on this type of cattle coming into us is significant. Um, we've got the Brahmin content, which has a negative um, point score on the um, MSA grading system, but the removal of the HGP 
in our view up there far outweighs uh, that impact. So that's something to remember moving forward. And particularly the work being done at the moment in opening up new markets, our recent, uh, even our recent markets that have grown, they're all HGP free markets. The UK and the EU, when they open up, they'll still be a HGP free market. Something to bear in mind as we move forward and how we uh, manage our herds. Um, but for us, it's crucial um, as a breed, um, our, our female um, breeding, you know, the far north breeding herd, it's always gonna be a Brahmin based herd, we know. Um, the cattle that we are seeing are fattened, a lot of fattened in the central highlands uh, where we're seeing a lot of the crossbred as well. Um, but um, it's always, um, always gonna be a part of what we do as far as a, as a breed. Um, it's important to us um, and it's and for us as developing our markets and what we do, um, we have to bear that in mind. And that's you know, really why we've, we've worked on the Nature's Fresh. It has got a lower index, uh, but we know that we will get the performance out of that product as well. Um, so yeah, from a processor, uh, sometimes they're not your favorite people, um, but we're here to partner and get moving forward as, as, as you'll see, a lot of processes are changing that they're working with producers um, to partner on, on brand journeys. And uh, that's what we believe that our nature's brand, fresh brand is. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to explain some of what we're doing up there. Great. When we talk about the perception, and this is what I, I really wanted to touch on is the, you know, we're going comparing ourselves to everyone else, but we're not ticking off on the advantages that we have. And, you know, I took particular notice of, of John, you know, John, his families, you know, the Brigalow suckers and that, that, that were there and the sustainability and the story around what happens in Northern Australia. So you go to a lot of choice country and you talk about, um, you know, sustainability and everything. And I thought, you know, add, have had some fences and some water, but other than that, it's pretty close to what um, nature intended. So, and obviously the Brahmin animal is really critical to that environment. So um, that's the big thing going forward to me because the sustainability piece, there's plenty of people in Northern Australia can say that they can compete on an eating quality basis with Southern Australia, but you know, go and uh, see if they can um, compete with us in a true sustainability story about, you know, we're not using fossil fuel fertilizers. And, um, you know, there's a lot of good stories that, you know, we don't have to go and plant any trees to try and think we're, um, you know, building our biodiversity or anything because they come back naturally in a lot of cases and that type of thing. So our story and so what I wanted everyone to go home for, because you think, you know, a perception is like that. And if we look at that's your rear vision mirror when you're driving home, I'd ask everyone to consider rather than the single perception of what you're doing, look around at, at your windscreen and all the other things that are happening in our industry that are important and um, the sustainability piece and where, you know, a, a, an efficient animal that does well in an environment where a lot of others is critical to that going forward. So that's my message. And, you know, Nick, you know, I resisted the temptation to reply to the, some of the responses to the Beef Central thing that, you know, there's a premium brand you know, out of Oakey as well. And I actually went to Sydney when they set the brand up to talk to Andrew McDonald about it. And, um, you know, I said, well, we don't want people looking at the establishment number on the box and that type of thing. So, and um, I had some pretty good knowledge about that because Steve Kelly that used to run uh, Nippon told me, and this is, you know, would have been 15 years ago that um, the product out of Borthwick's that was mostly you know, Brahman had as good a reputation in the UK as what uh, Oakey and Wingham did. So, and a lot of what um, Nick talked about there is the fact that, um, you know, our standards and the processing in this industry and that cryovac bag and then putting that product on a boat. So, you know, there's a reason why they got to air freight the high end wagyu stuff because it'll, it'll tip over if you, you, you know, you can't extend the time to a consumer having it. So that's one of the benefits we got. And if you look at it, 72% of our products exported and there's not too many 
place is where that product goes, where it's not going to spend 40 odd days in a in a cryovac bag in a container on a ship. So that's one thing, like what Nick Ted said, it'll perform well when it gets there. So that's it for me. Thank you, and we're open to questions. Brett McKinley. Thanks, uh, David. I know we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. Um, probably touch on a little bit there about the length of time for to markets and that the beef. Um, Looking at that from a sensory testing point of view for the Brahman breed, can you touch on that? Yeah. As I said this week, I was in Sydney, so actually talking to um, the, the scientists that actually you know were, were around when uh, MSA was developed, and so several years ago, when Brett and I started talking, and I have always known the advantage because Steve Kelly touched on that all those years ago for me. I said to them, you know, like um, it's the sensory. So when I was on the MSA task force as the Northern Beef Producer Rep on that for some time, and um, I started asking the questions around extended aging and what sort of sensory had there for that. Another time I get a pump. Another time I get a pump. It just needs more than one time here. Just yeah, I could have been in the room with them, and they would have been right, but. Um, well, um, yeah, like I so said, the whole sensory piece is, and that's where we're talking about with the extension, the extended ageing and that type of thing and, and the, our export markets. It's, it's an advanced ageist thing, but they don't have any real data on it. So I continue to annoy them a lot about it because, um, and I, especially with the, as I see it, the opportunities for, for uh, Northern Australia and into the, some of these emerging markets because the thing... Uh, it was touched on about China and everything, but um, not sure if everyone knows of John Berry, but, um, you know, from JBS, who had a pretty high level of um, in our industry, and him and I, uh, so you have not have the great history of seeing eye to eye on a lot of things, but the other day I made some points about Northern Australian product into the UK, and actually, and when I finished the... Um, that it was well said, but it's about being able to find those you know, cattle because, as I said, you know, the opportunity is there, but um, you know, at this point in time, if we're supplying 800 kilos into it, that means that there's a massive opportunity, but there's a shortage, and it's, I keep saying to them, it's only northern, yeah, you know, well, it's the producers that will do deliver on it, and it'll mostly have to come from northern Australia. So, thank you. My question is directed to the feedlot uh, part of the, the panel. We hear that the, the uh, Brahmins are downgraded because they don't perform in the feedlot. Uh, they don't perform, I imagine, there's, there's two issues. One is weight gain and the other is quality. Is there any direction or any idea of what weight gain is you're looking for? Uh, quality is, is another issue, and there needs to be a lot of work done on that. I'd agree, but uh, you know we hear a lot of different stories. But is it two kilograms a day good enough, or one point five, or what? What what is the average figure? Yep. So uh, good question, and I guess um, probably the last. Um, you know, there's a big variation in in the breeds. There's a big variation in every breed, but certainly in the Brahmins, there's a big variation. Um, like today, and don't quote me on these figures, but if I ran the numbers on our Brahman cattle for 105 days, they'd be sitting at about 1.6 or a bit below, uh, with a conversion pretty close to six. So it's ADG and also conversion part of the equation. Um, a crossbred steer would be sitting at closer to 1.9 and a conversion in the low fives, 5.3. Um, an Angus steer fed across the same regime would be 2.2 at a very low five or a high four conversion. So what do we need? Um, I guess what we need to do, what we need to do as a feedlotting company is, and, and we have, haven't had the choice really in the last couple of years, so we bought probably cattle that we didn't really need to buy. Some of them bred you know, in probably areas where we traditionally didn't see them come back into the feedlot. They probably would have been, you know, more boat cattle. Um, 
didn't have enough growth, didn't have enough size, really stalled at 105 or 10 days on feed at a, at a pretty low carcass weight with sub 1.5 performance. So, you know, really for us, it's about not buying those sort of cattle because they're very unprofitable and targeting the cattle that are in the, you know, 1.6 and above, it'd be great to get them at sort of a 1.8 um, ADG. Um, all of those cattle we, we do, we uh, growth promote, so they're all HDPs. But if we could get a 1.8, you know, to 1.9 with a, a low five or 5.3 or four conversion, that would be an acceptable, you know, level, yeah. Thanks, th thanks, Brett. I, I, and I just had a question for Troy as he stood up. But but when you when you when you were talking about moving the Brahmins under cover during rain, it was that wasn't a mistake. The Brahmins do handle the wet and humid conditions worse than the crossbreeds. Or? Yeah, it, as a generalised rule, yes. But you know, a caught short on out of the Gibb River is probably going to handle it the worst. But they've got other social issues going on. Um, but the yeah the the probably our you know Brangus cattle say versus pure Brahmin the pure pure Brahmin likes getting let wet less um, in in is is what we've seen and 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 we've seen that with our own cattle in um, you know when we've fed them in Australia but just a question about the feedlots so the feedlots for in our business in Indonesia it's a huge range in the performance of the of all cattle but particularly the Brahmin cattle. I think there's, you know, from anywhere from like 1.1 for some of the worst ADGs up to about 1.9 in the Brahman, but we're probably sitting 1.5, 1.6 ADG average. We feed for cost of gain. So days on feed doesn't really matter for us because our customer is about carcass specification and we're about cost of gain. So we might buy, you know, some cheaper feed and slow the growth rate down. So, so it's not just about ADG, it's about cost of gain, but the, there's a huge variation in regions as well. So cattle say out of the Big River um, or the Kimberley will perform, you know, probably 0.2 a day ADG worse than cattle out of central Queensland um, from, from an ADG point of view, assuming they're both at the same body condition. And a lot of that's age of turnoff, but also rumen development. Some of, the, some of the Brahmin producers really let the breed down with their lack of nutritional development in their cattle, the lack of rumen development. They don't early wean, they don't yard wean properly, they don't feed properly, they don't feed phosphorus properly, they don't do the right tailing and backgrounding and you know, looking after their cattle properly, and they drag the the breed down as as a as a general rule. Um, you know, they're very, very um simplistically. So that's that's part of a challenge. One of the things I was thinking about before that I missed that we're just starting to see is feet problems in some of the Brahmin cattle. Um now it's not so much straight legs or, or sickle hocks that sort of thing, but and I think partially it's because of some of the cattle are getting younger because we are getting better more broadly as an industry of turning cattle off in northern Australia better with phosphorus, so they're not as resilient. So we are seeing a little bit more respiratory disease, um, but we're also seeing you know a weaker, softer hoof, um, a bit more cracking in the hooves, and the hooves not handling the you know stones and things in the feedlot as well as what they. Uh, what they used to. So it's just a, an observation that we, we're we scratching our head on pretty hard. We've actually put a lot more concrete down in our yards to try and um, reduce the, the stone things, the stone issues, but the, the feet aren't as res anywhere near as resilient as what they were, say, five years ago. Yeah. Thanks, Troy. Richard Moffat. So this is probably a question for um, for um, everyone's um, position in the panel. With um, the advancement of uh, genomic evaluations going forward um, through from the um, seed stock seed stock buyer to the um, uh, from the seed stock buyer to the commercial buyer through to the feedlot chain through through to the um, Meatworks, do you see um, in a you know uh, adopting genomic evaluations to um, you know benchline herds, um, you know have your own platform to um, you know benchmark you know to pick those cattle out and benchmark them. Uh, 
So as I um, mentioned, I see those couple of old um, meat scientists just this week and um, I actually I have to apologise for both Beck and um, Brett. I always thought calpostatin was a single gene, but I did find out um, off Dave Pethick this week, that, so there's three, but when you, I used to always tell Brett that um, with the whole gene star stuff, that the tenderness thing um, remained, um, you know, something that you could use because it's, um, there was um, you know, not a lot of gene, well, I thought it was one gene, but there's three. So if you're looking, it, it is the whole calpostatin thing and they've, you know, well, that's where the hump height came in was they had a correlation with, um, with the hump height, but Alex will be able, would have been able to explain this better than me, but if you had an MSA animal going in, it was 100% MSA, ah, sorry, 100% box indicus content, and it had a hump height of lower than what it was expected, you would actually uh, have a better MSA outcome than you would have been if you um, had a tick something else. So the model recognised the hump height, and that's why they've gone to hump heights. And, and it's not just, um, you know, Brahmins that, um, you know, crested animals in the hump height, so that pulls them down. And you'd see a bit of it, Brett, with, um, with the waggies and that type of thing. They can, but, um, you know, and there's other reasons why um, waggy producers are not that keen. Uh, MSA doesn't do waggy that well. And so there's, you know, plenty of things going forward, but, you know, the genomics is going to give you the, now we can do EBVs or whatever you like, but at the end of the day, it stands for estimated breeding value. So I think the investment in genomics going forward is critical and actually, you know, get, and getting a hold of the issue around, um, you know, the, the, the calpostatin piece is one that should be done relatively easily from what I understand. And, you know, there's gonna be plenty out there because they knew that in the beginning. So 75% of them passed early, so. So if it, if it's if it's critical going forward into the future, where 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 will industry sit on then? Because you can't have good genomics without good phenotypic data behind it. Yeah, exactly. So without the good phenotypic data, do you see that uh, the industry is substituting or subsidising producers or a, or an R and D network program getting behind? Like we've already got the reefnomics program, where this data is being punched out. For, with the phenotypic data, like there, there's, is there a platform going forward where industry is going to get in behind, um, you know, a platform, the producers that are punching out the phenotypic <coughs> data where, where either they're substituted or there's, you know, I'm just so pie, pie in the sky stuff. About, I'm just yep. thinking of forward, you know, forward into the future. Well, realistically, most of this work's been done with our money. Yeah. yeah, we're the ones that pay the $5 levy, you know, and people, I get a bit frustrated, you know, MLA's a service provider. As far as I'm concerned, we pay the money. And I think if it's important to us enough, that's what hopefully we will start with this here today is that if we're not happy about what's going on and Troy and I are at a level now where we're trying to be a little bit more forceful in some of those things about, you know, but it's... um. You know, these, these things in adoption, they, you know, I don't think there's too many producers in this room that are not, not going to adopt something that's um, going to make them better off today than they were yesterday. So if they can demonstrate that, that the, the value in it, well, you know, everyone's going to be wanting to adopt it. So I think, you know, the, we didn't touch on it so much, but, you know, Alex was talking about the 600 day stuff and everything, but, you know, I use EBVs and everything, but I've been one person that's been waiting for proper genomic evaluation since I first heard about it. And that was a very long time ago. So, and I understand it got a lot more complex, but at the end of the day, it's our money and we've got a lot invested in it. So let's, you know, take some charge of the direction where it's spent, because if we decide that, you know, we believe it's one of the critical things we do going forward, you know, they're already out there complaining about they haven't got any, you know, the adoption about what we've done up until now. Well, let's go and maybe do something that we all think that we can see some value in. And I've just got Alex Ball wanting to make a comment. Okay. So not wanting to take away the expertise of Dr. Hill, but um, 
one should have a look at the genomic space as saying that it's going to emerge and become a very crowded space. And, and there's three elements that's going to happen. One, there'll be industry programs where industry will invest in genomic populations and resource populations. There'll be another group where there will be breed societies and, and other areas where they'll invest in their own position. So take exact the example of Wago Australia or Australian Wago Association that have recently released their feeder um, genomic program. So they've actually made the direct investment. There's the third example where investments will come through genotyping companies like Zoetis and Neogen, which are global companies and they are doing deals with large supply chains and large processing companies to get access to data to validate some of their tools. And then you've got large supply chains that are directly investing in their own reference population. So all of those things are going to lead to more and more tools that will sit in the marketplace for genomics. And the challenge will be, which genomic tool will you make the best investment out of? And that's going to be the industry question. But if you're not linked to a supply chain that's delivering you a genomic tool, you're going to have some real challenges in the future, particularly around the carcass, but also with reproduction. I mean, reproduction is one of the areas where genomics will exceed. Thanks, Alex. I'll just make comment as I pick up my notebook. I must have gone down in his estimation because he usually calls me a professor. So, <laughs> but um, thanks, Alex. We'll move on. We've got a question here, Marie Cope. Um, this is for um, for Peter Quinn. You mentioned like um, the session is about what can seed stock producers do to improve our perception of Brahmin cattle or whatever. You mentioned um, switching, and there were lots of reasons for you know your crossbreeding program. But one of them that stuck with me as a big collector of data is that you found it hard to get. Uh, well, you didn't say you found it hard to. You said with the shorthorns you could get true data. Was that because you didn't feel like you'd got true data in other breeds, particularly Brahmins, I suppose, I'm concerned with? And if is there a problem with our data? No, there's not a problem. <coughs> there's not a problem with your data. Um, the Brahmin bulls that we bought out, there wasn't a lot of data on them. There was some of them had EVEs and some didn't, and the other breed I was using was Charolais. Which back, which I haven't been in the Charolais purchasing bull game for because of our cyclic nature of our crossbreeding program um, for about eight years now, 10 years. Um, and theirs was pretty light on, but I see theirs has come a long way since. So I'm not saying whether your data is right or wrong. I've just used the shorty breed as an example of, and they're. I think the shorty breed, the, they had a breakaway group in their society with the figures you, you, you studied. Uh, masters that know more about that than me, but I mean, I think, but I mean, the, at the end of the day, as far as the birth weight figure goes in the breakaway society to the uh, shorthorn society, it's only 0.1 difference anyhow. So, I mean, it's it's apples to apples for me in their data, and that was just an example I used. So, next time you're looking for Brahmin bulls, would you seek out bulls with full range of genotypical and geno? Typical EBV profiles? Absolutely. As long as they met a lot of other criteria as well, but that would be part of it, yes. Just while the microphone's running across and further your your uh, your question, you you guys are in the breed a lot more than I am, but you've got breeders who go out of their way to undermine the data of the Brahmin breed. Some stud breeders will just campaign like all hell that your EBVs are shit and they're inaccurate genomics doesn't work and others that are the complete opposite and I suppose I'd encourage you to have those fights you know behind closed doors more if you can because your own worst enemies are in your breed sometimes and uh, and that's a real a real challenge for you um, just on the genomics question I think I mean we're a big believer in genomics we've joined up with a couple of breeders to do like a subtropical and tropical uh, group I think the Brahmin breed possibly has missed the opportunity to maybe take the lead on the composite and crossbred uh, animal uh, database maybe there's still an opportunity there but no one's doing that really really well and we you know joined up with a couple other breeders and gone and done that out ourselves um, but when you look at the variance between breeders who who we buy commercial cattle for for our feedlots who buy the same bulls 
as, as, a, as a rule from the same producers in Northern Australia. There's so much variation between those two herds. So, you know, if I look at feeder steers and saying, well, we could get genomic EBVs of potential performance of feeder steers, I think that would be great. But the environmental impacts between some that you know, don't feed lick and others that do and don't feed phosphorus and do, and the huge variation how their cattle physically perform mean that, that we would probably take little notice of that EBV or we haven't worked out yet how to put an environmental or management impact on commercial EBVs yet, but maybe that's something the Brahmin breed could, could have a look at doing as well. Yeah, probably uh, something directed to David, he brought up the, the uh, word kelpone and kelpastian. Over the years, that word comes up a lot and it seems to be related to the reason that a lot of uh, Brahmins get downgraded. Is there any easy method of measuring Calpine, which you know, could be interpreted in the quality. Yeah, uh, Bevan, you got it around the wrong way. So it's calpostatin and calpine. So calpine is what breaks your calpostatin down. So the, the, um, as I said, the scientist tells me that there's three genes that will drive the calpostatin piece, but there's other reasons why a Brahmin animal has calpostatin calpostatin in it as well so you've got to be mindful of that some of you know the driving of your of the survivability and, and that, all that type of thing comes some so you've got to be careful so you know and these things you know i've always said to brett that your bin project should be the driver out if you're capturing the data and you you know you should um have actual carcass data out of out of those animals and um i did ask matthew about the sensory testing and that type of thing and what they were doing and you know, around 7, 14, 21 days. But if you're looking for the relationship between your calpus, calpane breaking your calpostatin down, and Nick was talking about that as well, because, you know, 70 days into America, well, I've heard stories about them ageing our product, Australian product, out to 120 days. So, you know, the competition with their chlorine bath and everything, shelf life, 70 days. Like, we've got a massive advantage in it but the, it is the, the relationship is improved well the, the relationship improves the quality over time so that's what I was talking about with the 40 days and where I was asking for actual sensory work given the nature of the, um, of the product and how much time it'll spend in that cryovac bag in a container on a ship thank you Yeah, it's a little bit different. Um, so basically, you you think about cow cowpains are the proteases which enables muscles to grow, and calpostatin is the proteases that enable muscles to break down. So, what you really want to do is have good cowpain levels while the animal's alive, and then really high calpostatin levels when the animal's dead, because basically breaking down muscle to meat is aging and then hiving the calpostatins. The problem is the Brahmins tend to have calpostatins which are less effective and therefore they don't age as effectively as others and they have elevated calpane. So what happens is you get a product that doesn't age as well in the marketplace and there's huge variation. So there's two calpanes and three calpostatins and they all vary and interact differently. Okay. I was just going to say once again, that's back to, you know, us taking the lead on that. So, you know, the scientists know, that, you know, can help with that. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, that's where we need to, you know, if we're looking for R&D. Because remember, this industry has a goal of doubling the uh, value of, of our product going forward. So if we don't, you know, a lot of the production benefits are going to happen, in, I believe, in Northern Australia. They're not going to do any too much more in Southern Australia. So doubling the, we're not going to double the, the, the production. So we've got to look at the value and let's look at, you know, what we can use to, to actually improve on the value proposition. Mm -hmm. um, question, I guess, is a follow-on to the earlier one Richard had was uh, 
with this age of data and genomics and all the science that we've got going on, the tools are very exciting what we can achieve. And what I can see as a stud breeder and uh, the data we need is comes from you guys in the feedlotting and, and meatworks sector. How do we capture, you know, those Brahmin animals that say put on those exceptionally high weight gains in the feedlot? How, how do we capture their genomic details as a steer or bullock and get that back into our system to face within the Brahmin breed, which Brahmins are create or are passing on those genetics so we can focus on selecting for that based on big data, not just what we're playing around in our own studs, if that makes sense. One of the changes that's happened at um, my MSA and that uh, lately is you're actually able to go back um, using my MSA and actually see the performance of, of your animals, even if they've been to a feedlot, but the risk you have then is what Brett would be able to tell you, then you, you don't know anything about the, you know, the feedlots and that type of thing. So there's always that um, differential in that as well. So, but you are able to go back. Yeah, uh, well, sorry, yeah, I'll track yours, the performance of yours over time, but I'm sure Brett will have a comment on that as well. I think um, ultimately you've got to take a snip, so you've got to take a sample at some point. Now, um, whether that's done at induction and back to the question earlier, I think at the moment, like commercially, outside of probably the Wagyu industry, the cost of genomic testing is still out of reach for a commercial operation to do on any scale. So we take SNPs sometimes out of Wagyu's and we just put it in the fridge. And if we need to, we can use it down the track. But if to, to do what you're saying, you'd need to know the cattle, track them through, take the SNP at induction, and then choose to pay the 40 or $45, or depending on how much data you're wanting, the, the, the cost of the test varies based on what you're actually chasing. Um, but it, it can be done, certainly, yeah. David Johnston, just to update people, your bin steers are all being measured for carcass traits. A meat sample has been taken, you're getting full IMF, you're getting shear force, and those animals in recent kills are actually getting full consumer taste panel. They're also being tested for the five markets. So as part of your bin project, also in complete comparison with Santas and Drought Masters, you are getting that data. So that is coming through your, your bin steers uh, and has been now for several years, including your, your Breed Society bin. So that data is accumulating uh, and is going into your database. Just a little bit on if you find a really good steer in the feedlot and you take a DNA sample, you've got to be really, really careful because you don't know, has that been because he has been fed for a longer time or has been early weaned? And so you just simply can't say, here's a good animal, ah, therefore this must be a SNP profile for high marbling. So if you want to do it, as Brett said, you've got to take the whole cohort early and then, so using the commercial data is a little bit more difficult in the fact that you don't know the management on those cattle and so you might be misled that this high marbling animal is because of its genetics. It could simply be because of the management. And, and so it's a little bit more difficult tracing back through the system, but there is the capacity to use more commercial data, uh, albeit it ex is expensive at about $50 a pop uh, to get those records. But certainly the genetic evaluation systems are working more and more and more to be able to harvest commercial data to increase the size of those reference populations. Thanks, John. And we, and we have run out of time if we do want to have a directions and strategies conversation with the board, which the board probably would rather run out of time and move on. But anyway, that's life. So I would like to thank you all uh, very, very much. And as you fall down, I can just present you with something. Uh, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Very, very busy people. Thank you very much oh, for your time. Um, yeah, I just once again um, like to thank thank you all for attending and thank for the uh, the council for inviting us and obviously 
these, these fellas. Um, it's a pretty hard thing to do to try and get people to um, be in, uh, you know, come and do these types of things. And I, I appreciate the effort that they've put into um, actually come and do this today. And I hope you've all got something out of it. Thank you. So we're not going to make this next section terribly formal. Um, we're not going to sit up here like the targets that we may become. There are board members scattered throughout the room, and, and I don't, I don't want to be running the microphone backwards and forward to them. But, but I mean, the basis of this section is is for you people. Um, we as a board sit, sit at a table. We're voted by you, but but we do we do uh, often discuss directions and strategies and and of course we all have our own opinions and we are a varied group of people with with varied uh, opinions but yeah we, this is especially for you the member to put something forward if you think it's necessary for the board to consider to help drive the breed forward thank you so yeah where do we start shit everyone's happy right we'll go <laughs> He's got a question. <laughs> Bevan, Bevan, thank Christ. Thanks, Christ, you're here, Bevan Glasgow. Been accused of having a big mouth. Uh, we've got, obviously, got problems that need addressing with this feedlot performance, and my only few words is that ask what research we can do to try and solve it. Uh, now, but the weight gain thing, well, I shouldn't say it's uh, reasonably easy, but there's an issue there, but I think it's pretty straightforward, you know, collecting to, to um, improve that. But getting into this meat quality, there seems to be a hell of a lot we don't know and, and a hell of a lot, yeah, that needs to be researched to me. And uh, I'm not quite sure what it all is or where we get the research done. There's probably uh, better equipped people here today than me to know which way to go. And, and Bevan, I'll answer that one because, because I have been heavily involved in the bin projects, which I think are a big part of that. Like, I think we've killed not over 2,000 steers now and we have genomic data and carcass data and there is a heap of linkage to size and I mean that's the best as a society that we can do but the rest I guess is up to you to get data on cattle that you've sold and and especially fellas that are selling feeders it, it is you know you have to gather your own data you have to get your own results like I, I know Brahmin steers that do better than two <clears throat> we actually had a bunch of bin project steers that did two without a HGP, which is, which is usually, you know, off the ballpark. So, so we do have the data and we are collecting it. Our biggest friend is the bin projects. We can't afford to ever stop it, even if it just keeps Jono in a job. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Paul Fanning. Mate, that's, that's good, that information, but how are you guys feeding that information through the rucks, but mainly through to the commercial producers? that are out there buying beef, that important information that you just said. Some of them steers that are performing. Why? And like, you know, there's a big variance up there from 1.1 to 1.8, whatever it was. How do we get that commercial producer to buy that better bull? How do we convince them as seed stock producers, as an association, to get that, buy to, that guy to buy that better quality bull? It's, it's a slow process, Paul, and it's, we're not going to fix it by the time we get to your next sale. But, but, but all that bin data feeds into EBVs. It feeds into the accuracies of EBVs. So, I mean, that's where it's going, and that's where you've got to go to see it. Um, a lot of the bin data information on the size is on the website. You, you can research it. So, so probably as a seed stock producer, if you want to be... If you want to get something out of it, get get some genetics in them. Get some soil lines is the, is the best thing that everyone can do in the room because, you know, you if you get seven steers carcass data against one of your size, it'll bring your carcass accuracies 
up in the high 80%. So that, that's what you can do, that's what you can do, that's how you can use it, and that's how you can get it out there. Okay? Yeah, right. Eh? <laughs> being, being an ex-councillor, uh, I'll start with a wrapper. I just want to congratulate the board. Uh, recently, on the, in the last 12 months of their promotion, of, I think the social media stuff's uh, really improved. I've, I've noticed that, and whoever's doing that's doing a good job. Uh, the country life stuff's been good in recent times uh, compared to what we were doing. So it hasn't been all bad. It's been been pretty good uh, that way, I think. From a bull producer point of view, uh, we're not always the bad guys either. You know, like the Brahman bull job has really improved in recent years. There's more data going in. The genomics, there's more uptake with the genomics. Um, so the thing I, I guess what I want to say is I'm finding a bit frustrating from the customer point of view or, or the producer coming to buy your bulls. Uh, they run off on tangents. Someone says, you know, increase fertility. Everyone's got to buy negative days to carving bulls. Well, that's all right, all negative days to carving. But they forget about everything else. So they come to you and you've got 60 bulls in the yard and they just want the negative days to carve them. You know, someone could have their heads on upside down. But they just focus on that negative days to carving. They forget about growth. And we've seen in recent years with the pole. You know, I'm not being rude. I, I like pole cattle too. We dehorn um, branded some calves the other day. It was pole. It was very easy. But not all pole cattle are good. But, you know, all of a sudden you're getting your commercial bull orders, $1,000 more for pole. So on one hand, they want a, a bull that mega stays the carving. They're not worried about growth or export indexes. So they just run off on this tangent, neg negative days to carving. Next thing, you're getting $1,000 more for a pole bull um, uh, in your bull order over the phone. You get some over the phone. They might be plus nine for days to carving. So, you know, you've got to find the balance. And the other, other thing I find a little bit frustrating, now we've been visiting a few of our customers in Northern Australia and some are good managers and some aren't. So a lot of steers going into the feed, Brahm steers going into the feedlot industry are, are bred in very harsh conditions. So their pathways to getting to the feedlot is pretty rugged. You know, they'll start as a 180 kilo wiener, might be put on the down somewhere and he does 0.8 a day on the downs after a good season, then it turns to dry dry, and all the Flinders and Mitchell blows off the, off the floodplain, so they're back to doing 100 grams or, or a negative growth rate. So we get a lot of cattle in our breed because they can live in the harsh environment, um, um, have a really rugged pathway to either feedlot or slaughter. So I think we're always going to be open to a fair bit of criticism um, but I really think at the top end of our breed that we've improved it a lot. There is a lot of cattle uh, feeding well. I know Pam McGuigan steers for the Congress, fed at Nolan's, fed really well. I think they are up around a point nine, one point nine a day. There's a lot of cattle that have had a, a, from birth good pathways to feedlot performing. But um, so you know, I just I guess <laughs> sticking up for the bull breeders. You know, it's always put back on us to do this and do that, but we've also got to uh, educate the customer too. Um, you know, like a bull that's, that's above average for two 400-day growth and above average for your Jap Ox and Live Export Index, and he's a plus five per day to carving, he's still got a lot, lot to offer a lot of commercial enterprises um, because it's slow game in genetics. But then, you know, we just get these people run off on tangents. We had one, you know, we just don't want to look at the bulls unless they're um, negative day to, to carving. Or morpho morphology is the other one that's gone right off the Richter. Um, you know, they've sold that. I'm, I'm sorry, but the vets have sold that as a, as a very accurate science and it's subject to all sorts of things, heat being, being one of them. So as a seed stock producer, you know, it can be can be quite frustrating, but I don't think our breed's going, it's all bad. You know, we've heard a fair bit of negative stuff today. I think it's it's going upwards at a good rate of knots. We're always going to be open to criticism uh, in, in that eating quality feedlot sector 
There's going to be a portion of our cattle won't perform well from a management point of view and an environment point of view, I believe. So do we have an answer for that, Reid, or is that, do we treat that as a statement? <laughs> we'll take the positive feedback from the first part. We're like that. Um, I, I, and you, you probably know that when you said we need to educate the full breeders. Um, and, and I think, you know, with respect, Shane, uh, it's a bit of a broad generalisation because other times you get bull buyers that come there and know exactly what they want. So, you know, I, I guess we've just got to we just got to manage them as they come and go, don't we? Um, but th that being said, when someone like Peter Quinn gets up there, that's the sort of feedback we all need to hear. That that's a message there that's long overdue for everyone in the room. So, you know, we, we've got to take the good with the bad a little bit, don't we? Anyway, James has got a question. Are you right with that, James? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Reid. Um, I guess we've listened to that panel. Um, we heard Alex speak about the need for brands, you know, with that the Angus and the Shorthorns are doing. And, and I'm not suggesting slapping a Brahman brand onto something, but we then listened to Nick speak about the natural fresh. Is there an opportunity there that the Brahman Association might be able to align in terms of endorsements and maybe even spreading some good stories out of Brahman cattle that are going into that market and then performing well with eating quality overseas? Yeah, James, we, we, we've started up a bit of a... Um, well, there's been some communication between ABBA and Borthwick's in that regard um, as far as promo promoting the positive... Brahmin stories, kill stories, that like like NH are doing and stuff like that. Um, to go to the next step, and I think that's what you're asking about about a, a establishing a brand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and and to your point. Perhaps we have been a little bit behind the eight ball on that. We've been a bit slow, um, but there is a real will there now to chase those stories up and get them out there, particularly on social media, um, because that seems to be what everyone's doing. So, you know, we, we hopefully you'll all see a bit of improvement in that regard very shortly. And... And to add to that, sadly, I've worked for one of the major papers who's, who was the whole family were the greatest Brahmin hating people probably in the industry, unless they could buy them cheap. But they did explain to me once, because I, I was always up their ribs, that sadly the Brahmin name to the 25 and a half million consumers in Australia and across the world doesn't bring anything to, to its saleability ever. Like it's, it's, and so they fear that it will be a negative if they use it. So that's what we're up against. And I just, uh, what, what we've probably got to concentrate on doing is just, you know, let's take the name out of it. Let, let, let's, make, let's make everything that's above a 54 index be on an equal standard, regardless of name. Let, let's take that whole part of the brand out of it. It's hard because you're competing against Angus and Wagyu and they love using the name because it's worth money to them. It's worth money to the processor. So yeah, it's always been a hard thing to do to give something a brand. Like, I mean, <coughs> and we sit from experience in having 100 people standing in line to eat a uniquely Brahmin product that's branded and labelled as such, but it didn't lead to any more sales of Brahmin product. So, so, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a tough one, and we probably discuss it at every board meeting. Yep. 
gather the stories, gather the stories. Like if we could have 10, 10 stories on video like Borgies and, and Buckers from last year, that's what we need. That's the stuff we put out there in our social media. Oh. Oh. And sorry about that, but just on that, um, the responsibility is on everyone to gather that content because it, it takes a lot of getting together. So if you want those stories, go and pick them up, even if it's just a contact, even if it's just a contact that we can put someone in touch with to go and gather that content or grab it yourself, get some photos, whatever, and get it into us because, you know, that that is a bit of a stumbling block in a lot of cases is just getting something that we can put out there, even if it's just a contact that, that we can go and follow up on and, and, and chase a story up out of. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I think I've got to say, from a seed stock producer, I think we have to be held accountable. I think for too long we have, and the fact that we can see so many Brahmins being taken, we've been taken off our turf and all these more softer cattle put on our turf should be quite a big wake up to us as an industry and to all of us. We probably need a bit of a kick up the rear end for that. Um, there's been too long, been too many cattle going and sold on subjective mer merits. I think as producers, we have a responsibility to our commercial people. It shouldn't be about how much you sell your bull for. It should be what's best for your client. And I think that's been lost in our whole industry. And we're seeing all these not fit for function animals being sent into these tough environments and they are failing. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> the, um, yeah, and this is constant feedback that we're getting our collaboration from clients and they're fed up from it. And from that, they are going to these other, other products, other breeds, and they're not working. So I think we need as a breed to start looking, us as seed stock producers, we need to be starting to grab these EBVs. We all need to be measuring, not relying on some people gathering data. We need to be all measuring and putting as much data and improving those accuracy rates um, so we can get back into our leading position in these environments. So I'm standing up. I'm kicking my own tail. Right, uh, so, so to answer how we're going to solve that, I'll pass the microphone over to the newest member of the technical committee. So what I would like to see um, as a stock society, and I've just gone on to the technical committee too, to help. Um, but I think we need, like I'm looking at our, um, our uh, magazine. I would love to see a lot more research data, a lot more evidence-based practices, a lot more suggestions and feedback on how we can improve it. I'm not really interested in seeing um, these animals that aren't proven. And I think that's where we've got to go. I want to start learning. And I think there's always something to learn, um, but that, that would be a feedback that I've got for our committee is that we get a lot more information out there and a good place would that be at Brahma News. Thanks, thanks, Victoria. I'll ask, pass this on to Councillor Matt Kirk to answer. Oh, no, sorry, mate. <laughs> now, uh, I'm the chair of the technical committee. It is a work in progress. Yes, we would like to encourage everyone to measure. I think that's a no-brainer. Like, everybody talks about the success of the Angus breed, and, and I think it's there in a big part because they measure everything and they measure it with... with um, honour and yeah that, so you know I, I think yeah it should people should be encouraged to measure but we can't tell people how to run their businesses I, I think genomics will probably bring people to the measuring table because they'll get a, a figure and the only way that they can improve on that is to get provide some raw data to go along with it Matt McKeeman I just want to it might work is it working
I just want to add to that too. Um, whatever your whatever your selection tools are, we're not going to take a deep dive into that here today. But and I think what what Victoria is alluding to is, you know, it's 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 increased alignment with your commercial cattlemen or your or your bull clients, and and I think there's room for improvement there, regardless of what selection tools you want to you want to choose to the the path forward. But I do think we could improve the alignment between the seed stock producers' goals and and commercial cattlemen goals, and and in, to a large part, that's what this is about today. That's what that panel was about before. So you know, I think we should be trying to take that feedback from our commercial cattlemen and and set our clock accordingly. I don't know whether I'm allowed to talk here when I'm not up there or not, um, because I'm not a member of your society, but I don't think you want to bash yourselves up too hard about the, the um, where your breed is and what you're doing. Um, you said there before, I don't know whether it's all your breed society thing and either. I actually believe that there should be a conduit between your, your seed stock producer and your commercial industry. And I think that's probably something to do. David Hill might have an input to this, but I mean, I think that's something to do more of the beef industry, I mean not only your breed society. So to form a conduit there somehow so that your seed stock producers, as Victoria said there before, want information and back. But I mean, it's a two-way street. Uh, we're in this together. So I mean, I don't think it's all up to your breed society to form that conduit between that. I think, I think that's a bit of an industry thing as well, and probably more industry than breed society, to tell you the truth. Bin project. Thanks, Reid. I think Reid might have known what was coming in. Um, I think we lost a little bit of sight of what we're talking about today. Um, we started, we're heading down the breed plan path. Don't take it that I'm totally against breed plan. I'm not. Um, I'm more about meat quality. I've been about meat quality, meat science my entire life. Uh, David and I discuss it quite often. Um, we don't. And I don't, Matthew, I think you're partly wrong there. I don't think the success of the Angus Society is all about breed plan. I think it's about meat quality. Yes, breed plan take up has helped them along the way and it's going to help us too. But we still need to think about meat quality. Getting back to the initial, what the question I had was probably really for the technical committee. Um, we've got about 13 years of bin project data now under our belt. We've seen a lot of sires that have been productive in that bin project, but it's not reflective. Um, we talk about what, the, at the end of the day, it's dollars in our pocket per hectare. That's what means the most from producer's point of view. So we need to know those sires that are producing in the bin project that are putting the dollars on the, on the ground, whether it be progeny or whether it be carcass weight. We're seeing a disconnect here now in our indexes, our, our production index and our Japox index, or whatever they're termed these days. Um, whoever's setting these figures up has got it completely wrong. They've got the makeup of it wrong. They need to go back and, and restart and, and have a look at the figures that are coming through that's putting the dollars in our pockets at the end of the day. Um, I guess it's a question for the technical committee whether, that's, whether they're gonna to start to look into that um, or whether we're gonna to continue to bury our heads and keep patting ourselves on the back and saying that uh, bin project is improving accuracies and that's what uh, means the most. Thanks. Thanks, Brett. Um, you know, there wasn't one of those panel up there that didn't mention meat quality. Um, Bevan said about what are we gonna to do to improve meat quality? So it's definitely an issue, but in defense of the bin project, um, you know, you, you can take a TSU or pull a tail hair out of any of your bulls now, and you'll, it, that will generate a marbling EBV, a shear force EBV, a rib fat EBV, all, you know, we saw, we saw the difference in the graph that Alex Ball put up with the variation in the breed um, 
you, you can select those high marbling animals from pulling a tail because, because of the bin project. Now, there's no one else in the industry, in, in the Brahmins, that is submitting kill data, only bin. So if you want to improve meat quality, thank the, get on board with the EBVs we've got and thank the bin because without it, we'd be and and we'd be in the same boat as all the other boss indicus breeds where we've got nothing at all. So I, I just I, I get what you're saying. I, I know that I accept that you're 100 percent right about improving our meat quality, but the only way we can do it is through the meat quality EBVs that we've got, and the only reason we've got them is because of the bin project. Um, but I, I'm not going to say too much about what I believe in in because he'll um, chop me up again. But um, I do talk re regularly to uh, Alex Ball about um, you know what he sees because he gets to see, analyze some of that data. And he was an in, um, initially going to be talking about that, but when you know he's obviously you know limited in the time. But um, and and well, Alex is where's Beck? He's uh, you know, Alex is already working with a group of Brahmin, Brahmin people to, to look at what is it going to do. And, you know, Brett and I talk about the BIN project. Alex and I talk about the BIN project. And I'm sure Beck talks to everyone about the BIN project. So I think, um, you know, and there's, you know, commercial people on that as well. So that, that should probably, you know, you can might add Peter Quinn to your technical group or something. But, you know, get a, um, you know, Troy Setter or whatever. But... You know, that's oh, I've been a big believer in the, in the fact that that's where you because you, you're using actual data and you know Kerry and I've been nodding to one another because um, you know Nick's standing there as well. So you know the actual carcass data is the thing that'll 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 drive a lot of it. And um, you know I see some people putting cattle through Borthwick's that are very good Brahmin cattle that do do well. So you know I think that's the that's the thing that will really improve the accuracy is the actual data. And to hear that you're only getting it from your from your bin project is pretty disappointing to me because you you know that'll drive your own outcome is to get your own data and encourage some of the people that um, who actually sell bull to to uh, you know get that back to you because that's that'll be the improvement for me. Yeah, and that's true, David. Um, but for that data to have any value, the 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 size are going to have to be to be. Um, sequenced or genome, you know, they're going to have to have a, a profile, so that so that when the when the good runs of cattle go to Borthwick's, you can identify which bulls are performing and which ones don't, because it, you know, otherwise getting that kill data in a raw form isn't really worth that much until we can identify the genetics that are performing and aren't performing. So I'm sure uh, most people in this room would have heard of um, Darren Hamlin. So Darren, he takes hair samples all the time and scores them. And, you know, he's not necessarily wanting to use them today, but, you know, your actual carcass data will always remain your data. And he talks about taking those hair samples and at, at some point in time, they will be become more economical to use and that type of thing. But the other thing is your data over time will always, you know, it'll remain, it'll improve, it'll get worse or whatever. But, you know, that is, it's the actual data and then, you know, I'm never going to get into a technical um, discussion with uh, Darren Hamlin because he's way, way smarter than I'll ever could be. I'd love to be. But, um, you know, he talks about the fact that he takes hair samples off everything and just scores them away. Anyone else got some questions for us? So, yeah, so, look, th thanks everybody for turning up. Look forward to seeing those of you in a more social atmosphere tonight. I, I really hope you've got something out of it. As a, as a breach society, we are humbled to see so many people turn up to this and we do hope it grows and grows as a conduit to our information back to uh, 
about seed stock producers. Thank you very much. And, and just before we break, uh, firstly, I'd want to I'd want to thank Matthew Noakes again for all the time he's put into organising this. The speakers, uh, he's had a little bit of help from the committee, but but most of it's been down to Matthew and his good wife Fiona. And as a sign of our appreciation for Fiona, there's a bunch of flowers here. Thanks very much. And that's that. <laughs> Th thank you, everybody.